Hi, or shall I say a very good morning to our friends across the pond, a very good day to fellow economists here in Europe, and a good evening to uh, friends and everyone watching us in Asia and all over the world. My name is Faulus Lestauskas and I am the head of a research center here at the Bank of Lithuania. We are just about to kick off with the traditional conference jointly organized with the Bank of Poland, CPR and CIBRA. The preparation for this conference has started more than a year ago, and little did we know, of course, about the forthcoming events such as a global pandemic and the ensuing global turmoil of uncertainty. This wasn't the only shock across our way, but despite all the hurdles, here we are, just about to start this year's conference titled Adjustments in and to an Uncertain World. Actually, the very format of this conference is a testimony of the adjustments that we are all experiencing. More broadly, there is so much to learn and figure out. So I'm sure we all will have great pleasure in learning from the leaders in their fields from academia to policy-making institutions. But before delving into lively discussions and presentations, let me introduce the chairman of the board of the Bank of Lithuania, Mr. Vitas Vasilauskas, who will address you and will formally open the conference. Dear guests, researchers, and members of the Central Bank community, Welcome to our virtual event hosted by the Bank of Lithuania and dedicated to uncertainty. As the famous saying goes, nothing is certain except for death and taxes. And yet we do not really know who was the first to speak these words. Some sources mention Benjamin Franklin other sources say that it was Mark Twain. As you can see, we cannot even be certain about this statement on certainty. Therefore, I think we can paraphrase. Nothing is certain, expect for uncertainty. The pandemic has surely demonstrated this. Indeed, none of the early warning systems had predicted the global outbreak of the virus. Another key takeaway from this crisis experience is that uncertainty and globalization go hand in hand. Globalization makes it easier for all events to ripple throughout the planet and produce truly global shocks. In the Euro area, uncertainty has substantially increased since 2010. Take a look at the graph, which displays both the index for economic policy uncertainty and world uncertainty index. The sovereign debt crisis, trade tensions, Brexit, and most recently the pandemic, all of these factors contributing to uncertainty have been shaped and reinforced by globalization. Today's event itself is a good example of globalization in action. Cooperating with our colleagues from the National Bank of Poland, from the Center for Economic Policy Research and the Central Bank Research Association, we have gathered together scholars from different parts of the planet to discuss uncertainty in a globalized world. The timing of this conference, I believe, is very appropriate. There is uncertainty surrounding almost every aspect of the COVID-19 crisis. In such times, firms pause investment and hiring, and the risk of resource misallocation increases. Consumers tend to save more for precautionary reasons. This behavior can produce long-term scarring effects that are difficult to predict. 
For policymakers, such extreme uncertainty poses a substantial challenge. Indeed, it forces them to reconsider some of their core assumptions. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Uncertainty can be a catalyst for change. For instance, the COVID-19 shock has caused a shift in mindset in terms of the policy response that is possible on a European level. The EU's recovery fund will set a precedent for economic integration and risk sharing in Europe that seems almost impossible prior to the pandemic. Systemic central banks have acted rapidly and forcefully as well. We at the Governing Council of the ECB have launched the Special Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, which features some novel and bold modalities safeguarding medium-term price and financial stability. The ECB has also fine-tuned its forward guidance to help markets and the broader society navigate today's uncertain waters. But central banks can arguably still do more. And we will discuss this in our first session today. In addition, speakers will shed a much needed light on trading firms' behavior, as well as trade and macro related effects of uncertainty. Lufania's data is used in one of the contributions, helping us learn how firms adjust when trade abruptly stops. This is a key topic for open economies like Lufania. Unfortunately, this conference has also been marked by profoundly heartbreaking and unexpected event. Two months ago, the profession of economics lost one of its bright minds, Emmanuel Fari, who was supposed to give a keynote speech here in this conference. Emmanuel covered a wide range of research areas and displayed a clear motivation to help policymakers make better decisions. We will all miss him dearly. I hope that this conference can build on and celebrate Emmanuel's legacy. In this way, I expect that our knowledge sharing will help policymakers deal with uncertainty. We are happy to have three distinguished keynote speakers with us, namely professors Biata Yavorchik, Jennifer Lau, and Kalina Manova. They will share with us fresh light on the role of informational frictions in business cycle fluctuations, gains from localization in the presence potential resource misallocation, and local labor market effects of the Brexit void. I would like to thank Andre and Julian from Sibra, as well as Philip from Cipr for their invaluable help in organizing this conference. I also sincerely thank colleagues from the National Bank of Poland. First of all, Governor and my good friend, Adam Glapinski, who will deliver welcome remarks as well, and the bank's research and international relations departments. And last but not least, many thanks to the team at the Bank of Lithuania for bringing the idea of this conference all the way to fruition. To wrap up, I am very happy to see this conference remaining a tradition, despite the difficult circumstances, thus adding a degree of certainty to our uncertain times. Thank you very much, and I would like to wish fruitful discussions today and tomorrow. And I thank our chairman for the warm and insightful words. And let me pass the baton, which I'm thrilled to do, to the president of the National Bank of Poland, Mr. Adam uh, Glapinski. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start by thanking Governor Vitas Vasilyauskas for his opening speech. I join him and all the rest of the organizing committee 
in welcoming you to this joint conference on Lietuvos Bankas and Narodowy Bank Polski. I am happy to say that our two central banks have a long history of fruitful collaboration on many levels. It has resulted, among others, in organizing joint conferences alternately in Vilnius and Warsaw every second year. This year's conference, entitled Adjustments in an Uncertain World, was supposed to take place in magical Vilnius. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, it wasn't meant to be. But in line with the title of our conference, we have decided to adjust to this new, uncertain, post-COVID world and offer you an online event. Of course, it is a big shame that we have to do this without meeting face to face, relying instead on technology. However, I trust and hope that thanks to the excellent lineup of speakers and presentations, the conference will be equally engaging and interesting. Because after all, the topics of this year's conference could not better correspond to these many uncertainties that we are currently experiencing as a consequence of the pandemic. As a historian of economic thought, I often look for inspiration to the classics. And this time, the name of Frank Knight comes to mind when I look for some vocabulary to help that describe what's been going on around us for the past six months. In his famous book, Risk, Uncertainty and Profit, published in the 1920s, Knight made the distinction between risk and uncertainty. Risk, according to him, describes situations in which we have made possible states of the world, and we know of Ken estimates the statistical distribution of all relevant outcomes. This is essentially how our standard economic forecasting deals with the future. However, Knight suggested there is also a certainty, it means a situation when we not only lack a distribution for all states of the world, but we may also be unaware of the possibility of some outcomes. To convince you just how relevant this distinction is to our present situation, let me just remind you that back in December 2019, the median forecast for US GDP growth in the second quarter was a solid 1.9%, with the highest forecast even at 3%, and the lowest at minus 0.7%. The dispersion was largely due to different expectations about the continuing trade tensions between the US and China. But as we all know, the actual result for Q2 was almost minus 32%. In December, no one could expect that it could be possible. We are truly imagining uncertainty. Uncertainty about the virus, its impact on our health, on the adequate ways of containing it, and on design of the best response measures. And much as we might like to just sit back and reflect on it at all, we policymakers don't have the luxury of idleness. It is vital that we act quickly and try to get ahead of the situation, even if we don't always have the right data and statistics. So how do we proceed? We rely on intuition, heuristics, experience and common sense. Speaking from my own experience, I can tell you that I have consistently relied on such soft knowledge while navigating the NBP's response to the crisis. Let me just remind you that we were one of the fastest to react to aggressive monetary, with aggressive monetary easing, including rate cuts and asset purchases. I am proud to say that our response, coordinated closely with the government, has helped to steer the Polish economy through the worst. And while we didn't escape a fall in GDP, it was relatively modest by comparison with the euro area figures. Do not get me wrong. As a professor of economics and a long time academic, I note and appreciate the value of deep theoretical research, which is of course why I am so committed to events such as this one today. But I think that perhaps recent events also remind us of the value of smart improvisation, intuition, and heuristic in driving policy decisions. Start thinking fast, to use Daniel Kahneman's term, 
is our best and only hope in dealing with situations our models did not take into account this time. This do doesn't mean we policymakers no longer need research. To the contrary, we need smart research that acknowledges uncertainty and confronts it head on. We need research that adapts and develops fast enough to catch up with dramatic changes in the economy that often uh, outpass our capacity to, to uh, design and test formal models. With this in mind, I look forward to the interesting sessions later today and I am confident that it will deepen our understanding of economic reality, thus helping us devise better and smarter policies. Let me close by saying that I very much hope to meet you again all in 2022 in Warsaw during the fourth edition of the conference. Hopefully, your tour of Warsaw will not be a virtual one. Thank you very much. And thank you to the President Adam Glapinski for the words of wisdom. And it's a good time to kick off, to start, in what can be a better session than the one on the monetary policy and uncertainty in the event, which is hosted by two central banks. Actually, dealing with uncertainty uh, about the state of the economy is one of the major challenges that the current policymakers are facing. It's not only about observing or realizing how the economy is being affected, but also coming up with policies and agents, everyone in the society may actually have different expectation. Thus, this difference could create further real economy impacts. These and many other exciting things will be discussed in the forthcoming session, which will be led by my colleague Pavel Kopiec, who is a research expert at the National Bank of Poland and also an assistant professor at Warsaw School of Economics. So let me pass this baton to him. The floor is yours. Thank you, Pavilas. Good afternoon, good morning, and perhaps good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to chair the first session of our conference, which is about monetary policy and uncertainty. We have two very interesting papers in that session, which will be presented by Martin Bodenstein from Fed Board, and which will be about the elusive gains from nationally oriented monetary policy. The second paper will be presented by Kemal Oshan from the Bank of Canada. And the paper is about interest rate uncertainty as a policy tool. The papers will be discussed by Martin Wolf from the University of Vienna and Michał Brzoza Brzezina from Narodowy Bank Polski, respectively. So I would like to encourage you to participate in that session by using the Slido app to ask questions or to, to rate the questions asked by other people. So to do that, you just need to uh, type sli.do in your browser and then you type the code LB2020. So once again, Slido, SLI.do, and the code is LB2020. So I will just collect those questions and I will present them to Martin and to Kamal after the presentations and after discussions of uh, Martin and, and, and Michal. So, okay, so let's start with the first paper. Martin, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. So I'll just um, let's share my screen. So, uh, I have a difficulty, of course. <laughs> uh, things never work the way they're supposed to. You just reopen. I don't know. I'm sorry. Just just in this moment, as I'm opening it, I don't know why my orders are suddenly floating around. <sighs> Without the first slide, if others yes, are we fine. go without the first slide, if it suddenly gets turned around. Um, so, 
Um, sorry, there, there'll be still one, one, I think, out of order, but uh, somehow the other ones are um, okay. So, um, thank you very much for this very kind introduction, and uh, I'm, I'm extremely excited to be here, uh, even though it's only virtually, and uh, so let me just um, kind of uh, jump into, into what, uh, what we're trying to do in this, in this um, project. So, the consensus view in, uh, in international monetary, po uh, monetary economics is similar that um, the gains from, uh, from corporation are negligible, and so are the costs also from breaking up corporation. So this view in general is, so one way of encapsulating this view is in this uh, very um, general statement that you often hear floating around, so keep your house in order. And so what do we mean by keep your house in order? So this is a term that uh, comes, uh, goes back to Upsal Rogoff, but also recently was uh, re reused again by Taylor in one way or another. And this kind of just means that in the times of the great moderation, policies were kind of executed with an understanding that the outcome would be nearly as good as if country coordinated their policies in a cooperative fashion. So this is sort of this, um, this view that there's not much to gain from cooperation somehow is reflected and captured in this idea that, you know, um, if we end up doing just um, uh, national inflation targeting, um, the world will be kind of fine and uh, there's not much to gain relative to, um, to that kind of international policy setting by moving to a uh, more close, to, to a closer cooperation. Now, the literature that's supporting this consensus view suggests actually a little bit more than just what I've said. It actually says that there are virtually no welfare costs of switching from cooperation to non-cooperation, even if this would imply a very forceful pursuit of national objectives, and even if it were uh, triggering aggressive retaliation if a country were to opt out of a cooperative setup. Now, <clears throat> the questions we are asking is, whether or not this framework is actually really the correct framework or this, the, the conclusions of this framework are the right framework. And, uh, and whether this is, this is actually, um, uh, well, whether this, uh, this, 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 this conclusion of that, no matter what you do in this world in terms of um, acting, acting uh, highly nationally, uh, whether this really doesn't impose any, any welfare costs. And, um, so what we do in this, in, in, in this paper, we sort of take the same analytical framework that's provided sort of um, support for this consensus view that is typically shared, um, but we sort of, we can sort of, um, so we take a slightly less restrictive approach than what's typically taken in the literature, and we'll find su surprisingly very different results from uh, what has been sort of uh, pushed forward based on this very same framework in the past. So what we end up doing is uh, we assess how the gains from cooperation depend on and evolve dynamically with the prevailing economic conditions. So we are, we are sort of keeping track closely of questions like what is the status of net foreign asset position? So this is basically the question of external imbalances. Um, and also we'll show that if you have multiple distortions in, a, in, a, in, an, economy, in an economic setup, so where you have wage and price rigidities, uh, that can exacerbate policy trade-offs, then the conclusions from, uh, from this framework also change and you can actually have quite large gains from uh, uh, cooperation or the other way around, you can have uh, uh, significant losses if you move from cooperation to non-cooperation. And these gains um, from cooperation or these losses from non-cooperation, they actually depend with the size of these internal or external imbalances that I just um, described, um, meaning that the larger the world is basically an imbalance, the larger would be the gains from cooperation. Now, to give you a little bit more of a flavor of how we actually analyze all of this, let me give you a quick idea of how the standard model looks like and uh, um, where are sort of the margins along which we sort of tweak things a tiny little bit um, to, to sort of uh, find these very significant departures from the standard, from the consensus view um, that is typically derived from this sort of model. So, um, the model is very stylized and very simplistic. 
Uh, it's a two country New Keynesian model, like the ones you see by Corsetti, uh, the Dolan Leduc uh, in the handbook chapter, or, uh, the, uh, or uh, Benigno and Benigno in the JME. And it features basically households consuming goods, supplying labor, trading across countries, and uh, using short term debt. Um, there are nominal uh, wage rigidities. This is something that you typically don't find in the literature, but um, for, our, for our, the results I talked today, we won't need that, but uh, for some of the extensions that I'll mention briefly at the end, you, you do need the nominal wage rigidities as well. Um, each country is producing a final good, and then you sort of have this typical structure. Uh, there is a, sort of a final good. The final goods of these two countries are imperfect substitutes. These goods trade internationally, and exports for now are priced in the currency of the origin country, and I'll have some remarks at the end if I have time how things change uh, or get even stronger if you take um, different kinds of pricing approaches. Now, the final goods are produced from differentiated varieties uh, under monopolistic competition to justify the existence of nominal uh, price rigidities. And uh, the, only pro uh, the only input into production is labor, uh, which is in and of itself subject to technology shocks. So we only, uh, for, for the time being, I only look at technology shocks. Reason for that is that is the, the key shock on which most of this literature has been, um, has been keying off. Uh, technology shocks will be a little bit special um, in what they imply and how they shape the gains from cooperation. And you'll see this in a, in a, in a few slides. Um, let me say this. Um, We'll, we'll look at, uh, at some other kind of shocks later, some sort of what we we'll dub a valuation shock, so something that is a shock to the time preference uh, of, uh, of agents, and at this stage, our results get even um, stronger. So one, one key parameter that's going to float around in our analysis over and over again, so I'm just going to give you the heads up right here, is uh, the trade elasticity of substitution. So the trade elasticity of substitution is going to be a very important parameter in our analysis. And we're not going to take like a specific stand on what is the exact value of that parameter. We're going to vary it through this analysis between a relatively low one of 0.65, uh, which has been pushed by some authors um, in recent years um, in the context to explain business cycle movements of international macro models and all the way up to four, which is a number that's sort of more in line with uh, some of the estimates provided by our colleagues on the micro trade side. Now, um, what I haven't talked about is how we model monetary policy and what we mean by cooperation with non-cooperation. So let me uh, fill you in on that. So in general, throughout this talk, uh, we'll think about monetary policy as set optimally given a policymaker's objective function under commitment um, meaning, so the policymaker gets a, an objective function assigned and then just optimizes the subject to um, the decentralized uh, equilibrium conditions of the model. Now, it of course matters of what do you assign as an objective function to this policymaker in order to distinguish the various policy regimes. And so here, in, in our context, uh, there are three uh, that are of importance. There's on the one of course, a cooperative policies, um, meaning, so in this case, the objective functions of the policymakers are not only the utility of their own country, but also the utility of the other country. So we, the, the, each policymaker as an objective function has the weighted average of the agents in the two countries in mind, which also, of course, would be um, the same as if we just had one international monetary policymaker um, rather than two who have the same um, objective function uh, of the weighted um, utility of the agent. So that's what we mean by cooperation. Under non-cooperation, what we mean is that each policymaker in each country only focuses, only has as an objective function the utility of the agent in his or own jurisdiction. Okay? And uh, the way we've set things up, this, uh, this leads to an open loop Nash game, where at um, at the beginning of time, each policymaker sets out uh, the optimality path uh, given uh, his uh, nationally oriented objective function subject to uh, the behavioral equations of the model. Then uh, the third setting, and this is, lies up a little bit, lines up with uh, what I said in the introduction, is uh, what, I, what we dub a keep your house in order policy or flexible inflation targeting. So at this stage, we'll go to what is often seen in central bank circles 
uh, of how to model optimal control exercises, where the policymaker just has a loss function that uh, puts weight on inflation and the output gap and uh, maximizes or minimizes the losses of that, uh, of that welfare function subject to the remaining behavior of the economy. In this case, each country pursues its own uh, flexible inflation targeting objective nationally. So it's not that the U.S. would put in euro area inflation into its objective or the other way around. So in the U.S. loss functions, U.S. output gap and U.S. inflation. And, the, and in the case of the ECB, uh, it would be ECB as it would be euro area inflation, euro area output gap. That would be. In there. But as it turns out, this setup of a of this nationally oriented uh, flexible inflation targeting actually is not going to give you outcomes that are close to the non-corporate outcomes, although, but they're actually very close to the cooperative outcomes. And uh, as time permits, um, I'll, I'll get more deeply into this. Now, um, let me give you a flavor for why, well, what are the incentives here to, co uh, to depart from cooperation and how this then maps into, into gains. So what's going on in this kind of world? So con Consider sort of an arbitrary initial condition uh, with the home country just being a creditor for a moment. So somehow the world has evolved in a way that I'm a creditor, uh, and, but otherwise uh, our, our setup in terms of parameters, in terms of um, uh, model equations, everything is kind of symmetric. So we've, eliminate, we've gone through great pains of um, eliminating any possible sources of asymmetry in our model with, uh, with uh, non-state contingent debt. But it so happened that you know, you know, the, the, the shocks evolved such that I end up being a creditor. <clears throat> now, what, what is going on on the corporation? On the corporation, the global policymaker or the corporate of policy can enhance global welfare by doing the following thing. It can compress the consumption of the creditor per unit of labor effort and use these extra resources in order to expand the debtor's consumption per unit of labor effort. So it's just a redistribution that the global policy is going to take in order to smooth uh, the margin utilities across these two jurisdictions a little bit more. So we'll have sort of a transfer of resources from those who have been more fortunate to those who have been less fortunate. That's what in the corporate setting you would be doing. Now, on a nationally oriented policymaking, the policymaker now would like to, of course, reverse this cooperative redistribution. So if I've been in, say, this cooperative framework for a while, but I see the resources being taken away from me for a while, and now suddenly things are opened up, and I, and I say, look, I'm leaving this cooperative uh, arrangement here, what would I like to do? Well, I would like to reverse some of these uh, cooperative redistributions that, um, that we've had so far. And so this will unleash uh, what we dub an exchange rate war. So the creditor will choose a monetary policy contraction in order to appreciate his or her currency, which in and of itself will lead to uh, labor efforts falling relative to consumption, and thus net exports and the net foreign asset position will fall. So I will be de-saving as a creditor. That's what my policy is targeted to. Now the debtor, of course, uh, doesn't like this, uh, this outcome because this policy will, of course, transfer resources from the debtor back to the creditor and it's going to lean against this appreciation by also engaging in contractionary monetary policy to prevent the appreciation of the home country's currency and instead tries to sort of uh, prevent the depreciation of its own currency um, or alternatively tries to appreciate their own currency. Now, um, in the end, both countries will be worse off and we will have a setting in which uh, policy is generally too tight and we'll see deflation and real wage misalignment that's going to distort the economy. Now, to illustrate this briefly in a graph, this uh, here we're plotting the differences between the cooperative and the non-cooperative policies uh, in, this, in this currency war. And in this specific situation that I'm highlighting here is what's end up being the case is that um, in the home country, the... So inflation relative to its trend goes down even more. So here we have a situation in which the home country contracts monetary policy a little bit more, and this is evidenced by this some slightly steeper decline in inflation uh, in that country. And as you can see, the net foreign asset position, which is here on the bottom left, contracts uh, somewhat relative to the cooperative outcome, meaning that the crediting country will now dissave and sort of uh, get back some of the resources. And all of this is uh, 
happening while you have a, initially at least, a very sharp appreciation of the home country's real exchange rate. Now, this is the mechanism of what's going on generally in terms of why do people, well, why do countries uh, would like to depart from, um, from, a, from a cooperative outcome. But uh, this is by, by no means, of course, a systematic evaluation of what is going on. And so let me uh, spend, spend a little bit of time of going into a more systematic evaluation what is going on and, and how big are these gains as we look at this. So in order to do this, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll design the following experiments. So we're looking at the gains from cooperation uh, and as they evolve through history. So in order to get this, we construct the ergodic distribution of the variables under the cooperative outcome. So we take the model, solve it under cooperation, so this joint welfare maximizing uh, approach, and simulate this economy in order to obtain just the ergodic distribution of all the variables. In particular, one variable that, that's, that's going to be of importance is going to be the net foreign asset position. Then we'll draw from this ergodic distribution many, many times, and we'll compute the welfare loss of switching from cooperation towards nationally oriented policies. So national oriented policies, just to remind you, is that the central banks go back to just only focusing on the utility of the agents within their own jurisdiction. And then we translate these welfare losses into consumption equivalent variations and compare them to the cost of the business cycle. Now, what's going to be very important is um, there are various state variables, of course, in our model uh, that can sort of pot are potential candidates for explaining of what we're going to see. Now, the one state variable that overwhelmingly explains everything that you're going to see going forward is just the net foreign asset position, so the relative debt position of the two countries. Um, so if going forward, I sometimes use the word initial conditions just uh, as equivalent with uh, net foreign asset position. So just to explain that choice of language. Now, um, let's dive into the key results that we have. So I would like you to focus on the, on the bottom chart for a moment first. And uh, let's just take any of these. Let's take this purple line here where it says elast equal to four. So there we have an elasticity of four. And so what do we see? So we're plotting the net foreign asset position of each country against the gains from cooperation. And as you can see, um, the larger the net foreign asset position, the initial net foreign asset position is uh, for a given value of the elasticity of substitution, the higher are the gains from cooperation. Meaning, so fixing the elasticity and having higher um, uh, higher uh, initial debt positions lead to bigger gains from cooperation. Now, the second observation you have, if you fix now, um, if you if if you fix now the level of the uh, of the NFA position, let's go here to forty, and uh, then you go go up in uh, along the vertical, then you'll see that um, for a given value of the net foreign asset position, as I'm lowering. As I'm changing, let's, let's say this, as I'm, yeah, as, I'm, as I'm lowering the elasticity of substitution, I'm also increasing the gains from cooperation. So the second thing to take away from this chart is a lower value of the elasticity of substitution for a given value of the net foreign asset position will give you higher gains from cooperation. Okay? So these are the two forces that we have. Now, as you already can see a little bit from this bottom chart, the distribution, though, of these net foreign asset positions is not so similar across these two, across these various parameterizations of the elasticity of substitution. So if you go at this, at the top chart, that's where we're plotting this of how the net foreign asset position under our very simple setting with technology shocks only, how the distribution of the net foreign asset position is affected by the choice of the elasticity. So this is somewhere where the results of uh, Cole and Opsfeld ra uh, raise their heads. So um, you may all be aware of or remember that in a, in a world in which you have a trade elasticity that's close to one in a context of a Cobb Douglas utility setting, that um, uh, the financial market arrangements won't make ma uh, uh, the, the financial markets arrangements don't matter for the allocations and thus for the degree of risk sharing that you can have, meaning that in that specific case that Colin Opsfeld po uh, pointed out, is uh, it doesn't matter whether you have any kind of financial market arrangements or even financial order key, trade terms of trade movements will be offsetting technology shocks such that you can perfectly ensure these um, 
these movements. So at this stage, there is no need for net foreign asset positions to move and, and provide any kind of insurance. And this is a feature that, of course, our model generally inherits, all these kind of models inherit, that if you have a trade that assists relatively close to one, the distribution of the net foreign asset positions shrinks and becomes actually eventually just um, a, um, a, a degenerate distribution. So now the question is how does this, these different shapes of the, uh, of the distribution of the NFA position, how does this map together with these two other points that I made earlier from the bottom chart, how does, this, how, how does all of this fit together uh, if we plot the gains from cooperation? So this is what we have. Um, so focus on um, maybe first is uh, this uh, dash dotted line here, this thick red one. This is sort of the median, uh, the, the mean, sorry, the mean of the gains from cooperation as we vary the trade elasticity of substitution um, uh, of in, in, in this model. So if we have very low values of the trade elasticity of substitution, we'll have a somewhat tighter uh, we, 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 have a, we have some distribution of the net foreign asset position that's non-degenerate, and because we have a very low elasticity of substitution for each value of the trade uh, for, for each value of the NFA position, we have relatively high gains from corporate. So this is why you sort of get relatively high gains on this right side. Now, as we move towards unity, the terms the the um, distribution of the NFAs in sample will just shrink towards degenerate. So once you have degenerate distributions, there won't be any gains from cooperation. So this is why the gains of cooperations will disappear once you're around unity in the context of technology shocks only. And then as we, as we increase the trade elasticity, um, we will get a, less, a, a, a more and more dispersed distribution of the NFA position. And although, um, the val although with high elasticity of substitution, the gains from cooperation for a given value of the NFA position are smaller than for high value, for lower values of the trade elasticity, you still have very dispersed outcomes and sometimes have like these massive, uh, these massive NFA positions that even with the high values of the elasticity of substitution can yield very, very big uh, welfare costs. Um, we compare that. So, so this is, these are the means I was showing out. Then uh, we also plot like the 5th and 95th percentiles, and as you can see, so in the 95th percentile, you can have substantially larger gains than, uh, than under the mean. And uh, if you compare this to the cost of business cycle, which is this black dashed line, uh, you can have, in some cases, um, gains that are, uh, that are twice as large as the gains from the cost of business cycle. <coughs> now, so far, all I've told you is that there are possibly very gains from cooperation, but the question is, um, you know, how are these, but when, when I have these gains from cooperation, um, will they actually be realized? And whether they can be realized in, in this world depends very much on whether everybody has an incentive to stick in this cooperative agreement. So meaning um, it, it boils down to how are these gains distributed among the various participants in this, in this setting. And so in order to, to explore this question, we are devising a two-stage game uh, to explore the incentives to deviate from, uh, from cooperation for a given net foreign asset position. So we look at, in stage one, we say that each country chooses between either they want to cooperate or they want to deviate. Um, Sorry so for any interruption, you've got five minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, so if player, if player J chooses to cooperate, <coughs> The policy objective of country J will be its own, uh, will be the joint welfare function. If it chooses to deviate, it will choose the national welfare function. In stage two, then, the countries engage in an open loop Nash game in which they follow the objectives functions that they've chosen the first stage. And what this means is that if both countries cooperate, this, of course, will boil down to just the cooperative outcomes because then in this case, they have the joint welfare function. Now, uh, this is. The, 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 the key result coming out of this exercise, and this is asking, so what is the distribution uh, and the incentives of each country in this setup? So let's, um, let's sort of look at, uh, at this part here in the top right, where we say the home country deviates, maybe the home country will, uh, will play non corp will choose its own uh, utility function, uh, versus the foreign country will stick to the global uh, weighted uh, utility function. 
Um, and uh, we'll start some initial value here of the net foreign asset position. What you'll have is, so if the home country deviates, it stands to gain from leaving the cooperative agreement um, by a certain amount here of 0.45% of, uh, of consumption, whereas the foreign country is going to lose. So we'll do this, play out this matrix. Uh, so, so the home country unilaterally can make itself better off. The foreign country can always make itself better off all the time. So what this means, of course, is just a very simple prisoner's dilemma outcome is that both countries will want to deviate all the whole time. So point is there can be very big gains from cooperation, but the problem is it will be very hard to sustain them. Both countries always have an incentive to deviate. And as you can tell, the incentives to deviate, if you go back here in this top right chart, the incentives to deviate are larger when the gains from co possibly cooperation are the largest. So this is the, 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 sad, the sad part, when cooperation will be the most valuable, this is also the, when it's the hardest to sustain. Um, so I will actually just use this slide to summarize things. So there's a range of large, large things that we, that we do throughout the paper. Uh, and uh, so, so far, I've mostly talked about efficiency gains. Um, and they, they are mostly efficiency gains that we have here, but if you make the model slightly asymmetric, you can also have much, much more redistributive gains than, than what we've talked about. Um, we analyze this role of national inflation targeting as implicit cooperation, but even there we'll find this challenge that na if, if national inflation targeting is the benchmark rather than fully cooperative uh, policy, you still have this, this incentive of countries to depart from this, to deviate from this, and so also in this setup, national inflation targeting, which can deliver relatively big gains compared to non-cooperative outcomes, will be hard to sustain in a world, in particular, when the imbalances are relatively big. We'll look at more asymmetric portfolios, uh, and in this case, you have uh, potentially also very redistributive aspects uh, shining through. We'll look at exchange rate pass-through. So, so far, I've had producer currency pricing. We'll look at local or dominant currency pricing, and our results get even bigger, so they exacerbate the incentives for nationally oriented policies. We look at valuation effects. So, so far, I've only looked at technology shocks, which have this funny feature of, sort of making everything uh, kind of um, rain in. And this is maybe the, the, the concluding chart I'll show you. Um, if you have valuation effects, as I'm putting in here, shocks to the best discount factor beta, you can have much larger gains, and you're getting this, this dip around unity is, is sort of not happening as pronouncedly as in the context of technology shocks because valuation shocks, they always lead to the relatively big uh, t um, uh, net foreign asset positions because they're directly affecting, of course, people's willingness to, to hold assets. Um, so some of these features disappear that you see in the technology shocks setting, which even puts even more to the point that it is really... Um, uh, that there are really a lot of gains left uh, left un, um, um, uh, unused in this country. And then we'll talk about differences in uh, financial market arrangements and show that also when you have complete markets, you can have very big gains from cooperation. Um, however, if you move to financial auto key, you would not. And this is where I'll stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you for an interesting presentation. So now it's time uh, for a discussion. And again, the discussion is Martin Wolf from the University of Vienna. Martin, please uh, start your discussion. Um, okay, so thank you very much for putting me on the program. Uh, okay, so I'm very happy to discuss this paper, uh, The Elusive Gains from Nationally Oriented Monetary Policy. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so the, what's the question in the paper? The question asks, sorry, I, uh, I still have some issues. <clears throat> okay, so now it should work. So the question asked in the paper is, should monetary policy be coordinated at the international level? And uh, the traditional answer is that in theory, Yes, but this is almost a trivial statement. Of course, it's, it's good to, to speak. It's, it's of, of course, it's good to coordinate policy across countries. The, the more relevant question is whether in practice it makes a difference. And here the answer is, there are hardly any welfare gains relative to the non-coordination benchmark. <clears throat> so this is what typical models in the open economy macro imply. And uh, so it doesn't really matter 
whether you follow this cooperation or whether each country just pursues their self uh, their self interest. Moreover, coordination is hard to implement. <clears throat> so it looks like uh, yeah, maybe just everyone keep their house in order, and we will be just as good as uh, if there would be international cooperation. However, in this paper, the answer is different. So in this paper, uh, the authors say that in some cases, welfare losses of non-coordination can actually be substantial. So there can be a substantial cost of, uh, of breakdown of cooperation. <clears throat> and moreover, what the authors show is that these, these are precisely the times when the incentives to break away from coordina uh, coordination are largest. So you can think of this as a double punch in the face. So there are times <clears throat> when it's particularly costly that, uh, that there is no cooperation. And these are exactly the times when the, the, the cooperation is most fragile in the sense that the countries have the strongest incentives to break away from cooperation. Okay, so to come to these results, uh, the analysis uh, builds on a two country new Keynesian model, a la Benigno and Benigno 2006. So that's the JME paper that was mentioned. And the, the authors co contrast two equilibria. <clears throat> so the first equilibrium is coordination. So basically policymakers choose their, their policy instruments, uh, the policy rates in both countries to maximize the joint welfare in the countries. Uh, and the second uh, equilibrium is the Nash equilibrium where each country chooses its individual policy rate in order to maximize its own welfare by, by taking the policy choices in the other country as given. And what the authors show is that the welfare difference crucially depends on the state of the economy. And one state that is basically driving all of the results in the baseline model is the NFA position, so the global imbalances. And the authors show that uh, basically the welfare difference between the two equilibria becomes large when the NFA positions are, uh, across countries are large, so when global imbalances are sizable. And the intuitive reason for this result is that uh, when imbalances are large, then these countries, they start to fight over resources under Nash. <clears throat> so this is uh, the currency war, and this is what is basically generating the welfare loss. Okay, then there is this uh, point on incentives to coordinate. So basically, uh, what is also shown in the paper is that the countries face a prisoner dilemma, and uh, this, this can be understood easily as follows. Uh, so if, if uh, the other country chooses uh, cooperate, then of course, uh, I want to choose um, <clears throat> deviate because then I, I can exploit the other country big time fighting over these resources. So I have an incentive to deviate. If instead the other country uh, chooses to deviate, then if I myself uh, choose cooperate, <clears throat> then I will be exploited big time by the other country. So of course it's in my interest to retaliate. So whatever the other country does, therefore, it's in my, uh, I have the incentive uh, to, to deviate, and this is the classic uh, prisoner's dilemma. And what is shown is that the incentives to deviate but become particularly large, so the prisoner's dilemma becomes particularly problematic when NFA positions across countries are large. So that's again these global imbalances. So when you compare this point here <clears throat> and this point here, you see that the cost channel and the incentive channel are both driven by these large NFA positions. That's what I called a double punch in the face in the beginning. So it's exactly when the system is most fragile is uh, when, when the cost of a breakdown in the system is particularly large. Okay, then there's something, some more uh, in the paper. So one thing you may wonder is, is this inefficiency or redistribution? Thinking of a trade war, you might think that if one country steals resources from the other country, then that may just be redistribution and not really inefficiency. But what is shown in the paper is that most of the welfare loss is actually a Pareto loss. So the trade for leads to a loss of resources and of consumption. So it's not just a redistribution across countries. And then there are various model extensions that have been uh, briefly mentioned. For example, valuation effects, <clears throat> complete markets, incomplete exchange rate pass through. So what happens when uh, monetary policy has only small effects on the terms of trade because of incomplete pass through. And it's basically shown that these results are robust toward, toward these model extensions. Okay, so overall, I liked reading the paper very much. So I think it's a very well written paper with a convincing and easy to grasp message. And it's a very bulletproof analysis already. So I tried to, I tried to come up with a few comments that to help improve the paper a, a bit further. And uh, so what I want to do is I want to make a few comments on first, the endogeneity of capital flows, second, benefits of cooperation, then costs of non-cooperation, and then finally dynamics after breakdown. Okay, so the first point is endogeneity of capital flows. So strictly speaking, according to the model, one should never observe large global imbalances in the first place. 
So if you take the model very seriously, then you, what, you probably wouldn't see global imbalances to start with. And this is because, according to the model, countries never have an incentive to coordinate because of the prisoner's dilemma problem. And in equilibrium, therefore, the possibility of currency wars should keep cross-border lending small. <clears throat> so basically, this paper considers only the one direction, the one direction which is how do global imbalances shape uh, the monetary regime. But there's also the other direction, which is how does the monetary regime shape equilibrium capital flows. So in a related analysis, for Naro, uh, Luca Fornaro makes this explicit. So uh, he makes the size of equilibrium capital flows endogenous. And what he argues in, in his paper is that basically creating the euro area is what triggered large intra-euro lending in the first place. So here basically we start from the monetary regime which changed when the euro was created. And he argues that this is what triggered large intra-euro lending in the first place. Instead, under monetary autonomy, so before the euro area was created, the possibility of expropriation through monetary policy. So in, <clears throat> in this paper here, the possibility of this currency war that kept cross-border lending limited. So to give you a flavor of, of uh, of the euro area. Uh, so capital flows in the monetary regime are interdependent. So this is suggestive evidence of this. Uh, so before the euro was created, capital flows uh, evolved uh, basically in parallel across these groups of countries. But then when the euro was created, uh, within the euro area, capital flows took off, whereas in the other groups of countries, basically the trend, the trend continued. So this suggests <clears throat> that it was the change in the monetary regime that led to these large capital flows in the first place. Okay, so to put it a bit, Provocatively, this paper here only considers the one direction, but the other direction, uh, monetary regime influencing uh, capital flows, that may also be important. Okay, then my second comment on the benefits of cooperation. So the paper says that the, the consensus view in the literature is that uh, the breakdown in cooperation is not very consequential. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think I, I agree with that statement, but I, I would also like to say that uh, recently there have been some papers which also emphasized that monetary, international monetary policy cooperation can be important. For example, Cook and Devereux uh, in the AJ Macro, they find that cooperation matters when the global economy is in a liquidity trap and countries are asymmetric. So basically in a zero lower bound environment, that may be another instance where uh, cooperation is important. And similarly, Caballero and co-authors uh, consider also a world economy in a liquidity trap and they also discuss cooperation, the importance of cooperation. And in addition, they actually emphasize the role of uh, global imbalances in, this, uh, in a similar way as this paper. <clears throat> so other papers have also uh, made this point. Okay, the third point is on the, the cost of non-cooperation. So that's uh, so the key finding in this paper. One of the key findings is that the welfare cost of a breakdown of cooperation may much exceed the cost of business cycles, where the cost of business cycles is defined as in Lucas. So you I mean, I mean, you've got five minutes. Yeah, that three minutes, thanks. Sorry, three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes, thanks. That's enough. Okay, so, but I think comparing. Uh, the cost in the, the welfare cost with the cost of business cycle a la Lucas is not a fair comparison. Uh, and this is because the cost of business cycles is actually an unconditional measure. So it's basically take in the steady state, how does the, the welfare in the economy with shocks compare to the uh, economy without shocks? So that would be Lucas. So that's an unconditional measure. Whereas in this paper, the cost of breakdown is a conditional measure. Okay, so to put it bluntly, Conditional on being in recession, of course, also the cost of business cycles is very large. <clears throat> okay, so it's it's more it's important to compare apples with apples. So I think it would be better here to compare mean conditional welfare loss due to business cycles to mean conditional loss due to breakdown in cooperation. Okay, or put the other way around. I suspect that the unconditional loss of a breakdown in cooperation in this paper uh, in this model would also be quite small because that would be in steady state where the NFA position is equal to zero. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, and then my last comment. So this is uh, more of a technical comment. So here I'm wondering if the dynamics after the breakdown are, are computed correctly. And uh, if I, so I read the, the paper that uh, develops the algorithm <coughs> that is uh, used in this paper to solve for the Nash equilibrium. And if I, if I get it right, a solution algorithm for Nash computes the timeless perspective under commitment. But the timeless perspective means that the Lagrange multipliers are non-zero even at the initial date. But remember that the Lagrange multipliers in the commitment problems, they just measure promises that have been made in the past. So by using this 
solution basically uh, in this in this context here i wonder if in the period of breakdown where we move from cooperation to non-cooperation promises are being honored that have never been made because we we jump to an equilibrium in a, in a timeless perspective so if this is the case, then I think what should be done instead is to set these Lagrange multipliers to zero in the period of breakdown. But we, it is it is clear that then the dynamics would be uh, would be quite a bit different, and as a result, also the uh, uh, yeah the welfare properties of the equilibrium. Okay, so that's that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Excellent. Pavel, are you around? Because Pavel shall gather the questions and that's the only way we can get them. Mm -hmm. For the time being, maybe Martin could start replying to some of those yes, comments that yes. could make sense. So let me, let me, so, well, first, uh, Mart well, Martin speaking to Martin. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for this uh, um, very excellent discussion uh, and a thorough, thorough presentation of, uh, uh, of our results and findings and uh, um, some of the uh, insightful um, criticism. So let me just uh, go... Um, they're not necessarily in, in the order you presented them. Uh, maybe they're in, in the order of my own importance attached to, to some of them, or just want to make sure that um, we'll, get, um, we'll get clear on that. So uh, your last point on the Lagrange multipliers, uh, just to, to make that first clear. So we did compute it um, in, in various stages in, in both forms. So at some point, resetting the Lagrange multipliers to zero. In other cases, inheriting them from the past that actually did not make much of a difference at all. So the results um, do not depend on whether or not at the time of, um, of the switching from the cooperative to the non-cooperative agreement, you will inherit somehow some of these uh, original Lagrange multipliers that were, the, the, these past promises that were made or not. So that, that just is a, the differences that occur there are just in the order of, of um, of one hundredth of the gains that we see. So you could see like in one case 0 0.39 and the other case 0 0.4 or 0 0.41 or 0 0.38, something so in this margin. So this so the the the, the key the, the, the key um, the key in all of this is always the 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 the, the, the remaining um, uh, the, the, the physical state variables uh, so to speak. So in this context the, the net foreign asset position. Um, but I have to go th go through back to the paper, make sure that um, that we probably uh, sh we should acknowledge that more directly uh, again at, a, at, a, at another place to make sure that um, um, readers uh, re readers um, see see, um, see, see that um, this is a uh, an omission on our side. So I'll make sure that we'll get this. And thank you for flagging that. Um, on the capital flows, I really liked your point on the endogeneity of the capital flow. So. Um, just wanted to make the one one point clear. Of course, there's, I mean, in the model itself, you have capital flows also if you don't cooperate. Um, uh, that's so that there, there's always be capital flows because even if you don't cooperate, because we don't have expropriation through other means other than monetary policy. So there's there's still, of course, uh, countries will honor their debt that they have accumulated. But I really like this point of the indigeneity, and I think this is. So um, one, one, one long-lasting dream that Giancarlo has, uh, he always wanted to make sure, he always wanted to find a theory that can sort of generally justify the existence of uh, monetary currency unions. In order to justify them, it would be good to have first a theory that sort of shows you that cooperation in and of itself can be meaningful compared to non-cooperation. And so I think, though, the point that you've been making uh, with the endogeneity of capital flows is actually something where the gains from cooperation can be pushed even larger because we think that somehow these, the, the, these cross-border flows are not happening to the extent, in our case, they're kind, of, they're kind of, yeah, as you said, they're only in one direction, but we don't have the endogeneity back from the other side, so how the monetary regimes have, uh, um, can, can open this up. And so this, this I think, may, may, may make the gains from cooperation even larger. And so this, this uh, I think, speaks to the fact that uh, there's there's even more music in in all of this than um, than well 
many predecessors of ours have thought, but maybe probably even than what we have uh, shown in our, in, in, in our model based on these benchmark models. So I'll definitely take another look at um, Bonaro's paper and, uh, and see um, where, where this can take us in the future. Uh, but this is an excellent, excellent point. Um, on the comparison with the business cycle, I, uh, I agree. This is, a, this is a little bit of a, of a challenging point, and um, because you are right, our welfare measure is a um, is a conditional one. We are always conditioning on the initial conditions, versus uh, in the, the way these uh, these business cycle um, losses are typically uh, computed um, by saying, well, you know, you switch off all the shocks, but switching off all the shocks has much more of a flavor of a an unconditional welfare measure. So we'll. This is still some tension um, we should definitely revisit. So thank you very much for pointing this out um, uh, to, to make sure that we are, we are comparing like with likes there and, not, uh, and have, don't have a skewed um, comparison. Um, yeah, so I think this was, uh, I, I think I, I, had, I had the points uh, on which I wanted to comment on. I don't know whether I forgot something right now. Martin, if, if there's something you wanted to have an answer to and we still have time, then I, I but that's all I got on my list now. That's excellent. Uh, so I do thank Martin and then Martin. Uh, that was great. Uh, since we were dealing with uncertainty and adjustments, I can't see Pavel as of yet. So let me then uh, uh, <laughs> kindly ask uh, uh, um, Kamal Ojan to, uh, from the Bank of Canada to uh, take over. So you'll have 30 minutes and I hope in the meantime, we'll have Pavel back and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, great, thank you. Like I'm uh, sharing my screen now. We can see it, That's, that looks You can see good. it, okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, even virtually, like it is great to be like within this group of uh, economists. And uh, so, this paper is a joint work with uh, Fabio Gironi from the University of Washington, and uh, we basically study an unconventional policy tool as a capital account management tool uh, to adjust the composition of external accounts uh, between short-term securities and long-term FDI. And this unconventional policy tool is using interest rate uncertainty. So starting with the colonial pattern of capital flows, like dating back to 19th century, like emerging market economies have been subject to ebbs and flows of capital very frequently. The recent episode distinguishes itself like with the increase in the size and volatility of these capital flows. And this graph like that starts from 2016, April 2016 to end of 2013, shows the surge in the size and volatility, like the changing direction very quickly also, of these capital flows uh, very clearly. And these also uh, Im implications for policymakers, like uh, so uh, especially for emerging market economy policymakers like, uh, who have multiple mandates, this creates additional pressure and uh, new trade-offs like between pursuing multiple mandates, uh, between pursuing multiple objectives emerge. And some uh, central banks need to be even more innovative like in order to uh, ameliorate uh, the adverse effects of these capital flows. So one of the innovative policy that was introduced recently was the uh, unconventional policy of the Turkish Central Bank. So Turkish Central Bank used the interest rate corridor as a policy tool, but uh, let me first describe what this graph is. Like this is uh, the, the Turkish Central Bank's policy main policy rate is a one week repo rate, which is uh, indicated by the blue line here. And this main policy rate fluctuates within a corridor that is uh, specified by the pink area here, uh, which is uh, specified by also overnight lending and borrowing. So late, between late 2010 and uh, late 2011, the Turkish Central Bank, when they were subject to like massive capital inflows, they introduced an interest rate corridor policy. And uh, then they later communicated with the public that when they increase the corridor that the interest rate fluctuates in between, they create an uncertainty on the future path of interest rates in order to discourage short-term inflows. 
But this policy is also just related with the uh, path of short-term interest rates. It wouldn't affect FDI from their uh, communication uh, that, that, that they were thinking, and it could still attract FDI while discouraging short-term inflows into the economy. So what happened? Uh, when we look at this graph, like which shows the financing of the current account of Turkey, like between FDI and portfolio inflows, after the introduction of the policy mix, we see an increase in the composition of FDI, which is denoted by the yellow bars, uh, and these red red portion of these bars are indicated by the portfolio inflows, and we see an increase in the FDI component of these capital flows that are uh, financing the current account after the introduction of this policy mix. However, like this policy is also coinciding with the global financial cycle, and it is obviously not, uh, not certain that uh, whether it was due to the effect of the policy or because of the mean reversion just right after the global financial cycle. And there is no structural model like that studies such unconventional attempt. And what Fabio and I are doing, like filling this void, and uh, we would like to study this policy seriously. So against this background, like we basically ask, like, is using interest rate uncertainty as a policy tool effective in dampening inefficient capital inflows? And does the interest rate uncertainty policy adjust the capital inflows between short-term bonds and FDI? How it affects the composition of the external account? And of course, a question of trade-offs emerge because central bankers uh, also have domestic objectives. And what are the possible trade-offs like, that are faced by these central bankers like navigating among their domestic objectives like price stability while controlling their external account? In order to answer these questions, uh, we, provide, uh, we provide a formal approach and we develop an open economy macro model in which the central bank experiments with the volatility of the interest rate. Sorry. So our model distinguishes carefully between bond and FDI flows, and we also uh, introduce incomplete international financial markets, which imply that net foreign assets position is an important uh, element for the transmission of volatility shocks. And also due to this incomplete international financial markets, risk sharing is not perfect, and there will be a risk sharing wedge over the perfect uh, risk sharing condition in terms of the ratio of marginal utilities of home and uh, rest of the world agents. Our framework also incorporates endogenous movements in markups due to nominal rigidities in order to make the main policy instrument, the conventional one, interest rate, uh, effective. So you can think as the framework as a new Keynesian open economy framework that enables us to decompose the current account into bond and FDI components very easily. But we are building on the new, uh, the new open economy macro framework. We also introduce uncertainty shocks to the domestic policy, uh, to domestic policy interest rates in order to represent this experimental monetary policy introduced by the Turkish Central Bank one-time experimental policy. And uh, these stochastic processes like uh, follow like a stochastic, uh, they have, there are stochastic volatility processes uh, introduced to the uh, shock processes as in Justiniano and Primicieri's seminal AER 2008 paper. And we employ a third order perturbation technique uh, as used in the literature when there are stochastic volatility shocks in these models. And uh, within this class of models, like the impulse response function calculation should be from the stochastic steady state as indicated again by the uh, literature uh, because uh, the ergodic distribution of the endogenous variables move away from their deterministic steady state when uh, there are volatility shocks. So, Overall, like we provide a nonlinear model solution that allows us to trace uh, transmission and propagation of the heteroscedastic volatility. What do we learn? So interest rate uncertainty policy, just the preview of results, uh, can be effective in tackling inefficient capital flows in terms of, uh, in terms of movements in the risk sharing wedge. And it, the, inter the uncertainty policy has also different implications on the bond and FDI components of the ca capital account. The main channels that affect the bond component are, more, are mainly port the rest of the world investors portfolio risk and the precautionary savings channels. A markup channel that emerges due to nominal rigidities in the real sector is very much affected with the FDI component and I will discuss these channels like in detail 
in the rest of my presentation. In affecting the, in affecting the, uh, in affecting the FTI component through markup channel, the degree of exchange rate pass through is also uh, crucial, as even for the qualitative response of the foreign direct investment incoming into the country. Uh, we have cases with the producer currency pricing and dominant currency pricing, and we show that under dominant currency pricing, for instance, the country receives FDI in response to increase in, in the uh, volatility of the main policy rate, whereas it is vice versa under PCP, producer currency pricing. In the end, our conclusion is that like using uncertainty as a policy tool can be useful like in adjusting the current account, but it is always at the higher uh, in, at the expense of higher inflation. So it is debatable like whether uh, this should be employed like very frequently. And we have also several extensions in our paper, like which I won't discuss uh, at length, like due to time limitations like in, uh, at this conference, but we also have cases like with uh, longer horizons to conduct FDI, and we see that wait and see effects are emerging, like when we uh, introduce like time to build the condition to incoming FDI into the economy. We have also cases with uh, other uh, with several assumptions on the currency of export invoicing, with producer currency pricing, local currency pricing, and dominant currency pricing, and we show the uh, effect of exchange rate pass through, like on markups and these how these markups are interacting with the FTI. We also have cases like with the effective lower bound in the rest of the world because when there were ample capital inflows into emerging markets, uh, advanced economies were stuck at the zero lower bound. And we see amplification effects, like when the when the conventional tool, like the interest rate, uh, is insensitive to fluctuations in the rest of the world. And we also have cases with different degrees of risk aversion uh, for rest of the world agents. And uh, when the risk aversion is increasing, we see that uh, emerging market economy households, like borrow extensively using rest of the world securities, and the results can turn upside down. So pictures speak better than words. So this is our model architecture. Uh, we have a two region world economy, which we identify one region as the emerging market economy and the other region as the rest of the world economy. The rest of the world economy can be taught as uh, the countries that are in a, a, a cluster of countries that are interacting with the emerging economy overall. Or we also can adjust for the respective sizes of each region and we can determine the uh, biggest trading partner of this emerging market economy. For instance, if we set the uh, country sizes to 0 0.3, 0 0.7, it, would be, it, it can be a representative of a model uh, of Turkey and Germany or one half, one half, just to show the interaction of an emerging market economy, the cluster of countries that are interacting with this emerging market economy. So households can borrow with, with domestic bonds and also with international bonds that are traded across the border. And as I said earlier, like the international financial markets are incomplete. There are producers in each country uh, which receive capital from households and in return, like uh, they pay a rental rate. And the final good is an Armington aggregator of domestically produced goods and the uh, foreign produced goods. What we add to this setting is also the ability of the households, the rest of the world household, to invest in physical capital that will be used in the emerging market economy production function. And we interpret this as the FTI coming in from the rest of the world because it represents the capital transactions between overseas identities and the respective capital uh, gains also from that transaction in line with the IMF definition. So just to glance off the optimization problems, uh, everything is very standard, like the model setting is very standard. Uh, households are maximizing a constant relative risk aversion function that drive utility from consumption and this utility from providing labor. The budget constraint on the expenditure side, they have consumption, they can save in domestic bonds and emerging market economy households can save in rest of the world or international bonds multiplied with the nominal exchange rate, there are some adjustment costs due to uh, prevent the indeterminacy in, uh, of the steady state. They can invest in physical capital that will be used in 
domestic production function, emerging market economic production function, and they can also invest in capital that will be used in the rest of the world production function, which will be representative for the outgoing FDI. Uh, the income side, like they uh, receive income from the previous hol period holdings of bonds and the previous period holding of international bonds uh, multiplied with the nominal exchange rate. They have their labor income and the rental gains from capital uh, that is rented to domestic producers and rest of the world producers. So wages are sticky, and the small case letter D represents for the profits uh, that are received from uh, monopolistic uh, producers. So what are other constraints? Like there's labor demand equation, like uh, for the individual uh, labor that is supplied by the household. The standard law of motion of physical capital applies to both, and we are even abstracting for, um, from ad adjustment costs in order to keep everything very simple. So the first order conditions indicate us the standard uh, relationships where the real wage is a time varying markup over the marginal substitution of labor over consumption. Because there are no adjustment costs in physical capital, the price of the real price of physical capital is equal to one. Uh, this is the physical capital that is used in the emerging market economic production function and the standard Euler equation for the physical capital applies here. So what is not standard is the capital transactions across the regions. So although there are no adjustment costs, the real price of physical capital that is installed overseas is not equal to one, and it is equal to real exchange rate this time. Yeah, and so this is a variable, like even there are no adjustment costs. And the Euler equation for this capital is also adjusted by the movements in real exchange rate to account for the change in valuation. Similarly, like the price of FTI incoming into the emerging market economy is analogous. We have intermediate good producers, like uh, we employ a three uh, input Cobb Douglas production function. So there is capital obtained from the domestic households, capital obtained from the rest of the world households, and this is combined with the labor of the uh, emerging market economy households. And as I said earlier, like uh, we argue that this is in line with the IMF definition of FTI. So the first order conditions are standard, like real prices are time varying markups over marginal costs. And because exports are priced in the rest of the world currency, there is this real exchange rate component. And final goods producers are producing uh, with employing an Armington aggregator that aggregates the domestically produced good with the imported good. So this framework just enables us to decompose the current account into bond and FDI components very easily. And we can just look at like how, this, uh, how the stochastic volatility uh, to the interest rate, while the uh, stochastic volatility to the interest rate changes, how these components move in response to fluctuations in interest rate uncertainty. And in order to uh, introduce uncertainty to the domestic interest rate rule, and because it was a one-time experiment uh, that was employed by the Turkish Central Bank uh, from our motivation, we introduce as an exogenous component, like which doesn't, which is uh, an additional component in terms, of, uh, in addition to the domestic objectives, uh, which are not captured by the domestic objectives, and this exogenous uh, component follows a stochastic volatility process. And we, we, we experiment with increasing this stochastic volatility of the error process and look at the composition of the current account between bond and FTI, like how they move in response to a rise in uncertainty. As an initial step in our analysis, like uh, we define a time varying wedge over the perfect risk sharing condition, uh, which is captured by the mu t plus one component here. If this was complete markets framework, like the risk sharing in terms of marginal utilities would be perfect and there would be uh, no fluctuations in this additional component. But because in international risk sharing, uh, because incomplete, under incomplete markets, international risk sharing is not perfect and uh, fluctuations in this wage are not ex ante internalized by the agents across the border, as also studied uh, previously in the literature by Costino Lorenzo and Evernin JP paper and Corsetto de Dele, the working paper recently. 
The fluctuations in this wage cause a real exchange rate misalignment and uh, there is an inefficient allocation of wealth across the border uh, due to discrepancies in calculating future uh, and current values of income. And we also see like in response to capital inflows, how, did, how this wage moves and uh, in response to an, a rise in uncertainty in the domestic interest rate, whether this wage is offset. Uh, with respect to its direction of movement, like when there are capital inflows generated into the emerging market economy. So our experiment is like in the we, is in the first period, we increased demand uncertainty for rest of the world securities uh, by introducing shocks to the Euler equations that are reminiscent of the Smets and Waters uh, shocks. So this is uh, this is consistent also with the. Uh, the Giovanni Kalam Lozjan Ulubashkaya paper and raised like global financial cycle as uh, there is an increase in uh, risk during the global financial cycle, which which is also very much related with the global capital flows, and an increase in the rest of the world uh, demand uncertainty generates capital inflows into the other region, like to the emerging market economy, and in the second period, uh, the emerging market economy just deploys the interest rate uncertainty tool in response to these uh, capital inflows that are generated by the increase in demand uncertainty. So we have these following results. These are the responses in response to these uh, increase in demand uncertainty, like which is being denoted by the blue line, and in the second period when there's an increase in interest rate uncertainty. And as I said in the introduction, these responses are calculated from the stochastic steady state after uh, introducing a third order perturbation model solution technique. We see that this, the, for, first of all, the inefficient uh, wage, like in the, over the perfect risk sharing condition, moves in opposite directions. In response to capital inflows, the wage moves, in, moves towards south, but when there is an increase in uncertainty of the interest rate, it just goes into the other direction. We are not studying an optimal uncertainty policy, like because this was a one-time experiment that was deployed uh, by an emerging market economy central bank. So we are not trying to close this wedge perfectly, but it is important to see that interest rate uncertainty generates like uh, opposite uh, directions in this movements of wedge. And it does so while the risk premium uh, component, when there's a risk premium shock due to these uh, disturbances here, uh, it, it generates an inflow into the emerging market economy in the bond compound of the current account. Like, just remember, like, if there is a current account deficit, it implies an inflow uh, of these uh, assets. And it, in response to uncertainty and increase in the uncertainty of the interest rate, these inflows are discouraged and there is a correction in the bond component in the current account. But while there is an encouragement of FDI coming into the emerging market economy. So more or less, like in the base, baseline framework, like this works as intended like by the Turkish Central Bank, it looks like. But how do these uh, appear? Like what is the mechanism? Like? So in order to assess the mechanism, we first look at the uh, decomposition of real risk and the rest of the world's portfolio. And we define these identities, like the excess returns different between different assets uh, in the rest of the world investors' portfolio. The first term indicates the excess return between rest of the world agents' holdings of emerging market economy bonds and rest of the world agents' holdings of international bonds. And these small case like capped variables are the deviations of these variables from their non-stochastic steady state. So under perfect foresight, if this was a certainty equivalent experience, like the expected excess returns would be equal to zero. But because our model solution is a third order approximation, we see also fluctuations in these excess returns and can, tr trans uh, can trace the transmission of risk within the rest of the world portfolio. First of all, we look at the excess return between uh, domestic bonds, emerging market economy bonds and the international bonds. We see that the excess return first jumps increases and then it goes down although in response to an but uh, and and these are responses in uh, uh, responses to interest rate uncertainty in the emerging market economy so when there is an 
increase in the emerging market economy uncertainty, uh, emerging market economy interest rate uncertainty, uh, the emerging market economy bonds offer a higher return to compensate for the risk. But this does not go as high as uh, the risk appetite of the rest of the world investors, and it contributes to an outflow in the bond component of the current account. To provide intuition, like we uh, use the benefit of log normality and uh, relate these excess returns with these identities. For example, when we look at the rest of the world agents, stochastic discount factors, uh, covariance with the changes in nominal exchange rate, we see that this component goes up uh, because of the positive co covariance between the stochastic discount factor and the, the exchange rate. But uh, in order to make the emerging market economy currency a good hedge, it needed to go down. So it, it doesn't make the emerging, the interest rate uncertainty policy in the emerging market economy does not make the uh, emerging market economy currency a good hedge. And in between the physical capital uh, that can be installed into emerging market economy and the rest of the world, uh, we see that the fluctuations in real exchange rates matters a lot. Real exchange rate appreciates from the perspective of the emerging market economy as a hedging mechanism in order to compensate for the uh, for the interest rate uncertainty emerging in the uh, in the emerging market economy. And the relative return between uh, the physical capital uh, installed into the emerging market economy production function and the physical capital that is installed into the rest of the uh, world production function goes down. And this uh, partly also explains why FDI is channeled into the emerging market economy in response to an increase in uncertainty of the interest rates. When we look at the uh, uh, excess return between, oops, excess return between emerging market economy bonds and emerging market economy physical capital, we see that the excess return on bonds goes down, like implying that they are becoming a safer asset, like with respect to the physical capital, which is at odds with the uh, movement in the composition of the current account. So it tells us that there is the transmission of uncertainty within the emerging market economy that is more pronounced than the uh, transmission of uncertainty within the rest of the world investor portfolio. Uh, that matters in response to adjusting this composition. So in order to check the composition of transmission, uh, transmission of uncertainty within the emerging market economy, we, we look at the impasse responses uh, to a rise in interest rate uncertainty in the emerging market economy. What we see is like there is a pronounced like uh, precautionary savings, uh, which is explained by the drop in consumption, and these savings go to domestic investments. And this, the, the domestic investment is the chosen asset by both the uh, rest of the world and the domestic agents due to an interaction with markups, like which I will uh, talk in detail shortly. And uh, these markups are in, important as well. Like uh, In response to a rise in uncertainty, we see the domestic price markup goes on, which is being reflected as a rise in inflation, but the export price markup goes down which is very much related with the direction of FDI, like the incoming FDI into the economy. And to assess the role of markups, when we shut down, for example, the price stickiness and make the prices flexible in the production sector, but keep the wage stickiness like still available in order to make the main policy uh, effective, we see that uh, the impulse responses are just milder and uh, the fluctuations in the current account are also, also much smaller. If there are no the domestic the distortions in production, there is still a little FTI coming into the economy, and this is uh, because of an O. Hartman able effect, uh, which uh, being, which is being identified as like absence in the absence of frictions, volatility can be enhancing uh, even welfare because they would like to take advantage of volatility by producing more in good times and decreasing production also even more like in bad times, uh, which can generate uh, desirable fluctuations from the emerging market economy case. But what matters in amplifying the uh, fluctuations is the 
behavior of markup. So why do markups move? Like markups seem to be very important like in terms of, especially in terms of uh, FDI inflows and outflows. But first of all, like firms, due to price stickiness, like firms cannot adjust to prices, like to changes in demand efficiently, but there is also a competitiveness argument as well. Like the movements in exchange rates is also affecting the movements in exporter revenues and due to these revenues, like markups are being adjusted. If exports are priced in the rest of the world currency, a real exchange rate appreciation, which is being generated as a hedging mechanism in response to a rise in interest rate uncertainty, means the exporter revenues are going up. For competitiveness reasons, like exporters would like to take advantage of this and lower markups. It would be vice versa if we had employed a producer currency pricing uh, assumption on the terms of invoicing for exports. And markups also move because of the asymmetric profit function, which is being studied extensively in the literature, in the closed economy literature, not an open economy. Here, the left, I would like you to focus on the left-hand side panel. Like this is the steady state profit function, uh, the period profits in response to uh, exporters relative prices set. So the blue line indicates the closed economy case where the real exchange rate is just equal to one and the other lines being drawn here like just represents the movements in real exchange rate and how this profit function in response to relative prices change in response to uh, fluctuations in real exchange rate. And the right hand side panel just illustrates that this in three uh, dimensions. So here the blue line indicates the closed economy case. And if I go to the green and magenta, like uh, green and cyan color uh, lines, like it implies a depreciation in real exchange rate. While if I go down, it implies an appreciation of real exchange rate. We see that the asymmetry of the uh, profit function is preserved if the exports are priced in producer currency pricing. Uh, pricing. So in response to uncertainty, if these firms are, uh, is, are going to change their prices, by setting their prices, they can lose a fewer amount of profit than decreasing their prices. So under producer currency pricing, all, all the optimal behavior in response to uh, rising uncertainty is always by increasing prices, which is in line with the closed economy results. Which is different than the closed economy results is the exporter profits under local currency pricing. When uh, the emerging market economy exporters are setting prices in local currency, this time the curvature of the profit function is asymmetric to also real exchange rate. The blue line still indicates the closed economy case, but this time in response to depreciation, decreasing prices are more profitable, while in response to appreciation, increasing prices are more profitable. But uh, because by decreasing prices and depreciation gives a uh, higher profit. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, please wrap up. Sure. I'm, I, I'm just done. This is my last slide. So in response to rising uncertainty under local currency pricing, it is just optimal for these firms to decrease prices and also markups go down due to this asymmetric profit function. So to conclude, like uh, using domestic interest rate risk as a policy, uh, definitely affects the composition of external account between bond and FDI. Uh, the portfolio risk of the rest of the world investors and the precautionary saving channels are very much related with the bond component and the uh, markup channel is very much related with the FDI component. Uncertainty can be used to uh, adjust the external account, but it is always coming at the expense of uh, higher inflation. So this needs to be like carefully assessed before being introduced and we have also many other cases in the paper and if you're interested like uh, I would love to discuss more about the uh, transmission under different cases. Thank you very much. Thank you Kamal for your presentation. Uh, we face some unexpected uh, technical problems here in Poland however uh, we are ready to continue. So the discussion for this paper is, is Michał Brzoza uh, Brzezina, and uh, I think that he will start his presentation from uh, my computer in a, in a second. So uh, give me one minute.
Stop watching. Hello? Am I there? Yes, you're good. We can hear you. Oh, we had some small technical problems. As you see, I'm working from Pavel's computer. Uh, I try to share the screen now. Uh, hope it works. Are the slide in this? No, I don't know. Weź wejdź w folder. Nie, 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 Uh, Gediminas, you had my slide. Do you have my? Because I can't, I can't connect my slides actually. Unfortunately, I share. Okay. I try to share the screen, but it doesn't connect. Gediminas, do you have my slides? It seems we do. Uh, so let's wait for a sec. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I always thought it's better to be. Face to face. Um. So actually, meanwhile we are waiting, unless it appears in 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 a second, we've got a question to Kamal. Maybe we can uh, we can do that. So there was a question on motivating your research that you know uh, this interest rate uncertainty is being used in Turkey. So maybe we can leave this for for later. But if you could elaborate whether this has ever been used by other central banks, or to shed light on sort of external validity or the usefulness of this tool. Okay, but since we have the slides, we can proceed with Michal. Uh, can, can you see my slides yes? No? We can. No? Oh, that's excellent. I mean, technology works. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm super happy to, to discuss this paper. Uh, I, really, I really enjoyed it uh, by Fabio and by Kemal. Uh, so let, let me start briefly by saying what they did. Although Kemal, at least until the moment I was able to watch his presentation was super clear. I didn't, I didn't see the second half of the presentation, so I'm not. Uh, I, I don't know what happened after the 15th minute, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was uh, clear, clear as well. But so let me very briefly repeat: the, the, the motivation is such: there are capital inflows or outflows, and in history they have, uh, in many many cases, have serious consequences for small economy. Uh, that was also the case of the Bank of Turkey, and the Bank of Turkey decided to introduce a new policy tool. Okay, the, the authors call it ERAP, and it's widening or narrowing of the interest rate corridor, so making the interest rate of the central bank uh, less certain. Okay, that's a new instrument, new policy. It raises, uh, I think, quite uh, quite important questions like how does this instrument work, how does it affect welfare, how does it compare to other instruments, and so on. So I think it's a great reason to. To, to, to write a paper, uh, and that's actually what, they, what the authors uh, do. Okay. Uh, one thing I want to make sure from the methodological point of view, what they do, uh, they use a DSG model, Open Economy New Keynesian DSG model, in this sense relatively standard. However, the solution is not standard, or the impulse responses that you have seen and you will also see in my slides are not standard in the sense that they are not standard level shocks like a monetary policy shock or technology shock. These are shocks to uncertainty. These are shocks to uncertainty. They require solving the model under at least third order approximation, and then the impulse responses are just deviations from the ergodic distribution of the uh, of the model. So that's something different than sort of standard shocks in in, in DSG models. And what I mo probably most like in the paper is how the authors manage to summarize uh, summarize the result in in one actually in, in one. In one kind of variable because you know it's a big model many variables if you start to look at all of them you you can lose the big picture uh, the summary is called a wedge what is this wedge in this in this model it's a wedge in the perfect risk sharing condition so under perfect risk sharing the, the equation that you can see in the upper part of the slide uh, holds so marginal utilities and the real exchange rate uh, are, are related and constant if Markets are incomplete, international financial markets are incomplete, and in the real world they usually are, uh, then a wedge can emerge, okay? And the authors calculate this wedge, and, and, uh, and uh, a part of the results is just shown via, via this wedge. 
Uh, here's a picture from the paper. I think Kemal didn't show exactly this picture, but uh, but 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 related pictures, uh, which exactly shows in this one with this with this well, precisely with this wedge what 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 happens here. So the authors introduce a let's call it bad shock to the foreign economy. I don't know if it's bad or good, but uh, what it does it increases uncertainty in the foreign economy, generates extra savings in the foreign economy. And these savings uh, flow the small open economy, uh, so capital flows into the small open economy. Uh, but what is even more important is that this wedge emerges, okay? And this wedge uh, can be seen on this picture as this blue blue, blue line, okay? So it's not constant anymore, it, it, it falls. And then Kemal and, and Fabio say, well, but here's the Bank of Turkey, and they introduce this new policy, uh, they introduce this new policy, this IRAFT policy, and this, uh, this policy is able to produce a wedge that looks like a mirror image of the original wedge. Okay, so that's the pink line. Here is a wedge that is generated by this uh, by this uh, IRAFT policy of the Bank of uh, Bank of Turkey, and you see uh, even from this picture you can undo the the, the, the inflows with this with this with this uh, with this policy wedge. Okay, so that sounds like something interesting and, and promising. And, um, and I really, I mean, I, I really like the paper uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, it tackles a new question in monetary economics. Um, it's a, it uses a start of the art, state of the art modeling approach to, to answer this model. Uh, my role is in discussing this, however, to raise some potential, potential concerns, maybe some issues. So that's what I'm going to do in the rest uh, of my, of my presentation. Okay. So actually I have two concerns that I want to raise and then one sort of open issue. And so let me start with, with, with concern number one. So apart from capital portfolio inflows, uh, the authors have in the paper also FDI inflows. Okay, that's in general, it's nice. FDIs are important and FDI flows are, are also important. Uh, and, and in their baseline model, FDIs uh, react immediately to this uh, interest rate uncertainty policy. Okay, so interest rate uncertainty policy uh, starts working and FDIs react. That sounds like something um, pretty unrealistic. So FDIs are long-term investment projects, and they probably completely ignore short-term, you know, monetary policy developments. That's 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 at least my my my, my feeling. So to be fair, the authors take this into account and they do a robustness check where FDIs uh, are limited by time to build constraints. So it takes time to 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 to, to invest into 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 capital. Makes sense. Uh, my concern is this. This should be actually the baseline scenario, and this wouldn't be nothing, nothing wrong with it if not for the case that actually in this scenario, so when when there's this time to build constraint, everything is reversed. So it's not only that uh, the FDI re reaction is reversed, but also that the bond reaction, the portfolio flows uh, reaction is reversed. So the central bank increases its interest rate uncertainty, but uh, portfolio flows increase even more. At least that's what I got from the paper. If, if I'm wrong, Kemal, please, 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 please correct me after, after that. So that's, that's, that's my first concern. Uh, my second one, and may, maybe the, probably the biggest one that I have, is about the source of the shock. So what the authors do, let me repeat it again, they start with a foreign shock to, to the volatility of the so-called Smets and Vouters innovation, so the, the volatility of a risk shock. Okay, let, let me put it this way, and this can be indeed the case. So it's, uh, it's pretty pretty obvious that volatility can can of a shock can increase in the in the foreign economy and can drive capital into 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 small open economy. That's that's perfectly fine. But it's perfectly fine as saying that any other shock in the model, domestic or foreign, can do the same actually. So uh, and from the paper we know that this Iraq policy is very good at counterbalancing these risk shocks that we have seen. We have seen this mirror image. Uh, but the question is, is it equally efficient against uh, against other shocks like conventional or unconventional monetary policy, for instance? Uh, for instance, and uh, I try to check this. I try to check this, of course, not in the author's model, but in my own model. It was easier for me, uh, but uh, but it's a relatively similar model. So it's this open economy. You can change them all with some extra features, different calibration. So it's not exactly the same result, but actually it looks like uh, I was able to replicate something very similar to what the authors did, at least in the in the in the upper part of this picture. So this these five uh, these five uh, uh, graphs here in the in the upper part is replicating something very similar to to what the authors did. So it's the rest of the world risk shock of volatility, yeah, volatility of a preference shock to be precise. And as you can see, uh, what happens is that. Uh, the risk sharing wedge 
goes down as in the paper, small open economy debt go, goes up and the rest of the world consumption goes, goes down. So, and here's the risk for volatility to the initial, initial shock, okay? So that's, that's, uh, that's just repeating what the authors did. But the lower, the lower panel is a little bit more worrying because what I did here, I introduced a different shock in the rest of the world. So that's an interest rate shock, a very standard, super standard shock to the level of the foreign interest rate, so like a shock in the Taylor rule. Uh, and uh, qualitatively, it does similar things. So, it in, so capital leaves the rest of the world, flows into the small open economy, so small open economy debt increases. The risk sharing wedge, yes, it goes down, but as you see, the picture is very different than here. Here it goes down and shoots up, like a mirror image of this erupt policy. Here the, the, the direction where this risk sharing wedge goes is, is, is very different. It keeps falling, and my intuition is that this erupt policy would not be that, would not be that efficient in, uh, in, in counteracting this shock. That was me I should finish. Let me just my last slide, okay? Uh, uh, and, 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 and I'm done. So that's an open issue. So that's not a concern anymore. It's an open issue. Initially, I thought when, when I read this paper, well, it's really a new policy. So the Central Bank of Turkey increases the volatility of the interest rate. Yeah, that looks like something, uh, that looks like something new. Uh, but then the second thought came, well, I've seen this somewhere. Actually, many countries, including, uh, including Poland in the past, use something pretty similar, which is changing the volatility of the exchange rate in order to, to discourage capital flows, okay? And uh, the question, the natural question is, are these policies different? Are they, they similar? Are they the same? Uh, I run this experiment on my model again, and I see the wedges and the, and the depth uh, looks, uh, the, the, the impulse responses look very similar to this ERAFT policy, actually. Uh, so are they the same? Maybe one is better, maybe one is worse. But it's new, I think, an open question and probably an interesting one. Okay, so let me let me stop here. Thanks for attention, and I'll become I'll become public now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you, Michal, for discussion. And uh, I think that we are a bit we don't have much time, so I will skip the questions and, and I would like to thank uh, both our discussants and our presenters uh, uh, for, for their speeches and I will turn it over to Pavilas now. Lovely. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that was great, despite some uh, some small issues, but that's part of, of uh, life and actually live broadcast. Uh, lovely. Thanks a lot. Actually, we did plan to take a break, uh, but uh, since the time is running um, and I see Jennifer already connected, so maybe we can then close. I do think again. Uh, we will not ventilate the room as we planned, the virtual room. Let me just check if uh, Jennifer can hear me and whether we can see her. Lovely. Hi. Can you can you hear me? We can hear you. At least I can hear you. Okay, sorry. I was having some problems. But I think we are oh, good. it looks like... Okay. I think right. we're good. So then I do thank everyone else. And then uh, I'll just uh, briefly introduce you, Jennifer. So first of all, thanks a lot for agreeing to be part of this. Uh, um, you know, for us, it's also uh, uncharted waters with this virtual conference. Um, so really great to have you, unfortunately not here in Vilnius, but at least uh, uh, remotely. And I know it's early morning for you. So double thanks. Uh, let me just introduce very quickly to all viewers and let me kindly remind that the online question system does work. So please do ask questions there, which I will uh, then uh, uh, communicate to Jennifer. Uh, so, okay, just to make sure I'm not omitting anything important, Jennifer Lau is Associate Professor at Columbia University and she's also a Monetary Advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis faculty research fellow at NBER and associate editor of Review of Economic Dynamics. Uh, Jennifer is a macroeconomist and also applied theorist, and she has contributed a number of works uh, dealing with the effect of information and financial frictions on business cycles. Actually, we'll hear something along those lines today. 
But uh, more recently, Jennifer has studied optimal fiscal and monetary policy when firms face informational limitations, implications of production networks for business cycle fluctuations, as well as aggregate effects of complex interdealer networks on financial stability. So no wonder that you're advising Fed. Uh, it seems to be super policy relevant, and we are thrilled to have you today. Uh, the house rules are such that uh, you'll have 50 minutes and then in order to, you know, allow people who are watching us to raise questions, let us leave around uh, 10 minutes. I will indicate when five minutes are left for your presentation. So the floor is yours and really pleasure to have you. Okay, perfect. Thanks. And uh, yeah, let me know if I was having some troubles connecting earlier. So hopefully everything's okay now. Um, let me share this. Uh, can you see we my can screen? See it. That's perfect. If we can maybe okay. see it full page, uh, like yeah. full screen. How do I be... do this? Lovely. Okay. Awesome. Great. Okay. So thanks a lot for having me. I'm also uh, sad that I didn't get to visit Lithuania this year, but hopefully you know, one day when this is all over, uh, I really hope to hope to come there. So today I'm going to um, talk about the role of informational frictions in business cycles. Uh, so hold on, is this, does this work? Yeah, okay. Okay, so this conference is about uncertainty, um, but what do we think about when we think of economic uncertainty? So what do we, you know, when we model economic agents, oftentimes we think of economic agents having uncertainty about fundamentals. So let me think of that as like productivity or demand preferences, trade costs um, in the current situation, the effects of COVID. Uh, and we also like to think about agents having uncertainty about policy, so fiscal, monetary policy, tariffs, financial regulation, and again, in the current situation, we think about um, COVID-19. So these, I think of as a particular type of uncertainty that agents can have, you know, can can face. But I also think, and and you know, and I think it's very important that economics also face what's called strategic uncertainty. So what is strategic uncertainty? So strategic uncertainty is uncertainty about the actions of other agents. That's sort of the game th theoretic uh, idea. Um, but in the work that I do and many others do, it's the, the term strategic uncertainty means uncertainty about outcomes or economic outcomes beyond any uncertainty about fundamentals. A necessary component to this, to having strategic uncertainty, is some sort of asymmetric or dispersed information. So economic agents need to be making some type of economic decision, either real or nominal or whatever, under not only incomplete information about fundamentals, but also dispersed information. So some type of asymmetry between what one agent knows versus another. And do I think this is relevant? Well, there's actually a wealth of evidence that firms face informational friction. So for example, all of the work of Kwebian Gorodnichenko has really um, shown us through surveys and a lot of other evidence that firms, as well as households, make decisions under dispersed information, that, they, that there are deferring forecasts of what's going on in the economy. So my talk today, which is based on just the my whole research agenda with uh, George Marius Angelitos is to think about the role of informational frictions and in particular strategic uncertainty. That means this uncertainty about what other agents are doing beyond any, uncert any uncertainty about fundamentals within the business cycle environment. Okay, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to give a very simple abstract game theoretic model. Um, this is going to be uh, the, this is coming a lot out of the work of Morris and Shin, so their AER 2002 paper um, presents this really simple beauty contest game. It's abstract, but it showcases the role of strategic uncertainty. So that's why I'm going to do this model first. 
Then I'm going to talk more about my, my own work with Mario's about taking these insights and embedding it into a general equilibrium business cycle model. So in our model, firms make real input decisions under this incomplete and dispersed information. And finally, um, I'm going to think about strategic uncertainty you know, in these models and, and show how they can lead to beliefs-driven or sentiment-driven fluctuations. And that's kind of the bottom line of why we want to think about strategic uncertainty in macro or it, also in international macro. And then finally, I will uh, just briefly note some of the extensions of this model that we've worked on. One is on optimal monetary policy. So that was a paper just uh, published this year in the JPE, as well as thinking about optimal central bank transparency. Okay, and I'll just touch upon those and then finally conclude. Okay, so what I'll start with is this simple beauty contest game. So suppose there's a continuum of agents indexed by I, so think of this, there being just a unit mass of agents, and each agent is going to choose an action, which I'm gonna call QI. Okay, and that can be somewhere on the real line. The payoffs of the agent are going to depend not only on their own action, but also the aggregate action, which is this Q bar. Okay, so that's kind of like the average across all the agents, as well as some payoff relevant state, which I'll just call here S. Okay, so these are what affects the agent's payoffs. And in particular, I'm going to use the linear quadratic beauty contest game of Morrison Shin which is basically this um, quadratic loss between the agent's action and the fundamental S, or the payoff relevant state, as well as the, uh, the loss from the distance between the agent's action and the aggregate action, okay? So the agent's problem is simply to choose, oh, that should be QI, to minimize their quadratic loss by choosing their action under their own, their expectation under their own information set. And the nice thing about this game is that it gives you this really simple linear best response function where the agent wants to choose some action that's both close to the fundamental as well as close to the aggregate action. And what this alpha parameter here, which is just a parameter, um, is simply the slope of the best response function with respect to the agent's action or agent's expectation of the average action or the aggregate action. So this alpha parameter is very important. It governs what's known as strategic interaction. Um, I'm going to put uh, say that it's less than one in order to keep the equilibrium unique. Um, but if you think about alpha being positive, that means that there's strategic complements, which means that the agent would like to be close to the aggregate action. On the other hand, if it's negative, the agent wants to be far away from the, from the um, aggregate actions, so that's called strategic substitutes. And when alpha is equal to zero, there's no strategic action. The agent doesn't care about the aggregate action. They only care about predicting the fundamental, okay? So moving on, so now suppose we just, we just solve this game under symmetric information. So suppose all agents have the same information set. So then I just plug it in here. And what you get by symmetry is that there's a unique equilibrium as long as alpha is less than one. That's why I put in that, um, that constraint on this parameter. And the unique equilibrium is simply that all agents play the same action and this action is simply equal to the common expectation of the fundamental, okay? So there are a couple of things to note here. Under symmetric information, strategic complementarity alpha, which now I'm just gonna think of as positive, uh, is, is the, the equilibrium's independent of alpha. Alpha just drops out. Furthermore, the equilibrium moves one for one with a common expectation of fundamental. So all that matters in this game under symmetric information is simply what agents think about the fundamentals. There's no idea about this strategic uncertainty. Okay, so there's uncertainty only about fundamentals. However, if you allow for dispersed information, so now you say agents don't have the same information sets, now you allow for some, there's still uncertainty about fundamentals here. So this is simply the best response function where I've just written it also in terms of what the average action is, so this integral. 
there's still uncertainty about fundamentals, but there's this extra uncertainty. And what is this extra uncertainty? This is what we call strategic uncertainty. It's uncertainty about what other agents will play beyond any uncertainty about fundamentals. And here, this strategic uncertainty, how important this term is, is governed by, the, the strength of it is governed by this alpha, okay? If alpha is really large, agents care a lot more about what other agents are going to play as opposed to uh, the underlying fundamental. Now you can iterate this best response forward, okay? And what you get is simply that this best response can be written as a geometric sum of all these higher order beliefs, okay? So that's this term here. And what are these E bars? E bar is the average expectations operator. So this says, I care about what I think about S, I also care about what everyone else thinks about S. So that's this average expectations operator. I care about what everyone else thinks that everyone else thinks about S and so on. So what I'm trying to predict, not only is the fundamental itself, but it's also what all these other agents think about the fundamental. So that's where the strategic compliment or strategic uncertainty comes in. Okay, and these, this E to the K is just, you know, you can keep iterating to get the next average order belief. And the reason why the law of iterated expectations doesn't hold here is because all these agents have these different information sets. So these don't just collapse. In the common information case, this is all collapses back down to one expectation, the common expectation of S. In the case where you have dispersed information, because these agents don't have overlapping information sets, these these continue to grow okay so now let's let's add some more structure to this let me say that there's a common prior let me just say that at, so the nice thing about the linear um quadratic setup is that you get really nice you know simple results if you also use a gaussian uh, information structure so if you have a common prior on S, so let's just say it's a uh, prior of zero and that's this is it's the precision or the one over the, the variance of the, this normal distribution. And then suppose agents get some private signal of S plus some orthogonal noise, but let's say this, these are idiosyncratic across the agents, as well as some public signal, where this public signal has what's called common noise. Okay, so this epsilon here, Again, here's the precision of the public signal. This is the precision of the private signal, but this error is common, okay? So it leads to common errors in beliefs and all agents see the public signal, but they only see their own private signal. Then you get this unique equilibrium strategy at, given by the following. So this is the nice thing about the linear quadratic Gaussian setup. You get this linear equilibrium and each agent's action is going to be affected, it's going to be a linear combination of their private signal and their pu and the public signal. And the interesting thing here is now alpha shows up, okay? Alpha, if alpha increases, okay, then the agent puts less weight on their private signal, but greater weight on their public signal. And the intuition for this is very simple. It just means that if I'm trying to, you know, if alpha is really high, what I care about is not necessarily the fundamental. What I care about is what other agents are going to play. Now, what does the public signal tell me? The public signal tell, is something that all other agents are looking at. So therefore it tells me kind of what other agents, uh, the information of other agents, and hence I want to put more weight on that and potentially less weight on my private signal because my private signal is private. No other agent can see it. Now, if other agents, if all agents think this way and put more weight on the public signal relative to just like the Bayesian weight, then again, I'm gonna think, okay, if all other agents are putting more weight on the public signal, I too want to put more weight. And hence you get this amplification of, you know, putting more weight on the public signal because all other agents are putting more weight on the public signal and everyone knows that. So as you, as you increase alpha, you go away from just uncertainty about the fundamental, which would just be the simple Bayesian weights on the fundamental, and you end up putting more and more weight on the public signal. And hence, also another thing to say here is that the common prior too is like a public signal because it's common. So you would also put greater weight both on the public signal and on the prior, and less weight on the private signal. 
So then if you aggregate this, what happens is you get an aggregate action, which is some function. So if you just aggregate the, the equation I had on the last slide, you get some weight on the fundamental, okay? That's coming from the private signal and some weight on the public signal, okay? Then that can, you can write this as some function of the fundamental and some function of the noise, okay? So what, what drives the aggregate action here is going to be both the fundamental and the noise term, the common error term. And what you get is that if you increase alpha, greater complementarity means that you're gonna put less weight on this S, okay? So that's actually another way of saying that is you're gonna put more weight on the prior, and hence you get inertia to fundamental shocks. At the same time, if you put, if you have greater complementarity, you put greater weight on the public signal. So that means that in equilibrium, there's gonna be greater weight on this common noise term epsilon and hence you get amplification of this noise or common errors and beliefs okay and this is really the this is the role of strategic uncertainty so this is why i showed you this very simple game and this very simple game it's easy to see here that if you allow agents to have dispersed information you that's like a necessary component you can't just have common common information but uncertainty about the the fundamental. But if you allow agents to have this dispersed information, now they have strategic uncertainty about what other agents are playing. And through that, you're able to amplify the aggregate effect of these common errors in beliefs. And hence, this, this uh, common, uh, sorry, the average action will driven, be driven not only by fundamentals, but as well as this common error in beliefs. And as you increase alpha, it's going to be put more weight on this epsilon and less weight on the fundamental, even if agents are fairly certain about fundamentals. So you could have that agents put a lot of weight on their private, or they have fairly certain uh, ideas about the fundamental from their private signal, and yet they're still going to put a lot of weight on their public signal. Okay, so why, so these are the insights that sort of come out of this abstract game theoretic literature what I want to talk now is more about my own work, which is in macro. So my work with Marius is that essentially we embed these insights into a general equilibrium business cycle, cycle macro model. So this is both in our 2010 uh, NBER macro annual paper, as well as our Econometrica 2013 paper. And I'm going to give you the very basic version of this model here, and then I'll, I'll talk more about the differences in this, these two papers later. But essentially, in this model, we allow firms to make real decisions under incomplete and dispersed information, as in that game. What in our environment gives rise to strategic complementarity is the specialization in trade. Okay, so uh, I'll be very specific of where, of where this is coming from. And the implications of this, of allowing for this dispersed information and strategic uncertainty, is that you're going to get inertia of the aggregate economy with respect to fundamentals, so think of productivity, but amplification of common errors or noise and beliefs. And the whole, the bottom line is that by introducing these type of abstract game theoretic notions into a business cycle model, um, we're able to formalize a notion of beliefs or sentiment-driven business cycles with, within a fully microfounded, unique equilibrium, rational expectations environment. So agents, we don't need to rely on any behavioral you know, irrationality. We don't need to rely on multiple equilibria. You can have beliefs or sentiment-driven fluctuations along the unique equilibrium in a rational expectations environment. Okay, so let me get to the model. So there's going to be a continuum of islands, <clears throat> I. Information is going to be symmetric within an island, but asymmetric across islands. So basically, these islands are going to sort of be the economic geography of the information itself. There's going to be a representative firm per island, and this firm is going to produce a differentiated good. And in order to, um, in order to produce it, it's going to hire labor. Uh, and, and use that labor to produce this good, okay? And then there's gonna be a representative household. You can think of that as just like living on the mainland or something, 
it's going to have a continuum of workers who work at these firms and it's good it's going to have a representative consumer okay so the first stage in this game so each period is going to have two stages there's going to be a first stage under dispersed information so the households are going to send a worker to each of these islands on these islands local information is going to be revealed so that's going to be local productivity in, in this setting once that information is revealed within the island local labor markets are going to operate and employment and production choices will take place okay and local label labor markets will clear so this is all under dispersed information everyone on the island knows their productivity but they may not know what's going on on other islands in the second stage workers return home all information is revealed and centralized commodity and markets open and price is clear okay and consumption and savings takes place. Okay, so the household is pretty standard. We're gonna have, this is the representative household. It's going to have um, preferences over consumption of the final consumption good. And uh, this is going to be the disutility from the, its workers from labor. And the consumption, the final consumption good here is, so each island is gonna produce these differentiated goods. So we have the CES, Dixit, Stiglitz type of consumption over these goods, where rho is the elasticity of substitution. So the budget constraint is just gonna be that the household purchases these goods, their income comes from um, profits and from their workers, Okay, so they own these firms at the end of the day. And so they get profits from the firms as well as the workers' income. And then they can save in these bonds. But there's, you know, there, it's a representative household and bonds are in fixed supply. So they, these don't really play any role other than, you know, RT is going to just be the, you know, the discount factor. Okay, so firms, so the firms are the interesting part of this, this, uh, paper because this is where we put the dispersed information. We don't put it on the household side, we put it on the firm side. So firms are gonna have the following technology. Okay, so AIT is their um, island specific productivity. LIT is how much uh, labor they use. And then theta is just some decreasing returns and labor. And then QIT is gonna be their output. So the firm objective is simply to maximize the um, the expected shareholder value. Okay, so this is the stochastic discount factor of the household, and then this is their profits, PIT times QIT. So their revenue minus their costs, and then there's goods market clearing. So whatever the firm produces, that's consumed by the household. So what are the shocks? So the shocks in this economy, there's going to be local productivity shocks, which we're going to think of as uh, say it has some common components. So you can think of this as aggregate productivity and some idiosyncratic components, okay? Uh, this is not necessary. Well, okay, let me take that back. This is necessary for the way I've set it up here, but basically the firms will know their own productivity, but they won't know aggregate productivity. They can't tell the difference between the common and the idiosyncratic part of this. And then aggregate productivity, in the paper we have that it's AR1, but here, just for simplicity, let me just say that it's um, it's just IID and drawn from some normal distribution, okay? Where this is kappa zero is, is, the, is the precision of this common prior over aggregate productivity. Okay, so information. So agents or firms will have the, firms and workers will have perfect information about their local productivity but they'll get some private signal and public signal about aggregate productivity. And I'm going to just uh, model these in the same way I had modeled before in the abstract game. So the private signal is going to be XIT, and it's going to have some idiosyncratic shock, UIT, and let kappa X be the precision of this private signal. And then the public signal we'll call YT, and there's some uh, common error, epsilon T, so this kappa Y is the precision of the public signal, and this epsilon T is what's going to be called common noise in the equilibrium. Or, okay, you don't know it's in the equilibrium yet, but this is this is going to be an aggregate shock like productivity that could potentially drive uh, equilibrium outcomes. Okay, so uh, just a short slide on notation. We're going to call omega IT the type of the island. So again, kind of more like the game theoretic 
a setting where you have types. And that's just going to be the um, productivity of the island, the private signal, and the public signal. So it's just going to encode all local information about local fundamentals and the aggregate state. Okay, and also think of this XIT not necessarily as an added private signal, but you can think of it as a sufficient statistic for private information so that it contains all the information also from this AIT. And then ST, I'm going to use to denote the aggregate state. So this would include not only the productivity, the aggregate productivity shock, but also the entire cross-sectional distribution of information sets omega IT. Given that I've just set this up in the simple Gaussian case, that just means that the aggregate state here is really the realization of the productivity shock as well as the realization of the public signal, or you can think of it alternatively and equivalently as the realization of the aggregate productivity as well as the, realize, the, the realization of the epsilon, the common noise. Okay, so equilibrium, this is just the definition, which I'll just go through really quickly. It's just that local employment and production are optimal from the uh, standpoint of the firm with information omega. W omega clears the labor market on island omega. So think of these omegas now as kind of like indexing these islands because they summarize all their information. And then P of omega S clears the product markets. And this can depend on the aggregate state because it clears the product markets in stage two. I'm going to normalize the aggregate price level to one because it's a completely real model right now. And this is aggregate output. Okay, and it's the CES aggregator. So the general equilibrium in this model is going to be a hybrid of the wall raise of a wall raising equilibrium stage two because prices just clear, uh, you know, goods markets. But in stage one, it's going to look more like a perfect Bayesian equilibrium. Okay, so let me characterize this equilibrium. You can start in stage two, and because of the CES. Uh, um, structure, you get just the simple CES demand. So these prices are what's going to clear the market um, in stage two. So starting in stage one, firms are going to maximize their expectation of their profits multiplied it by the by the marginal utility of the household, um, taking into account this demand curve. So that's what's happening here. And it's going to be maximizing this conditional on their information set omega. Okay, so that's why I'm putting this omega here. Omega is just the stand-in for all the information the firm has. And workers do the same thing. They choose their labor subject to what their expectation is of the, their marginal rate of substitution, as well as the wage on island omega. Now, if you put those two things together, you get that the key equilibrium condition on this island it's simply given by this, okay? And this may be difficult to read, but it's actually pretty simple. It just means that, so within an island, firms are optimizing, uh, labor is optimizing, or workers are optimizing. And all of this says is that the marginal cost of labor on island omega is going to be equal to the marginal benefit of labor. So here is the uh, markup coming from the CES. The marginal utility of commodity omega, so this is the marginal utility of consumption, the marginal utility of consumption of commodity omega in final consumption, and then finally, this is the marginal product of labor. And under complete information, these are always equated, but given that we're under incomplete information, all I have here is this, this is equated given the expectation conditional on the information omega that the firm and the worker have during stage one. Okay, so that's this term. <clears throat> so then, so the, so here's the nice thing. You can take this equation, which is the key equilibrium condition on every island, and if you either log linearize or if you assume a Gaussian structure of information, which we're eventually going to do, this is actually, uh, and this is actually exactly equal. It's not an approximation. Um, the equilibrium production strategy is the unique unique fixed point to this equation, okay? So what is this? This is the output on island omega, or the log output, 
And it's going to be this log linear combination of their own productivity, as well as the island's expectation, conditional on omega, of aggregate output. Okay? And the nice thing is that this looks exactly like the beauty contest game I showed you earlier, or the best response in the beauty contest game I showed you earlier, you know, with a little bit of tweaks, but basically it's essentially the same. And here, these now these terms here, these alpha and this chi, which wasn't there before, are micro-founded. They're coming from the underlying parameters of the macro environment. And here, chi is essentially the sensitivity of aggregate output to, to uh, aggregate productivity under complete info, which I'll show you on the next slide. Whereas alpha is the sensitivity of the the log productivity on or sorry the log production on island omega with respect to the island's expectation of aggregate output. So it looks like as though in stage one there's this perfect Bayesian equilibrium of this fictitious game across islands. Alpha here is the degree of strategic complementarity. So it's kind of how the island res uh, responds to their expectation of what other agents or what other islands are going to do. And this is what I mean by strategic uncertainty. It's, you know, they, they may know perfectly their own productivity, but what they also care about is what other islands are going to produce. And where is the strategic complementarity coming from? Well, the main thing here is this row, okay? Because this row doesn't show up over here. This row is this elasticity of substitution across the islands coming from the constant, from the CES or from the dixit stiglitz aggregator, okay? And this, this complementarity that originates in specialization and trade. Okay, so that's kind of one of our main results, which is just that the this micro-founded economy can look a lot like this abstract game that we talked about before, whereas now these alphas are micro-founded by the um, different, you know, parameters governing the, the preferences and technology. Okay, so now let me talk about, suppose we had complete information. If you had complete information, you would have that the equilibrium level of aggregate output is given by this. So now um, alpha doesn't matter, and the only thing that matters is this chi, which is just going to be the sensitivity of output to the aggregate productivity. So this is kind of like, in some ways, is the typical RBC model. Basically, the economy, there's no nominal frictions. There's only productivity shocks, and the economy is just driven by productivity. Okay, just RBC without capital. But now if I allow for dispersed information, the equilibrium level of output is now, so this is for each island, is going to be a function of their own productivity on that island their private signal, and their public signal. And these coefficients here are similar to what we had in the underlying game, you know, the abstract game before. In particular, the private signal is going to be decreasing in alpha, whereas the public signal is going to be increasing alpha. Okay? So now, so basically when information is symmetric, Uncertainty about macroeconomic outcomes reduces to uncertainty about fundamentals, and alpha, the, the level of strategic complementarity, is irrelevant for the business cycle. On the other hand, when information is dispersed, you have this new strategic uncertainty. This additional uncertainty is, can be, you can have this uncertainty about macroeconomic outcomes beyond any uncertainty about fundamentals. And here I'm going to show you alpha becomes crucial for the business cycle. Okay, so if I take what I showed you before for the equilibrium under dispersed information, and now if I aggregate it, I get that equilibrium level of aggregate output is given by this uh, log Q. So log Q, aggregate output, is going to be a function of productivity as well as common noise. Okay, and one thing to note here is that now the um, coefficient on aggregate productivity is going to be less than uh, what it is in the complete information case. So that means that relative to complete information, we're dampening the response of the economy uh, to productivity. And then now this phi epsilon is positive, okay? And it's the same, it's the exact same intuition that I gave you for the um, beauty contest game. Basically, if you increase 
the level of strategic complementarity. So now just, so think of this meaning that we're increasing the complementarity of goods across all these islands, okay? Then agents care more about what other, uh, what other um, islands are gonna produce compared to their own island. They want to be closer to what other islands are producing because of some you know, demand externality. If I wanna be close to what other, what other um, islands are producing, then I'm gonna put more weight on my public signal and less weight on my private signal because my public signal informs me about what other, what other firms are choosing on other islands. But now if everyone knows that you're putting more information on or putting more weight on the public signal, then you also wanna put even more weight on the public signal and hence everyone else wants to put even more weight on the public signal. And that's where you get this amplification. The more strategic complementarity, the more weight on the public signal, the less weight on the private signal. And in equilibrium, what does that mean? That means that now you have this common error that starts uh, creeping into equilibrium output and now driving aggregate fluctuations. And you're, you, what you're doing is you're dampening the effect of the productivity or about, of fundamentals, but increasing the, increasing the amount of aggregate output that's coming from this common noise or common errors and beliefs. Okay, uh, that's what I'm saying here. So basically increase in, in strategic complementarity, less weight on the fundamental, more weight on the common error, so you dampen the impact of innovations on product in productivity or on equilibrium output and employment, as well as amplify the impact of noise or common errors and beliefs. Okay, so how should we think about this? So, so that's kind of the main idea of our paper, which is basically that noise, <clears throat> as long as you have strategic uncertainty. So what does that mean? You need dispersed information as well as some type of complementarity, strategic complementarity, which we micro found in this model. If you have those, what you get is that you can have this business cycles driven not by fundamentals, but more from beliefs. So what we do in this paper is we're formalizing this notion that, you know, that people generally have that basically economies can be driven much more by sentiment or beliefs and, and trying to um, coordinate with others on their beliefs as opposed to fundamentals itself. And the and I, I think the innovation of this paper is really to be able to do this within a fully microfounded, unique equilibrium, rational expectations environment. We don't use any type of behavioral tricks. We don't use any type of um, uh, multiple equilibria. And at the same time, we're able to get something that feels like this beliefs or sentiment driven business cycles. This is both in our NBR macro annual as well as our econometrica. You may be wondering what's the difference between the two. So the, the noisy business cycles paper, we still needed some type of underlying shock in terms of fundamentals. And that's what I presented to you here. So if you go back to this slide, basically you still have some shock to fundamentals here Whereas in the Econometrica paper, we're able to do it without, <clears throat> with zero movement in underlying fundamentals. Because, you know, usually you need to be uncertain about something. Here, in our Econometrica paper, we're actually able to do it without any underlying fundamentals so that we show that the business cycle can be purely driven by sentiment. And the added ingredient there is that we allow for trade to be randomized and decentralized. Okay, so basically you have these agents that now meet randomly, they don't know each other's productivity, and but hence you can still get these beliefs driven um, business cycles, even if aggregate productivity isn't moving. Okay, so now let me just talk about some extensions and, and then I'm going to conclude. So uh, what else have we done with this model? So this, the model I showed you was completely real. We didn't have any um, nominal frictions in it. Now there's also been this large literature, which I guess I should have put on this a slide, but there's a large literature that's thought about informational frictions that are just completely nominal, okay? So what we do in our paper, Optimal Monetary Policy with Informational Frictions, is that we augment this model with nominal friction. So we allow firms to choose both something real, like, like labor, some real input, as well as nominal prices, 
under incomplete information, incomplete and dispersed information. And we ask, how do these informational constraints affect the nature of monet optimal monetary policy? And what we find is that despite informational frictions, flexible price allocations remain optimal. So it's actually optimal for, for the monetary for the monetary policy to simply implement what would happen under flexible price allocations. In our environment here, there's still the, all this stuff that I showed you before. You can still have these noise driven, um, because the, the economy I showed you before is the flexible price allocation. There's no nominal friction there. So you can still have these noise or beliefs driven business cycles, but that occurs in the flexible price allocation. You want to implement that and what we show here is in order to do that, you need to target a negative correlation between prices and output, okay? So we give this new, um, new reason for monetary policy to lean against the wind. Okay, uh, that's um, our optimal uh, monetary policy paper. We also think about central bank transparency. So one question you might have is, is central bank transparency and the release of macro statistics, macroeconomic statistics desirable? We answer this question in our paper, real rigidity, nominal rigidity, and the social value of information. And the answer here we show actually depends on the source of business cycle fluctuations and the conduct of monetary policy. So you may have thought you know, that, you know, according to Morris and Shin, you may have thought that actually more strategic complementarity means that the business cycle is inefficient and hence you need to, you know, either stabilize it or not give off so much information. Here we show that once you actually micro found the model, you know, you don't start with an abstract model, but instead you start with the micro foundations of the macro model. We show that actually it depends on the source of business cycle fluctuations. So if the business cycle is driven by efficient shocks, so think of productivity or just, um, you know, these common errors and beliefs, something that the planner can do, can't do anything about. And if monetary policy is optimal, meaning that it implements flexible price allocations, then we show that more information increases welfare. More information should be released to the public and it's better for welfare. On the other hand, if the business cycles are driven by inefficient shocks, so things like um, you know distortions, uh, like markup shocks, et cetera, or in the monetary literature they call them cost push shocks, and if monet or or if monetary policy is suboptimal, then more information can in fact be bad for welfare. You may get inefficient fluctuations that you don't want agents having more information about, and hence you'd like to have less central bank transparency and less release of macroeconomic statistics. Um, and in another extension, we do this with endogenous signals. We think about optimal policy when agents get uh, not exogenous private and public signals, but they may learn from endogenous macroeconomic statistics, like you know the CPI, or aggregate output or aggregate un unemployment. So we think about that in another paper. And we show that actually, in fact, you want monetary policy to lean even more against the wind and you want to have counter cyclical taxes. Okay, so just to conclude, um, let me go back to where I started. So this conference, and I think they're, they're, it's right to think about the economy as agents having uncertainty. Okay, I think this is like a, this is a huge um, agenda in macro and international. Um, and I think there's a lot of uncertainty out there about productivity, preferences, so many types of fundamentals, as well as policy, especially during the current situation with COVID. But the point of my presentation today was also to highlight this, this thing that's often overlooked, which is called strategic uncertainty. And it's this uncertainty about the actions of other agents or uncertainty about endogenous outcomes beyond any uncertainty about fundamentals. And what you absolutely need in order to have strategic uncertainty is dispersed information or some type of asymmetric information across economic agents. Um, what we've shown in my previous work with Marios is that this can play a very important role, at least in closed economy business cycle models. You can have sentiment driven fluctuations 
uh, this was, you know, one, this has been quantified in a number of papers. One of them is this paper by Angeletos, Collard, and Dallas. Um, but I think there's a lot more room to, to, to think about quantification of sentiment. Uh, in particular, there's a really nice paper by Andre Levchenko and um, Nietzsche Pandalai Nayar uh, that thinks about the international transmission of sentiments and how that can lead to international co-movement. Um, I myself am not working on anything quanta, you know, I'm not working on anything quantitative right now uh, relative to this. Instead, I'm thinking more, I'm going more the other route, which is actually to go back to the um, abstract game, okay, going back to the abstract game with strategic interaction and thinking more about a very generalized version of rational inattention there. So this is some current work with Ben A. Bear where we're thinking about endogenous information acquisition and beauty contest games. And in particular, we're giving, we're making a methodological contribution by um, considering in a very generalized rational inattention environment what are the particular character uh, properties of cost functions that give rise to, to common errors in beliefs as well as uh, constrained efficiency of equilibria. Okay, so that's my presentation. Um, hopefully it looks, I think I'm on time. You're perfectly on time, Jennifer. It's like 5.40 local time, so it's like second even wise you're on time. Right. Uh, lovely. That was really brilliant uh, presentation and brilliant keynote speech. Uh, so many exciting uh, bits from an important and growing literature uh, to which Jennifer herself is the uh, leading contributor. So I do encourage actually all registered viewers to raise questions. And uh, before I gather more, let me use this privilege of, uh, you know, uh, asking questions. And um, whilst listening, I had like a few ideas. So uh, one, you know, uh, maybe looking more from the European perspective. So um, this is a very interesting conceptual framework with the say islands and say uh, this idea of, you know, uh, strategic complementarity and sort of caring about say output outputs elsewhere. I'm just thinking from the real world perspective, uh, in a sense, when we get, you know, uh, become more interdependent and suppose where we place our production and how we think of the production network emerging endogenously, right? Um, so most probably say within a monetary union, as is for instance, Euro area, uh, the production network would be quite different within vis-a-vis -vis outside and we'll be thinking of like risks right and most probably i will place right the union uh that i rely more on because that is probably less risky to an extent than for instance i don't know relying on jurisdiction that i have no influence upon right but then listening to your idea, I, I was thinking, um, you know, uh, maybe my interpretation is wrong, and this is very interesting to hear from you, but it seems the more strategic complementarity there is, the more um, I depend on what's going on elsewhere, sort of less on fundamentals. And then it seems even like within such thing as a monetary union, we might actually end up in sort of more shaky environment where non-fundamental forces are driving the dynamics and if that is right then then it's very interesting from you know policy perspective you touched upon monetary policy but to think you know supranationally a little bit how can we uh i don't know address this um increased uncertainty well i don't know not increased uncertainty but like uh, this additional source of uh, of business cycle so that is one and then i naturally building from there you know you built in this information asymmetry and endowed the firm and then naturally you know i'm thinking uh from the policy perspective probably it may depend big deal on how we think where this information friction actually rests you know with with whom um, I guess then targeting will be different. So uh, you mentioned about monetary policy, but going you know above and beyond that, if for instance you know it's 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 more really stemming not from the firms, but also I don't know households. Uh, we add maybe more markets there and their decisions 
um, are somehow influenced by other households, and that seems also, uh, you know, important. Um, how would the main implications change if you have, you know, I don't know, given some thoughts? Let me stop here, and then I will, I will bring more. Okay, so um, for your first question, uh, I think it's really interesting. I so there's um, one thing I don't like about these models or the the models I've shown you today is that the strategic complement everything's very symmetric. Okay, across these agents, everyone has the same alpha, um, the same strategic complementarity. I think the really nice thing about the network literature, which I've started to work on, you know, myself is basically that you can have this more richness of um, interactions across agents. And you can use the data out there to kind of discipline this. And I think there's really room here, you know, a lot of, so again, let, let me just think, talk about what I know, which is more the closed economy as opposed to the open economy. But let's say an economy either with a monetary, you know, monetary unions or like the US, which is, more or less a closed economy. Even in these economies, you can have this very rich production structure, which will give you a lot of interdependency of uh, actions of these agents. And then I think there's, you know, a lot of this literature on production networks, some of what, which I've worked on, is all usually under complete information. But there's a lot of room here to start taking these ideas from this more abstract beauty contest or the symmetric um, type of uh, strategic complementarity in my papers with Marios and start embedding it in production networks. And I totally agree with you, which is just that, you know, given what we know from this literature, I think even in a, you know, within a monetary union, as soon as you consider as soon as you increase these interdependencies of these agents or, you know, interdependencies of these countries through the production network structure, I think you're going to get a lot more room to have these beliefs driven uh, business cycles. And there's, there's already a literature about this in game theory. So there, there are some papers by Morris on and others about um, network structures and, uh, and um, disperse or asymmetric information. And, and here, what it really maps to is just not that all the agents have the same alpha with the aggregate action. Now you're going to have a different alpha for every other agent in the economy. And then you're going to have this matrix of st strategic interaction across all the different nodes in the economy. And then you can use that to, again, get these kind of beliefs driven um, outcomes. And I think there's room for that in macro. And I know some people are working on it. And I, I also have a paper um, with Ali Riza Taba Salehi that we're working on right now with optimal monetary policy in production networks. And we're, we're modeling it by using this type of framework where you have a production network structure, but agents in those structure have different uh, d dispersed information. So, okay. So I guess that's all to say that I think there's I, I think there's going to be more work done in the future where you have more discipline on strategic complementarity coming from the production network structure, either within Europe or within the US, and then you're able to do something in terms of how that affects the strategic uncertainty and how that affects the, the um, what that means for the sentiment or beliefs driven fluctuations in these economies. Ex now, uh, Jennifer, if you don't okay, mind, so, I will, yeah. I'll, I'll feel like, you know, you're only answering my question. So if you don't mind, I will maybe raise a few from the audience. Okay. I mean, that's, okay. that's, that's, that's brilliant. And I, and I guess there is a lot to discuss, but uh, since you stopped with the strategic complementarity, the, re, there is a question on strategic substitutability. Is there, um, you know, uh, what do you think about that? How would the results change then? How can we rationalize? And then more uh, down to earth, uh, sort of policy relevant. Another question is in a world of secular stagnation in Eurozone, and low interest rates. How do you, um, uh, you know, enter or add to the discussion of ECB adopting a symmetric inflation target around two percent? Would would you would you have anything to add to that? So I guess like this um, um, adoption of 
metric inflation is 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 the key part in the question so if you have any any ideas well i okay so in in terms of the second problem or the second question if you have okay what i know from my optimal monetary policy paper is that if you have only nominal rigidities suppose you only have nominal rigidities then it makes sense to have some type of inflation or uh, you know price stability target, depending on how you model the the um, the nominal rigidity. And the reason for that is that in the typical New Keynesian model, what you get is that that's what actually implements flexible price allocations. So as long as you don't have any inefficient shocks going on, you actually want to have something that either targets some type of price level, or if you you have some or, you know, depending on how you model it, targets inflation. That's the typical thing. Now, if you add informational frictions to it, so suppose you don't just have that firms make nominal pricing decisions under um, incomplete information, but suppose they also, like in the model I showed you today, make some real, uh, some real input decision. Then actually what we show, or, in our in our paper, this what we show is that you don't actually want to target, um, say, the price level anymore. What you want to tar what you want to do now is you want to have a uh, negative correlation between prices and output or inflation and output. And why is that? Well, actually, what it does is it actually implements flexible price allocations again. It's just that the flexible price allocation now under incomplete information is one that has that has an aggregate price level that moves negatively with aggregate output and without getting into the technical details of why basically the idea here is that if agents have different information you want these agents to basically use their information and you want agents who have higher beliefs or higher productivity and higher beliefs to produce more than agents who have more pessimist pessimistic beliefs the only way to implement that is to have that the, um, okay, and on top of that, not only do you want the agents who have uh, higher information to produce more, but you actually want them to have a lower price. And the only way to induce them to have a lower price than the agents that are more pessimistic is to have a um, price level that co-moves negatively with aggregate output. So that's the point of our optimal monetary policy paper. Uh, you know, of course it's totally, um, theoretical. So I can't say, you know, that we don't include a lot of things out there in the real world, world so I'm not going to say that this should be the, this is definitely the right price target, but at least with the informational frictions, at least what I know is that if you have nominal frictions and frictions coming from information, you want to have a negative co-movement. And that looks a little bit more, um, uh, it doesn't look so much like price level targeting, it looks more like nominal GDP targeting. Okay, but that's, sorry, that's what I know from my own work. And then the, the other question about strategic substitutability. So you'll have, you won't have the same amplification of um, aggregate uh, beliefs, but you will still have the um, common errors and beliefs matter. Okay, so that's still going to enter the equilibrium, um, but you won't have that as much. And, and real world environments that have more strategic substitutability uh, which, you know, I guess you could say um, financial markets do because generally the prices, well, it depends. So let me, let me not try to answer that question. And let me just say one thing about the households. We've never done anything on the household side just because it's much harder. Mm -hmm. It's because then you have this, then you have this income distribution. So then you get into the heterogeneous agents literature, like Iagari and all that, because now you have, if you have dispersed information on the household side, what happens is then you have different savings decisions, different consumption decisions, and then now you have this whole distribution of savings and consumption, and it makes the, the model much more unwieldy. So that's why we haven't worked on that. 
I see, lovely. Um, I see actually questions coming in, and if you don't mind, I'll just like read a few. But we don't have much time. But I guess like that really shows the interest in 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 uh, the topic and your splendid presentation. So one is actually on the policy dimension, and that sounds to me very uh, intriguing. It says if uncertainty results from asymmetric information. Could there be a case for policy intervention for, fee for firms to reveal more information? Uh, so that would be interesting about the corporate strategies and like corporate governance and, and regulation uh, in that area. And the second one, if uncertainty increases during research recessions, how would you add that to your model? And wouldn't the public signal be less informative and lower strategic uncertainty? I mean, it, okay. <laughs> should, should I answer? Okay, so the first, um, the first question we sort of answer in this paper. So I would, I would tell the this audience. I would say that maybe if you look at our AER paper, basically we show that if there's informational frictions, both on both nominal and. Um, real. So here, you know, labor input or some type of input is taken under incomplete information and you can add a nominal rigidity here. It then depends on what is driving the business cycle. So if if it's all productivity driving the business cycle or preferences or what, you know, in the typical RBC model, whatever is efficient driving the business cycle, and if monetary policy is implementing this allocation, the efficient allocation, then more information is always good. So yes, it would make sense for there to be uh, more information released, either in terms of macroeconomic statistics or even just like collecting better information. So I agree with that. Now, the question is, what is the business cycle driven by? I can't really answer that because I don't know, but if it's driven by some inefficient shocks, which is generally what the new Keynesian literature assumes, like suppose it's driven by cost push shocks or, mar or markups, you know, a lot, people have been talking markup about markups a lot more lately, um, then actually more information is bad. So, so, yeah, this paper is completely theory. Again, it can't tell you what the answer is, but if you have some sense of what is driving the economy, if it's inefficient, you don't want more information. Um, and then, wait, what was the, what was the other question? No, I forgot. So about the uh, uncertainty changes during oh. recessions and... Um... Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, so then, okay, there's going to, if there's more uncertainty in recessions, it depends on how the public signal noise scales with that. But one thing I could say is that if you have more uncertainty, then you're going to actually put even more weight on the prior, and then you're going to have even more inertia so that's another point of our paper, which is that there's inertia to fundamentals. If you have more uncertainty, people put more weight on the prior and you'll for sure have more, um, like if productivity moves, you won't move as much with it. I see, uh, excellent. I. I'm sorry that I, I haven't actually sticked to the schedule, but because it's so really exciting and interesting, I couldn't resist. Uh, so let me thank again, Jennifer, for uh, your amazing keynote speech. Thanks for uh, being with us. I hope this opportunity will arise very soon uh, and we will be able to welcome here in Lithuania. Uh, for the time being, um, I think we need a sort of few moments to digest all of the information that has arrived. So uh, on behalf of everyone, thanks a lot. And for everyone else, let me just announce that we will be having another session on international firms and how they navigate you know, through these wavy uh, waters in like um, five minutes, and then we will be back. So thank you and see you in a bit. Great, thank you. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Welcome back. And next in line is the session number two on trading firms' behavior in uncertain environment. Uh, let me start by introducing the session's moderator. So the session will be moderated by Giuliani Di Giovanni, uh, who is with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. He's also associated with CIBRA and CPR. I'm actually very happy when I see people because that, that helps immensely. When I'm talking to camera, that's, that's so different. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy I see all of you and everyone ready. Let me just finish. Uh, Julian is an assistant vice president in the international research function of the research and statistics group at Fed New York. Um, Julian, uh, Julian's research focuses on international spillovers, macroeconomic fluctuations, and most recent stuff is also related to the applications of big data to study responses to shocks of firms, banks, and consumers. So I have no doubt uh, you are the best person to moderate this session on firms in an uncertain environment. And I guess Julian will also cover the house rules uh, or just remind everyone who may have just joined. So uh, let's start. Very good. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction, Pavelis. Um, so we have a, a very interesting session on trading firms behavior under uncertain environments. Um, the first paper um, is good. I mean, both papers, in fact, which is really nice, are a mix of both theory and applied micro data to test their hypotheses. So the first paper uh, presented by Alminis and Zato, uh, sorry, excuse me, Zaldokas, um, will examine how firms in a small open economy um, react to rather large shock in trade. Okay. Um, following up, um, Following up on this paper, we're going to have Julien Martin from the University of Quebec at Montréal, who will be studying firm-to-firm -firm relationship stickiness and how these, you know, how this stickiness um, impacts the reactions of firms' trade to aggregate uncertainty shocks. We're happy to have two excellent discussions, uh, discussions for this um, panel. First, we have Alessandro Ruggieri from the University of Nottingham, who will be discussing the first paper. And second, we have Ryan Monarch from the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, who's going to be discussing Julien's paper. In terms of rules of the games, we're going to have the, um, the presentation and then the discussion following immediately. Um, we'll then open the floor to questions from the floor, so to speak, where you can send your questions um, by logging on to Slido, that's sli.do, and the password to get into the conference is capital L, capital B, 2020. And I'll field as many questions as possible, and of course, we're running short on time, I'll be sure to pass the questions on to the, um, to the relevant presenters. So with that, um, let's start off with Alminsen's paper. Thank you. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone from Hong Kong. Let me try to share the slides. Right. Okay. So. Um, uh, well, thank you, organizers, for, for including this paper. And this so far has been great conference, and especially uh, Jennifer's talk just now. Um, and look forward to other papers and keynotes. Uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, I've been presenting this paper uh, where we look into how uh, how uh, you know we explore how uh, firms um, um, use different adjustment margins when they're facing a, a major uh, trade restriction, a trade uh, trade ban in particular. So this is joint work with Hollis Lastauskas and Aurelia Proshkuta from Bank of Lithuania. So if you think about the, today's state of the world, uh, probably one of the phenomena that might come to mind, you know, apart from from the pandemic, uh, is, uh, is 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 trade wars or one trade war in particular. But when we look into the uh, uh, academic evidence, and, and this is mainly because in the past decades we've been uh, experiencing uh, primarily globalization, um, we know not that much about, uh, about what uh, type of margins firms use to adjust when they're facing uh, really severe uh, trade restrictions or even you know, complete uh, trade bans. You know, are the uh, effects that we have been uh, seeing identified uh, using uh, uh, the uh, observations from trade liberalizations are they symmetric if we're, when we're facing the trade restrictions? Um, you know, even if they are, uh, when we, you know, we mainly have seen probably, you know, if you will, adjustments on the intensive margin, you know, trade changes or uh, sort of tariff changes or even non-tariff adjustments. 
uh, that uh, probably uh, have uh, um, uh, have inflicted uh, further uh, adjustments on the firm side. But what happens if if uh, uh, if trade stops uh, if tr trade stops completely? And uh, this is uh, this is one of the uh, questions that we ask. And uh, and once we started asking this uh, this question, uh, we realized that there are so many questions within it. And this is of course just uh, uh, the list uh, that with, 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 with which we started. Uh, but uh, but certainly there's there's more interesting questions to be asked even from the firm perspective. So, looking from the firm perspective, uh, firms are, let's say, facing these uh, abrupt, sudden changes in terms of the demand. Uh, you know, there's complete, uh, uh, complete restriction on trade. Um, they're likely to be adjusting on multiple dimensions. Well, first question is whether they'll be adjusting on the multiple dimensions. And, uh, and if they do, uh, then uh, obviously, uh, obviously the, the, the next question is how those uh, adjustments interact, uh, how they reinforce each other. Uh, is there heterogeneity in how the firms react? If there is heterogeneity, is this just determined by you know their differences in adjustment costs or uh, or difference in expectations? Is there anything else that can describe uh, what can uh, how how the firms react? Maybe some sectors benefit. Maybe some firms benefit. Uh, maybe they start adjusting not through the cost adjustments only. They may be uh, going into some also uh, some revenue increasing strategies. So, uh, so what uh, we'll try to do with uh, with this paper will uh, uh, this will be <laughs> primarily Julian kindly said uh, introduce this as uh, a mix of theory and empirics. Uh, this will be primarily an empirical paper. We'll be looking at the firm level uh, data, and uh, and once we, we once we start to doing that, uh, we uh, we realize that we you know we probably. <laughs> You know, we just want to try to look into uh, uh, empirically studied trade bands. Uh, we will be facing uh, 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 really big challenges. Why? Well, first, trade shocks often happen uh, not really in a vacuum. Uh, they happen together with some economic, other economic adjustments. They're correlated with uh, uh, expectations. They're correlated with uh, uh, other uh, supply chain uh, supply uh, shocks. If, I mean, we want to pin down demand changes. So. If you know, we really be, have to be careful of the supply shocks. Uh, well, in particular, if we're looking into like today's trade war, uh, the uh, uh, disagreement, the disagreements between China and US, you know, wage expectations or even technology shocks, technology changes are the key uh, matters of the debate. And we can't really say that those, uh, 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 that we can separate uh, the demand shocks that are looming from the uh, supply changes and from the technological changes that will Kind of uh, cascade into the production functions, if you will. All right. So what we'll do in this paper, we'll take a, a major sector of a, a small open economy. Well, in particular Lithuania, and, and you know the place that we should have all been at this point and uh, enjoyed uh, the conference in person. Uh, so this, uh, uh, so Lithuania lost, you know, its major uh, market export market to uh, uh, to the reasons that uh, that were not uh, really related to. Uh, to, to trade, sorry, to uh, for the reasons and related to uh, you know, uh, uh, economic reasons, right? So, so trade stop not because of the uh, some underlying economic changes and economic expectations, but because of the political tensions with Russia. Uh, so we'll be looking into the Lithuania's uh, food exporters uh, using uh, a rich uh, uh, firm level uh, data set, and I'll describe that in a, in a few uh, seconds. Uh, and we'll be applying sort of reduced form difference in different strategy and try to convince you that what we're getting is uh, our pretty causal estimates um, uh, on a few of the adjustment margins. So one of them will be uh, adjustment in terms of the uh, labor, both part-time and, and, and full-time, then adjustment on investment, new export markets uh, in terms of the revenue increasing strategies, and then we'll also separate in terms of the sectors, looking to wholesale and uh, food manufacturers separately. So producers, the end producers, and uh, sort of intermediaries. And then we'll try to uh, briefly uh, describe a conceptual framework that uh, we think can explain uh, the findings that we get. Now we make, uh, we think we make some contributions to the literature. I will not go into detail here, uh, but, uh, uh, but we'll try to say that we're looking into multiple adjustment margins. We'll try to study um, a shock that is sort of not confounded with a direct economic 
adjustments. Uh, we try to argue for some of the mechanisms behind them and uh, look into several uh, sectors. All right, so what is what was this trade ban? Uh, so uh, if you might remember 2013, 14, there were, uh, uh, there were quite uh, high uh, political tensions between Russia and EU with regards to uh, the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, what happened then? You introduced some sanctions, primarily financial, on uh, certain individuals in Russia. Uh, Russia responded. Russia responded by restricting uh, uh, agricultural food product and certain raw material imports from the EU, US, you know, EA countries, and uh, a few other countries. So meats, dairy products, uh, fruits, vegetables. Initially, it was announced for one year, but uh, then it got extended. So, uh, you know, Lithuania. Lithuania is a small open economy, as you might uh, know. Uh, exports are really a really uh, high part of its GDP, and Russia is one of the main trade partners. 20% of Lithuanian exports go to uh, Russia in 2013. 18% uh, of those were uh, banned product exports. So we know actual, the actual uh, code of the product, so we can identify that. You know, you multiply these three numbers, you get sort of expected uh, effect on the GDP. Uh, you know, was that really what, uh, what, what happened? So let's first look into uh, direct uh, effects. Well, first, if you look the, into the news of, in, the, in the Russia's media those days, uh, you know, they, they were saying that this will really be a huge uh, shock to the, uh, uh, to the European countries, and this is Lithuanian cheese, in fact. Uh, and, but was it? Uh, so let's look into the, uh, to, 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 to the firms and the firm reactions. So I'll first first show the uh, direct uh, sort of direct effects on sales on exports, uh, and then and then I'll uh, transition into a more a reduced form uh, causal uh, estimates. So I'll also separately show food and wholesale. So for the red the red line would show the firms here that are at high share of exports to Russia of the banned products. We know exactly what those firms were exporting uh, before the trade ban. So those were sort of highly affected firms. And we have two benchmark firms, or if you will, control firms that will be uh, either exporters to Russia, but that had low share of the banned products or you know, food producers that did not have any um, uh, sales to Russia. The effect is, you know, obviously seen in the graph. All the exports of banned products pretty much went to zero. Uh, if you maybe they started exporting some, something else to Russia, not really. If we take total exports, we don't see uh, any uh, sort of uh, uh, offsetting behavior. But maybe that was a small part of the revenues. Well, not really. We see that uh, if we take the total revenues of those firms uh, and compare to the benchmark firms, the trends are pretty parallel before the uh, shock before 2014, and then we see a, a huge drop. So maybe if you take uh, 2013, 95 on average million euros, it went to 75. So it's, it's a pretty sizable change in your uh, revenues. Uh, it started rebounding a little bit, and we'll talk about those things uh, hopefully uh, towards at the end of the presentation, what the reasons why it could have rebounded. Meanwhile, there was a slight increase in the benchmark group so the economy, the rest of the economy seem to have been doing quite well. Uh, how about wholesale? I'll just to show two graphs just uh, to, to show uh, the total exports. Uh, you know, it seems that uh, they have uh, not decreased to zero and they started rebounding a little bit. Uh, so these are wholesale exporters that had high share of the uh, 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 sales to Russia of the banned products before uh, the shock compared to the benchmark groups, again, defined in the similar way. Uh, he, if we look into total revenues, however, uh, you will see that you know, there was decrease, but uh, it was uh, a little bit milder than uh, we would uh, uh, see for the food exporter. So it's again some some uh, food for thought when we'll try to uh, interpret the results. Okay, so the firms got affected. So uh, so let's try to see what they did when they uh, tried to adjust on different margins. So uh, let me introduce the specifications that we'll use in the paper, uh, all data first. Uh, so this will be a compre com pretty comprehensive sample. Uh, we have all uh, food manufacturers and wholesalers in the economy. Uh, we have a disaggregated balance sheet data. We have trade data at the product level, destination source uh, uh, levels. Uh, in, importantly for us, uh, we, uh, we know also the list of the sanctioned products so we can match to, 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 to the firm data here. You know, um, enough time to have some power for destinations. 
Now, now I will define treated and controlled firms, which is slightly different than what I did in the graphs, but uh, nevertheless inspired by the same idea. So treated firms uh, will be the firms that had banned product exports to Russia in 2013. At this point, irrespective of their share, if they had any banned exports, we, it will be treated. For each of these firms, we pick a control firm that will be in the same sector, so either food manufacturer or wholesale. Um, exporter, we know from you know long literature, exporters are slightly different from non-exporters, more productive, uh, other characteristics. And of all the firms satisfying the above, then we pick of all the candidate firms, we pick the closest in terms of the size, i.e. sales. All right, do we stop here? No. Then we try to gain uh, further identification power from you know how those treated firms were exposed to the shock. So here we use that, what I previously described, as the percentage of the firm's exports of the banned products as a proportion uh, to, the, uh, to the firm's sales in 2013. This is something that will also rely a little bit when we try to build the conceptual framework, sort of exposure to the shock. Um, so let me sort of summarize what I just said and say that essentially this will be a triple difference estimate. Uh, did the food producers and wholesalers that had a larger uh, share of uh, banned exports experience changes in the post period as compared to the pre period, as compared to changes in control firms, as compared to changes and changes in corresponding firms with a smaller banned export share? Okay. Uh, if you know, uh, if you prefer uh, equations, this is how it will look. Uh, it will be uh, uh, on the on the uh, sort of outcome dependent variable will be the ad certain adjustment margin. I'll define them in a second. Uh, that's already difference, differencing out the treated and control group um, uh, variables outcomes. Uh, and then I will try to explain it with a uh, band export share sort of the exposure variable times the time when the uh, uh, trade ban came into effect uh, post-2014. This will be a dummy after 2014, including 2014, including firms fixed FX who take care of the uh, non-time bearing uh, uh, difference between firms and uh, time fixed FX as well. All right. We'll also try a dynamic setting, which will, in addition to what I just shown, we'll add another, uh, another, uh, 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 another uh, treatment variable, which will be defined on uh, basically exposure will be defined in the same way, but there will also the additional effect that might have been showing up in 2016 that has not, not been shown up to 2014 yet. All right, so, uh, so the adjustment margins, uh, we'll look into the number of employees, uh, both part-time and full-time. We'll also look into number of hours in the in the in the paper, but uh, this is not. Uh, uh, I will not have time to go through that. Uh, we'll have investment, uh, which will be defined as sort of adjustment in in, term, in capital, so change in fixed assets adjusted for depreciation, and uh, adjustment in terms of the new revenue strategy, new revenue increasing strategies will be uh, 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 you know new new export destinations that the firms get. So maybe they're diversifying and getting new uh, export destinations. And in fact, you know when I was preparing for this talk, I was going through some media articles, as you've noticed uh, around that time, uh, and you know our current president of Lithuania, he was bank analyst at that time, said that it will be you know the uh, dawn of an era of diversification when the firms uh, started diversifying uh, outside of the Russia into new destinations. So we'll see whether they're really doing that. We'll define it in a way uh, if there's no exports to that uh, to a particular destination in a prior year, whether they start exporting uh, substantially to that destination in, in the following year. I'll, I'll have really restricted specification here. Actually, the results are you know much more significant if we just put five percent. Here are the results. Uh, so uh, we look into first part-time employees, uh, look into the food and the wholesale sector separately. Uh, so the first specification sort of does not include dynamic effects, just uh, the change in 2014 to 17, and the second will include 14, 15, and 16, 17 separately. Uh, uh, just to clarify, 16, 17 is an additional effect. So uh, it's a marginal effect over the, the first coefficient. Uh, so we see that the average exposed firm that had, uh, in food production that had 6.7% ban export share reduced part-time employees by 9.76 employees, uh, which is a, a two-thirds drop over the pre-sample uh, 14 employees. Uh, what happened to wholesale? Wow, 
wholesale actually increase the number of employees. Okay, what is happening? So we'll try to try to explain uh, this part. All right, number of employees, part-time employees for the wholesale sector is actually starting to increase. Uh, so average exports firm had you know twelve percent of band export share, and uh, the, uh, there's a type of part-time employees increased by zero point four, which was a fourteen point two percent rise over the sample. What happens to full-time employees then, since already the typo reveals what we're doing next? Uh, well, for full-time employees, uh, food, uh, we see a drop, but interestingly, the drop is not immediate, but it starts showing up only in 16, 17. So it's a delayed reaction. Um, and, the, uh, and the average exposed firm uh, would uh, uh, reduce number of employees by 6.8%, 7%. However, if you take the coefficient in the second specification, uh, it, uh, you know, an interproductive coefficient, it's a 14% drop compared to the pre-average, uh, uh, pre-period uh, uh, pre average. Uh, wholesale, we see no, no change in number of full-time employees. Already showing that there's some sort of uh, variation in terms of the uh, uh, reactions across different sectors. Investment, uh, we see a drop in investment for the uh, food sector, uh, and we see an increase in investor for the wholesale sector. So, which pretty much mirrors what we had with the part-time employees. Uh, and we think this is sort of an interesting linkage to start building up. The final adjustment we will be looking at is the new export markets. Uh, we don't observe that much that manufacturers find new destinations. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, our current president's uh, hypothesis was not confirmed with the data. Uh, and uh, uh, however, if you look into wholesalers, uh, we see some effect. And as I mentioned, you know, if we relax the restriction on the uh, on the on the uh, uh, on on how how large the new export market should be, uh, the, the significance actually is slightly larger. Okay, so uh, uh, before we build the conceptual framework, we, we now see that there's some adjustments that are kind of similar. So we saw the part-time labor investment move together, but do the other two adjustments move together as well? Uh, part-time labor, new export destinations, and part-time labor, full-time labor. And we'll just do correlations, do the same firms. So on average, maybe we didn't see that uh, full-time, uh, sort of food manufacturers change new export des destinations, but maybe the ones that change part-time labor also change new export destinations. So we just do correlations uh, and we just plot, you know, on one axis, change in destinations and other axis, we plot the, uh, 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 the uh, part-time employees change in part-time employees. And we see for the full-time labor, this is a negative correlation. Uh, for the food manufacturers, it's a negative correlation, which pretty much suggests that uh, the firms that reduce part-time employees also engage in new revenue increasing strategies. Maybe they were forced to engage in new revenue increasing strategies. Um, on the other hand, we see a positive correlation for wholesalers, suggesting that uh, you know the firms that increase part-time employees also increase the number of new destinations. How about the, the correlations between full-time labor and part-time labor? Uh, it's a positive for food, food producers, so the ones that laid off part-time labor laid off full-time labor, and there's no significant correlation for wholesalers, so they, since they hired part-time labor, maybe full-time labor didn't react, so there's no actual correlation. I, I'll mean, right. just let you know you have 10 minutes. Oh, that is perfect, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so these are our sort of empirical takeaways, and uh, I'll spend the last uh, uh, nine minutes, uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to see what we where we can go with this uh, in terms of uh, building sort of conceptual framework. Um, so let me just summarize, just in, in case I ran through it too quickly. Uh, so food manufacturers reduce part-time employees, wholesalers increase them. Uh, we see same trend for investment. Um, food manufacturers reduce full-time employees with some delay. Uh, wholesalers uh, enter new export markets. Food manufacturers we don't see that. Uh, we also show some correlations, cross-sectional correlations, uh, that uh, suggest that you know, firing part-time employees for food manufacturers and hiring them for wholesale correlated with new destinations. Uh, however, uh, when we look into the, um, uh, sorry, moreover, when we look into the uh, firms reducing part-time employees, uh, they also, uh, in food manufacturing, they are also uh, laid off full-time employees. Uh, we see no such pattern for the wholesalers. All right, so uh, what we can do with this, uh, we'll try to uh, incorporate uh, these uh, observations into uh, you know, seminal work, the production function that was, uh, uh, we built on in seminal work of Kressel and, and co-authors, uh, will allow uh, two types of uh, labor, part-time and full-time. So, so uh, we'll be 
uh, composite input uh, with different types of substitutability with respect to capital and uh, different types of adjust adjustment costs. Will allow flexibility of technologies across uh, sectors and uh, and this is sort of will be sort of a little bit more uh, the work that we're working on now. So maybe it's like an extension part that I'll just uh, uh, hopefully still have a chance to introduce at the end. Uh, adjustment over out. But for most of the part that I'll be talking in the next uh, now seven minutes, um, this will be just uh, the adjustment over uh, cost inputs. Uh, that is two types of labor and capital. Let's see what happens. Uh, all right, so uh, we have a uh, we have a we have a production function, uh, a pretty standard. Again, except that uh, in addition to capital and uh, full time labor, full time employees, we also have LP, which is the part time labor. Now LP uh, has a unitary substitutability with a, uh, a full time labor and capital. Uh, however, the capital and full time labor has uh, the uh, you know, this is parameter of elastic substitution will be gamma. Okay, so already there's differences between those two types of labor. Um, uh, in, in the what, you know, we'll, we'll just use generic sector, so we'll drop as a substrate uh, later on in, in, in what I'll show. Uh, uh, I don't think there's any surprises. You know, in, if you will, this kind of, kind of resembles golden and cats uh, two block uh, production function. Uh, all right, uh, other assumptions or sort of delimitations or you know, uh, what, what we don't do here. Uh, we'll assume, uh, uh, we'll show you know, partial equilibrium. In a sense, what I showed sort of inspired that the other firms continue growing. So uh, it suggested that, you know, there was a targeted nature of the sanctions. So the economy wide adjustments were indeed limited. Uh, we will take wages uh, ex exogenous, uh, again, partly inspired by the data, what we've seen, um, and then prices, product prices as well. Um, Based on the data, actually our actual data set that we have, uh, we take firm as a decision maker. Uh, we don't discuss what other actors do in the economy. We'll abstract from industrial organization and input output effects. Uh, so, uh, you know, competitive nature of the sectors and uh, we don't, we would like to model. So it's also something we're working on. Uh, the linkages between wholesale and food sectors, but uh, at this point uh, we don't. All right, and the firms can't really switch part-time and full-time labor within the firm. So the, the markets are kind of uh, separate. Uh, so uh, again, assuming competitive markets, uh, we're not looking to the uh, prices, revenues at this point. Uh, we'll just uh, focus on the cost minimization problem. Uh, so we'll mi uh, minimize uh, costs, uh, the lay, you know, wages of uh, full-time employees, wages of part-time employees, uh, investment and uh, uh, adjustment costs for capital, adjustment uh, costs for labor, uh, where, uh, so my view is blocking part of the slide. So let me just see. Uh, so this is LF and I think it's HF as well. So HF is our change in uh, uh, employment. Uh, and, uh, and, then we, and then we have the, uh, uh, the subject to demand constraint, which I just de de defined. Uh, demand is coming uh, exogenously, externally. Uh, investment dynamics, labor dynamics, um, and then importantly, and this is sort of what will be driving most of our results, is the adjustment cost uh, uh, functions, uh, which will be uh, pretty convex for, uh, for investment, for capital, and uh, will be uh, uh, will be non-convex for for labor. So uh, hiring costs, if uh, if uh, if uh, if the labor is increasing, and the firing costs if the labor is increasing. Uh, so I'll I'll just be uh, really uh, brief on this. Uh, not uh, uh, hopefully still some of the intuition will come across. Um, you know we'll we'll try to first get the marginal cost, and those uh, will be pretty much derived from uh, taking first order condition with respect to the. Uh, Part-time labor, which, as you have seen, really doesn't have any adjustment cost. This is the most flexible um, adjustment margin, right? So, uh, so we can just take in from that uh, we get the marginal uh, marginal costs. Uh, that will be just the wage of uh, part-time labor over the uh, marginal product of uh, part-time labor, which in our production function uh, is defined this way. So let's talk about the first effect on the part-time labor. Uh, you know. Uh, Output decreasing, marginal cost decreasing, so uh, marginal uh, product of, uh, uh, of 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 labor kind of is increasing, and in, in our particular production function, this kind of cascades into LP uh, going down. So 
which is kind of intuitive and what would you expect uh, to, to happen is that after this exogenous shock to demand, part-time employment as the most flexible margin is, is adjusted first. And if we have enough of those labor, uh, we see that uh, uh, we, we see that, uh, you know, we probably would not see any other additional effects. However, you saw that 67% drop in uh, part-time labor. So most of the firms, or at least some of the firms, might be hitting the hard constraint or getting close to it. Uh, so let's look into other adjustments. Uh, so investment, uh, you know, it's typical Tobin's Q uh, specification. If Q is more than one, we invest. Uh, and Q is kind of shadow value here. So uh, uh, this will, uh, with this, this, you know, since Q, since uh, investment is forward looking and takes into account the future adjustments in capital, uh, the, 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 we, we see the shadow value that can be defined here. And then here also we see a convexity. So investment is expected to move kind of immediately together with the part-time labor. Uh, and, uh, and let me just, uh, I don't know if uh, anything, I, it's important given limits of time here. Uh, and let me just skip through that. Uh, basically also, you know, what your definition or sort of our expectation whether net investment uh, will be increasing or decreasing will uh, kind of depend on also the part-time labor being present, uh, but also this, uh, you know, substitution between the uh, capital and labor, with, which we, with, we think uh, is, is going to be important here. So so for now, I'm kind of be assuming that capital and labor are substitutes. And uh, and uh, sort of our second conclusion is that if pi firing part-time employees is insufficient, then capital starts to be adjusted. And under input substitutability, you know, if if full-time labor is dropping, investment has to drop less because of substitution between the two factors. Full-time labor, uh, again, let me just not, go, not go through the, the formulas, but the intuition is the same, except that the non-convex adjustment cost uh, simply would suggest that uh, there's some inaction regions, and so uh, full-time labor might be adjusting with a delay, okay? But again, because of the substitutability between inputs, uh, a larger drop in capital sort of restores marginal value of labor. So uh, you don't need to adjust as much. Uh, so I think uh, I'll just probably uh, finish with this and maybe just one, one slide more. So I'll take just one minute extra. Um, so, uh, so, uh, uh, so first, it's kind of like a, using corporate finance terminology, speaking order of adjustments. Uh, firms first adjust on the margin that has the least adjustment cost, and then moving into more adjustment costs, and then first convex and then non-convex. And statically, cost reduction depends on the production technology input mix, but then dynamically we see that also the adjustment costs, existing frictions come into effect, magnitude of shock, future prospects, and so on. Uh, we, we check whether this is really substitutes. They are substitutes across both sec in both sectors. Um, and uh, let me just conclude. I'll, uh, I will not talk much about this, but you know, if we're starting about revenue increasing strategies, maybe manufacturers can export directly or via wholesalers. And that is part of the reason why wholesalers increasing the destination is that they can share the cost of entering new markets uh, across many manufacturers who would bear the cost of direct entry just by themselves. Okay, and maybe maybe this is something to to that we plan to work on in the future in incorporating that uh, into our uh, framework uh, with inputs only. All right, let me stop here. Uh, I think I already summarized the findings uh, 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 quite a bit a few times, and uh, uh, I look forward to Alessandro's comments um, in, a, in this discussion. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thanks so much for finishing on time. So, Alessandro, the slides are yours. Please. Thank you. Let me share. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Very good. Uh, good evening, everybody. So first of all, let me thank the organizer for inviting me to discuss this interesting paper that talks about how firms adjust when trade stops. So the research questions in this paper is exactly how do firms cope with trade shocks, and in particular, how firms adjust labor, capital, or revenue, str revenue maximizing strategy to drop in foreign demand. And it is motivated by a very interesting political event, which is the Russia's ban of a number of agriculture, food products, and raw material imports, 
from the EU and in the US in August 2014. This was the results of some political tensions between Russia and the EU about the Ukraine conflict, and it came as a sort of retaliation after financial sanction imposed against, uh, against Russia six months before in, in February 2014. Now, this event affected the Lithuanian and particularly Lithuanian firms significantly. Why? Because Lithuanian exports made 80, make 80% uh, of the GDP of the country and 20% of these exports are directed to Russia. And in particular, 18% of the exports directed to Russia contain banned products. As Almina showed very well, uh, the dynamics of exports to Russia was significantly uh, impacted, in particular for firms who were highly exposed to export to Russia before the ban. And in fact, we can see that in the red line, both for manufacturing and wholesale firms, that there was a significant drop in their export compared to control firms, which are defined as those firms who were not exposed to to Russia before the, introdu the introduction of the ban. So, uh, the paper gives a twofold contribution. There is a, a theoretical contribution that highlights and develops a partial equilibrium model of production and factor adjustments that can guide the empirical analysis. Um, and, and it's a model that is based on a three that, that, that it contains that is based on three inputs: capital or full-time and part-time employment, different degree of substitutability of inputs. There is substitutability between full-time labor and capital, which is estimated, so it's left flexible, and unitary substitutability between part-time labor and the other factors, and different adjustments of input flexible on part-time worker, convex adjustments for capital, non-convex adjustments for full-time workers. And this model gives prediction that can be tested using data uh, and exploiting the shocks that, are that, that, that uh, has been highlighted before. The major predictions are the following. Part-time labor is adjusted first after demand shock. If the shock is large and persistent, capital starts to be adjusted as well. And if this investment, so reduction in investment, is followed by a drop in full-time labor, then the adjustment in full-time labor depends significantly on the substitutability between capital and full-time labor. The second contribution of the paper is an empirical contribution. This is a twofold again contribution. There is a, a production function estimation, which is uh, conducted in two steps. First they exploit the interior solution for the part-time labor to uncover the share in production of part-time labor. And then given that, uh, given the value backed out from, from the first part, they linearize the production function to estimate the share of capital in production and the elasticity of substitution between full-time and capital. Um, uh, and full-time and capital. And the, sec the second part in the, in the empirical analysis is a reduced form difference in difference, but it actually is a triple difference. It's difference in difference in difference. Estimation where, um, where the, the authors compare differences in, um, in, uh, in the adjustment margins between treated and controlled firms before and after the introduction of, of the ban and linking this adjustment by the export, by the export share of the banned product. So the fraction of the exposed firms sales that were banned in, uh, in 2014. Now, I, I have a number of comments, both on the theoretical and empirical contribution. I will start with the theoretical comments. Uh, well, let me first highlight the finding before going to the comments. Well, they exploit a very nice data set, the whole population of Lithuanian firms, in two main sectors, food manufacturing and, uh, and wholesale industries, the periods 2011, 2017. They have a number of information on the balance sheet, income statement, employment characteristics, and trade values very disaggregated. They find immediate large drop in part-time employees and investment for food manufacturing, the opposite in, uh, in, um, in, the, in the wholesale firms. They, they find long-run drop in full-time employees only for food manufacturing firms, and they also find some immediate increase in the number of new export destinations. This, is, this applies particularly for the wholesale industries rather than the manufacturing. So let me go to the comments. So the first comment I have is about the assumption on the adjustments to cost for capital. Now, the assumption is that 
Come, uh, capital has a convex adjustment cost. The functional form is quite standard. The implication of this is that investment adjustment for drop in demand is moot. So it's not lumpy. The individual firm, firm level dynamics of investment doesn't show in the model any lumpy dynamics. Now, there is recent evidence provided by this paper from Lantieri, Medina, and Tan of the opposite. In particular, they study investment response of Peruvian manufacturing firms to a drop in domestic demand in their case due to import competition from China. What they show is that this drives increase in the inaction region, especially in the short run. And this increase in the inaction region is mainly due to a decrease in the positive investment region meaning firms that were actually investing before the shock are now moving to the, to, the, to, the, to the inaction region, so not investing anymore. And this is particularly driven by firms with low depreciation rates in their fixed assets. Now, given the empirical estimates that you provide, meaning a reduction in investment rate, uh, in the investment, sorry, uh, after the ban, it's not clear whether we could uh, uh, whether we could discriminate between a convex adjustment cost or a non-convex adjustment cost. So it would be interesting to see whether the dynamics that you observe and document is actually driven by an increase in the action region or actual disinvestments of firms actually selling their capital. This is, seems to be, at least in the data, very, very bad due to um, uh, due to uh, I mean due to the fact that uh, capital might not be easy to sell. In the, in the secondary market, but I mean, it's interesting to see what's going on in, in the data. The second comment is about distinctions between full and part-time employment. Now, it seems that full and part-time employment might be composed by different types of workers. Now, I couldn't find data for Lithuania, I used data for the US, and I tried to see how part-time workers differ by gender and education. So the, the, the main point is actually about education. There seems to be quite an heterogeneity in how different education, educated groups uh, participate in the labor market with a part-time type of jobs. In particular, this is true for women, where the share of part-time workers within non-college educated is much larger than the share of part-time worker for college educated. On top of it, we know that the college share is actually a minor share compared to the non-college share, so there seems to be a quite an heterogeneity. It's not clear in the paper, at least for me, whether full-time and part-time employment is intended to capture differences in skill. In fact, at some point in the paper, you, the author who uses use, uh, uh, the word um, skilled and unskilled it seems almost interchangeably. So then since it's not clear, I, 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 ask, I ask myself, what would be the implication of, of, of the two cases? So let's assume that the authors wants to capture high skill and low skill labor. So if this is the case, is there a better information in the data set to capture different skill? Could you use, I don't know, college versus non-college workers or production versus non-production workers? Maybe you can't, maybe the data set doesn't allow you that. But on top of it, is there any evidence in, about differences in the adjustment costs between low skill and high skill? The theoretical framework is in fact uh, based on differences in the nature of adjustment due to the cost. Part-time workers have a full, are fully flexible, um, full-time workers have a, I mean, have a non-convex adjustment cost. Uh, if we want to interpret full-time and part-time as low skill and high skill, maybe we should provide, maybe the author should provide the evidence that there is lower recruitment cost or screening cost for workers that are allocated to low skill tasks. I don't know, maybe there is. Now suppose in the option, in the second option that full-time and part-time labor is actually intended to capture differences in hours and range. Now, if this is the case, we- Alessandro, just let you know, two minutes. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. So if this is the case, we should look at the production function. The production function assumes that there is a unitary substitutability between part-time labor and everything else. And we, the authors use the production function, this particular production function to back out, in particular to estimate the substitutability, the degree of substitutability between 
full time and capital. Since in the estimation, no, there, in the estimation, the adjustment costs do not enter. That's a static, it's a static um, equation. My question is, does that elasticity pick any differences in labor adjustment between full-time and part-time workers relative to capital investment? Is it really identified? And eventually, would it be possible to consider an alternative production function where full-time and part-time workers are actually substitute, they enter the same bundle of labor, but firms' adjustment are only driven by differences in adjustment? Maybe to estimate this particular function, a dynamic structure estimation might be needed, but maybe it's worth thinking about it. And eventually, again, if full-time and part-time workers are intended to capture only differences in contractual arrangement, still we, we need to think about, or start, we, need to, we need to think about selection of high skill and low skill into the different arrangement. Now, finally, I have two slides, and I'm about to conclude, I have some comments about the empirical part, the useful evidence. Now, it wasn't clear to me how control firms are assigned to traded firms. So what you mentioned is that you compare firm, I mean, you assign firms that are similar in size. It would be interesting to see more in detail how this assignment is made. Um, another question is about the evidence on the number of new export destination. Now, it seems that they are positive for both manufacturing and sales, so they are both expanding, but the standard deviation for the manufacturing sector is very high. And this is my due to the fact that the number of observation is low, 155. Now, if this is the case, so both type of firms are expanding in terms of number of destination, this might be a little bit striking with the, with the, with the interpretation of the adjustment of labor and, and capital. And, uh, and then maybe, you want to try also this possible alternative reduced form equation where instead of having a dummy for the post ban, you have a dummy for every year after to capture the entire dynamics. So to see small, uh, uh, short run versus long run adjustment. And uh, to conclude, just other possible follow ups. What about adjustment along types of contract, permanent versus temporary, maybe wage adjustment? And what about selection? I mean, do firms who face a drop in demand get out of the market, even in the domestic market? And how, how productivity and capital affect firm survival in, in, uh, in the domestic market? So thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure to read the paper. It's very interesting. And uh, thanks again for allowing me to, to dis discuss it. Great, Alessandro. Thanks for um, an excellent discussion. Um, so there's a couple of questions from the floor. First, I just want to ask a more general question that I was thinking about in reading this paper and in the context of this um, conference in particular, was how is the shock viewed by the firms to begin with? So if I look at your dynamics, it's par possible that it was viewed as kind of a temporary shock. And then over time, as reality hit in, kind of, you know, kicked in, it was viewed as more permanent. And this actually lines up nicely with the paper we'll see next and thinking about the export decisions, you know, relationships are very hard to form. There's large fixed costs to do these. So, I mean, at least from, from my reading, it would be kind of, you know, like very interesting to kind of have some, you know, some heuristic information of any surveys are taking place. Okay, so just something for you to think okay. about. Um, yeah. And just, so since we're kind of short on time, I'll just put out a couple of other questions that I also, I think are incredibly relevant and then you can mull them over and we can discuss later privately. Uh, perhaps so first um, is the notion of um, substitution from exports um, to domestic consumption so this notion of venting in i suppose rather than venting out so are there any possibilities for this um, given the lithuanian experience um, and secondly a kind of a more you know kind of general question whether these results would extend to other countries market structures um, other types of adjustment possibilities um, that you know, in other countries might be dis different from what you see, which might be a bit more Lithuanian specific. Okay. Um, so just um, food for thought, but I think at this point, it's probably to stick on time. We best, sure. you know, if you have well, a, like, I just, I just uh, one minute, thank uh, one minute recap, the comments in here. Go. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So 
Uxla. All right, Julien, um, take it away. Thank you. Right, so uh, we can't hear. Yeah, Can sorry, hear Julien, it? we're having audio issues. I at least still can't hear anything. Right. You don't use the headphones or something? Is there like anything like that? That you know, easiest way? <laughs> no. Uh, meanwhile, maybe Almanus can respond to some of the questions uh, whilst we're waiting. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, there were some questions on 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 the domestic on venting in domestic consumption. Uh, we have we don't see that in the in the total do revenues. You, do oh. you hear me now? Yes, Stop. we yeah. can. We sure can. can. It's working. Okay, very good. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, okay, so again, so um, uh, thanks uh, uh, to the organizer for giving us the opportunity to present this work. Um, this is a, a joint work with um, with uh, Mathieu Parenti and and uh, Isabelle Mejan, uh, and uh, and so the the paper is about uh, uh, relationship seekiness and uncertainty. Um, and so, so basically, the, the the question we ask in in the paper is to what extent uh, the, the adjustment of trade to uncertainty shocks uh, varies with the nature of trade relationships. Uh, and so, uh, I, I, I will be fast about uncertainty. I think we are whole at this conference to, uh, to talk about uncertainty. So we believe it's important. Uh, and of course, the current crisis illustrates. Uh, our uncertainty about, you know, future prospects affect the decisions of households and firms. Uh, importantly, uh, this uncertainty uh, also matters in an international trade context, and you have, uh, uh, you know, early contribution by Andy, uh, Andy Mao or more recent contribution by Novian Taylor, uh, showing that, you know, uncertainty matters for, for trade. Uh, another important aspect of international trade uh, is what we call in the paper uh, relationship stickiness. So uh, what we try to capture with, with this concept of, of relationship stickiness is the idea that uh, if you are a, a buyer, if you are engaged in a trade relationship, it might be difficult for you uh, to switch from a supplier to another supplier. Okay, And, and you know, the, the, the literature has brought up a uh, different explanation for, uh, for this stickiness. So for instance, you may have uh, some contractual, fric uh, contractual frictions, uh, there might be some relationship-specific uh, relationship investment. Uh, you may have customization costs. Uh, in any case, you know you can you should think of relationship stickiness uh, as as as, the, as a cost uh, for for a buyer to switch from one supplier to another. Uh, and uh, and and this concept is very important in the trade literature. Uh, for those that are familiar in the trade literature, they, 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 
you know, it's, it's very uh, tightly linked to uh, the notion of uh, input specificity or the notion of, of locked-in effects uh, that have been pushed by uh, uh, by Nathan Nunn or Andrei Levchenko or, uh, or Paul Antras. And, and of course, this notion of stickiness uh, is particularly important if we think about uh, global value chains, okay, where, uh, of course, you have a lot of customizations, you have a lot of uh, in, uh, specific investments uh, that, you know, entail the formation of global value chains. And so, again, what we want to do in the paper is to bring these two aspects of international trade together. Uh, so uncertainty on the one side and, uh, and stickiness on the other side. And, and our intuition is that stickiness uh, acts as a barrier to, uh, to extensive adjustment. So if you have more stickiness, it's, it's more difficult to uh, adjust at the extensive margins. Uh, and, and so uh, this should, the differences in, in those barriers, differences in the stickiness across product might induce uh, different adjustments of trade flows uh, to uncertainty. So what we do in the paper, basically there are two blocks in the paper. Uh, in the first part of the paper, uh, we construct a novel measure of uh, relationship stickiness. Uh, so uh, there, there are measures out in the literature uh, that you know, the, the, the measure that exists, most of the measure that exists, they don't have theoretical uh, background uh, and they are pretty aggregated. So uh, we believe that it's important to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, work with fine-grained data to think about relationship stickiness. And even within a broad industry, you may have very different level of stickiness across products within this, in this industry. So uh, what we first do is to uh, construct a measure of relationship stickiness uh, for 5,000 uh, 5, uh, uh, product categories. Uh, and just to give you the intuition of how we do, uh, so what's the, what we exploit to uh, to to, uh, to estimate this uh, this stickiness, uh, we we use the fact that uh, you know in a very uh, general uh, um, theoretical framework there is a mapping uh, between uh, the duration, the length of uh, firm to firm trade relationships, and the level, the degree of uh, product stickiness. So we use that and we exploit the firm to firm trade data to estimate stickiness for. Uh, all those products. And, and the second part of the paper, uh, once we have uh, revealed the level of stickiness of, of, of products uh, in the data, uh, is to examine how uh, the, the sensitivity of trade to uncertainty varies with, uh, with uh, the stickiness. Uh, and, and there we, we look at different margin of adjustment. We look at uh, the, 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 the initiation, the start of new trade relationships. We look at the disruption, so the, the, the end of uh, existing relationships. And of course, we look at uh, the impact of uncertainty uh, and, and the interplay between uncertainty and, and stickiness uh, on the, the intensive margins of the, the value that is traded between, uh, between uh, uh, exporters and, and, and importers. So to summarize the main finding, uh, you know, regarding um, uh, uh, relationship stickiness uh, or, or measure of stickiness, what what we uh, what we find is a strong level of heterogeneity uh, in the level of stickiness across product, uh, even uh, within broad uh, industry categories. So, uh, for instance, in the car industry, you have a lot of heterogeneity in, in the level of stickiness, and I come back to that later on. Uh, and, and then what we do is uh, to correlate with measure of stickiness with uh, other measures that are uh, in the literature just to uh, kind of reassure us that, uh, you know, uh, we, we capture some uh, meaningful char characteristics of product categories. Uh, and, uh, and actually, we are, we are quite confident that we, uh, we capture, uh, you know, important characteristics of, 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 of products. Uh, and hopefully, you will be convinced as well. Uh, and, and then, armed with this new, new measure of, uh, of relationship stickiness, uh, we look at the impact of, of uncertainty on trade. What we show is that uncertainty reduces the formation of new relationships. Uh, and this is more true for the most sticky products. Okay, so the, the most sticky products uh, in period of uncertainty, you really start, uh, stop initiating, uh, establishing new uh, trade relationships. Uh, and interestingly, we also look at uh, 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 the end of trade relationships, and, and, and here you, you see that the qualita qualitative impact of uncertainty uh, is different depending on the stickiness of product. And actually, for the product that are not sticky at all, for which it's very easy to, uh, to switch from a supplier to another, uh, in period of uncertainty, uh, you're going to just increase 
uh, you're gonna just stop uh, a lot of of, uh, of trade relationships. Uh, whereas for more sticky products, uh, you keep on uh, and, and you keep on your all your relationships when when you have an uncertainty shock. So uh, the the you 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 don't so the extensive margins through exit is not very active uh, uh, if you uh, if you look at uh, at a sticky product uh, compared to uh, to uh, non sticky product. And at the end of, of the paper, what we do is a decomposition of uh, the impact of, uh, of uncertainty on trade growth. We look at the different margins and we show that the, depending on the level of stickiness, uh, the product, the adjustment of, 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 uh, of trade uh, differs across products. And in particular, uh, for the most sticky products, you see something that we uh, call a uh, wait and see adjustment, meaning that in period of uh, you, uh, in, uh, when you have an uncertainty shock, uh, for the most sticky product, uh, the, the firms are really waiting. Uh, so they don't initiate new trade relationships and they don't stop the existing ones. So, uh, and, and really most of the, of, of, the, of the adjustment to trade is driven by uh, those two forces uh, uh, for the, the most sticky product. So uh, just about the literature, uh, we contribute to, uh, to two literature. So there are many papers that look at the impact of, uh, of stickiness on, on different aspects of international trade. So global value chain, trade policy, propagation of shocks in networks. All those papers, they use uh, either the, the measure developed by NASA and NAM uh, or the measure developed by, um, by, um, by uh, Roach to, uh, to uh, measure uh, relationship stickiness. Uh, those measures are, are theoretical and, and they are provided at very aggregated level. So we contribute to this literature by provi providing a, a new measure. Uh, and in that respect, our, our, our contribution is close to, uh, to the contribution uh, by uh, Ryan that's going to discuss the paper next. Uh, and we're also contributing to, uh, to, to the, um, uh, the literature about the, the, the real impact and the propagation of uncertainty to the real economy. Uh, here, what we add to the debate is the fact that the, the propagation of uncertainty uh, uh, to the economy differ uh, along uh, one important dimension, one important characteristic of product, that is the, the, the level of relationship stickiness uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, product categories. So uh, throughout the paper, we use uh, the, the, the French data set, uh, very disaggregated French data set for which we have information on uh, French exporters, the product they are exporting, uh, the months and the year uh, of exports. And importantly, we also have information on uh, the, the on the buyer side, namely we have an identifier uh, of, of the importer uh, in, a, in a EU destination. And so it's a firm to firm uh, trade data uh, that we exploit uh, 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 intensively in, uh, in, in this paper. Uh, of course, we have to harmonize the product categories over time. You have many you know, uh, data management details that I, I won't have time to explain, but uh, uh, the, the, the paper is, uh, is on our web, uh, website if you, uh, if you want to have more uh, information on that. Uh, uh, just a few words about the data structure. Uh, I think one important thing uh, to have in mind when you think about the data is that the, the data is really characterized by many to one relationships, meaning that uh, most uh, French exporters, they export the same product to several buyers across many destinations. So this is the many parts uh, of the many to one relationships. But on the other side of the, of the graph, so if you look at foreign importers, that import French products, uh, those importers, when they import a product from France, they import that product uh, from a single seller, okay? Uh, from a single French exporter. And, and it might be that they have several uh, suppliers, but if they have several suppliers, uh, it's just that they have one supplier one month, another supplier another month, month and so forth and so on. But if you look at uh, 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 the, the imports by uh, Europe, European importers from France for a given product uh, within a given month, uh, they tend to import that good from a single supplier. Uh, and this fact, uh, so the, the model that we use uh, is, 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 uh, is really consistent with, with this fact. Um, um, so now let me go uh, to, uh, to the model. So the, the, the theoretical framework, uh, the, the goal of the, the framework is really to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, help us estimating um, 
uh, this uh, this level of, of relationship stickiness. So I don't have time to derive all the theory. I just give you the main equation of the theory, and I'm going to try to give you intuitions on, on how we uh, we get there. So uh, what what this equation says is that uh, the expected duration of a trade relationship conditional on sales uh, and by sales. Uh, you know, uh, sales uh, reveal the fact that you know, the, the relationship uh, is with a supplier that a has a very high quality uh, or very low product, uh, very high productivity, so low prices or high quality. And so the, the, the expected duration of this relationship uh, is going to depend on the sales uh, of the relationship. So again, uh, so this just says that uh, if you are trading with a high, product, high productivity supplier uh, or a high quality supplier, your uh, trade relationship is going to last longer. And this eta parameter, and the eta parameter is, uh, is the measure of relationship stickiness. So how do we get uh, to, uh, to this equation? So uh, basically, uh, we have a framework where buyers, they purchase uh, inputs from a single supplier, okay? And uh, every period, uh, they receive the offer uh, with probability lambda. So here you see that the lambda uh, is part of what we call relationship stickiness. What does it say? It says that, of course, if you uh, receive offers every uh, two years or every, or every three years, uh, you don't have the option to, uh, to switch and, and the, 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 the relationships are going to last uh, a long period of time just because you don't have other options because you don't re receive other offers. Um, so this is one uh, dimension of relationship stickiness. The most important uh, dimension of relationship stickiness is, the, is this gamma, gamma parameter. So what is this gamma? So the idea uh, in the model is that when you receive an offer, uh, you're going to switch uh, only if the quality adjusted price of the, low, of the offer is lower than P over gamma. So ga gamma is a parameter that ranges from one to infinity. So if it's one, uh, it's, it means that uh, there are no costs to switch, okay? So if the price is epsilon lower than you, if the, the offer has a, has a price that is epsilon lower than the price that you are paying, you're gonna switch. There is no cost to switching, uh, you, you switch. Now imagine that gamma is two. Uh, this means that uh, you won't switch if you receive an offer until the price is half the price that you are already paying. Why don't we, you switch if you, in that case, uh, if, if you have a price that is, uh, I don't know, one third of the price you are paying just because you have high switching costs that, are, that materialize through this, uh, through this gamma. So again, if gamma is high, is high, is, is high so the switching costs are high and, and, and the duration of trade relationship uh, is going gonna, gonna, gonna to last longer. And the last uh, parameter that enters this relationship stickiness uh, measure uh, is the K. What is K? K is the shape parameter of the distribution of prices that is uh, distributed in inverse Pareto. And again, here the idea is, is very simple, is that if, if there is, uh, if, if K is large, uh, meaning that uh, there is a lot of homogeneity uh, in, in the distribution of prices adjusted of quality, so this means that everyone is just charging the same price adjusted of quality, so you won't switch just because there, you know, there is no one out with a lower price than, than the one you are paying. If instead you have a lot of heterogeneity uh, in the distribution of prices, then uh, you are more likely to, uh, to switch from a supplier to another. So the, the goal of the paper is really to estimate this bundle of parameters. So we, we want to estimate eta. Uh, we don't want to enter into, uh, into the details. So we, we have a measure that encompasses these different sources of, of stickiness. Not that uh, from this equation, it's not possible to, uh, uh, to easily estimate uh, the parameter. Why? For different reasons. So this is something that is product specific. So we think of uh, stickiness as, as a characteristic of products. Uh, but this arm in here, we don't observe it, and it's also something that is product specific. And the K here uh, enters, uh, is here and, and enters the, the eta uh, parameter here. So it is very hard to, uh, to estimate this equation. So uh, what we do next is, is to uh, transform this equation uh, to, uh, to be able to bring the model to the data. And the way we do that is by integrating uh, this duration uh, uh, we, we don't we don't look at the duration conditional on sales, uh, but but we look at the duration of relationships uh, conditional on being in a sale uh, decide. And it's what is written here 
So here, when, when you uh, when you integrate and you look at the duration of relationships within a cell G style, uh, then you have this parameter here uh, that is uh, something that you, you, this uh, yes this term here that is something that you can uh, easily uh, uh, estimate uh, because we have uh, made the assumption that the prices are Pareto distributed. So it's something that uh, for which we have a, a, an empirical counterpart. Uh, and then what we do, uh, we we take the log of this expression. Uh, so this is just the log of the duration of relationships for a given product, uh, for a given decide of size toward a given destination that will regress on product fixed effects. And so the product fixed effects are, are in fact uh, capture the, the degree of stickiness of the product and this term here that uh, that measure the size of, uh, of trade relationships. Uh, and, 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 and that we have uh, we can compute easily in the data. So that's the equation that we estimate. And then uh, we back out uh, stickiness uh, using the, 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 the different estimates that we have for the, the product fixed effect. Okay, so here are the, the, the estimates uh, of, of relationship stickiness. So you see that you have a lot of dispersion. Uh, uh, we are able to compute standard errors uh, for, for the, these different measure of estimates. And, and, and we, uh, when we will show you, when I show you regressions, uh, the, 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 the standard errors uh, will be uh, 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 computed via parametric bootstrap uh, to control for uh, this, uh, this, uh, these errors in estimation in the first stage. Okay, so just uh, a correlation between our measure uh, and the existing measure in the literature. So here you see that there is a positive correlation between the measure of stickiness uh, and the measure by Roach or the measure, measure by NAN. But the, so these are other measures of, of input specificity in the literature. So the, the correlation is positive significant, but it's not that large. Uh, and, and just I, I just want uh, to come back on, on this example of the car industry. So in, in, uh, in NAN's measure, uh, the the car industry is the most input specific industry. Uh, and in fact, if you look at our measure, uh, it's not uh, it's not really the case. Why is it so? Because in the car industry, you have both cars and parts and accessories of cars. Uh, and within that industry, we do find that parts and accessories are very sticky uh, product. Okay, so uh, these are products where it's very hard to, uh, to, uh, to switch from a supplier to the, another. And this is something you expect because the parts and accessories in the car industry are customized and there is a lot of specific investment. But on the other hand, in, in that industry, you have uh, you have cars, uh, which are final products. And of course, for consumers, it's easy to switch from a car manufacturer to another car manufacturer. So, uh, so, so what we what we bring with with our measure is you know more details, uh, and and of course, uh, we can uh, we can look at the data with uh, 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 with another uh, perspective, uh, working with with this uh, disaggregated measure. Uh, what we also find is that uh, the more sticky product are, are, are the product that are upstream in the in the production chain. So again, again uh, the final product are not sticky, and the and, and the and the most upstream product are, are the most sticky ones. Um, the measure is negatively correlated with the elasticity of substitution. So uh, more sticky products are, are less substitutable uh, products. Uh, and, and the most sticky product are positively correlated with uh, the measure of product complexity by Osman and Hidalgo. So uh, the most sticky, uh, most sticky products are also more complex products, uh, which is again uh, in line with the idea that our, our measure captures this uh, cost of customization and input specific investment. Julien, just to let you know, you're a bit under 10 minutes now. Okay. Um, so we have other sanity checks. I, I, I won't have time to discuss that. So now let me go uh, to uh, to the second part of the paper uh, where we look how uh, trade adjusts to uh, to uncertainty shocks uh, and, and how this changes depending on uh, on the the degree of uh, of relationship stickiness of products. So uh, you know here we are very. Uh, 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 related to the literature initiated by Nick Bloom, uh, the empirical uh, and, and you know all the empirical uh, trade literature that look at uh, how uncertainty shocks affect affect uh, you know trade decision and the decision to enter a market and, and, and stuff like that. So uh, the the intuition that we have is that the impact of uncertainty uh, on the probability to uh, form a new relationship. Uh, should uh, vary uh, with the level of product stickiness. And for, for product where you have more uh, uh, stickiness, 
uh, you know, there are a lot of specific investment, a lot of customization, customization costs, uh, then in period of uncertainty, you are less likely to initiate a new relationship uh, than for products for which it's very easy, you know, to switch suppliers and, and to enter a market, exit the market. And stuff like that. So that's what we want to capture. Uh, so to do that, uh, we're going to run a very simple uh, regression where we have X. X might be the number of uh, new relationships or uh, the number of relationships that are dying. Uh, it might also be the value uh, of, of those uh, trade relationships. Uh, and, and, and we're going to uh, explain that by the level of uncertainty uh, or by uh, the presence of an uncertainty shock, uh, the level of product stickiness, uh, and the, what un interests uh, us is the interaction between the level of stickiness and uncertainty. Okay, And we also control for a bunch of, uh, of uh, fixed effects. So the way we measure uncertainty uh, is we just uh, use the data, uh, the nice data set provided by uh, 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 higher Bloom and Fertility uh, from the World Uncertainty Index. So we have qu quarterly data about uh, economic uncertainty uh, in different uh, EU destinations. Um, uh, so this is our measure of uncertainty and we either use the, the index uh, or we comp compute uh, uh, uncertainty shots. So, so we have dummies uh, that, that measures periods where um, uh, um, you know, uncertainty is two times higher than, uh, two standard deviation higher than the median level of uncertainty in the, in the destination. So that this is what we call an un uncertainty shock. And so the econometric specification is a Poisson regression, uh, regression with uh, high dimensional fixed effects. Uh, and those fixed effects, uh, I'm going to show you the table here. We have uh, either product and period fixed effect. This is to account for seasonality. Uh, and country fixed effect. And then in other specification, we also have country time period fixed effect. So we control for, uh, you know, changes in the business cycle. Uh, so for instance, change in demand or, or change in pro or productivity shocks in the destination country uh, are, are captured by these uh, country period fixed effect. Uh, and so uh, what we have in this regression is, uh, so we have uncertainty shocks and we have the interaction with uh, of uncertainty shock with, uh, with our uh, relationship stickiness uh, index. So uh, just instead of commenting the table, I'm going to show you uh, uh, a graph that, that summarizes the findings. So what you have here uh, is the impact of an uncertainty shock along the distribution of relationship stickiness. So here are relationships for which the, 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 you do, the products are not sticky at all. So it's very easy to switch from a supplier to another. Uh, and and uh, when you uh, move on on, on the um, on the right of uh, of, the, of the graph, uh, you have products uh, that are uh, more sticky. And what you see is that the impact of uncertainty on on and on the creation of new relationships uh, is you know slightly positive or, or nil uh, for for the least sticky products. And as uh, uncertain uh, as uh, stickiness increases. The impact of, uh, of uncertainty is uh, is reinforced, and and for uh, the most sticky products, you you see a strong negative impact on, on of uncertainty on uh, on the, the the initiation of of new trade relationships. Uh, here we have looked at the number of new trade relationships. You can also look at uh, the number of dying uh, relationships. Uh, and here again, it's very interesting. Uh, so uh, here again, you have the, the different size of the relationship stickiness distribution. And you see that uh, for products that are not sticky at all, when you have an uncertainty shock uh, uh, in this, for those product categories, firms tend to uh, stop uh, some relationships. Okay, so uh, the number of uh, dying relationships increases uh, for the least sticky product. Uh, and then, when you uh, move and you look at more and more sticky products, the sign of the, the impact of uncertainty changes. And you observe that for the most sticky products, uh, when you have an uncertainty shock, you have a decrease uh, in, the, in the number of deaths, meaning that uh, you, are really in a, in a, you are really waiting uh, both to start a new relationship, but also you are waiting if you if you plan to uh, to end a, a relationship. If you have an uncertainty shock, you're going to uh, delay uh, this, this trade disruptions and, and you conserve uh, your uh, your trade partner. So we uh, let me uh, finish with this last uh, exercise. What we do is, is, is we look at the growth uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, product level uh, trade. 
Uh, so we look at the growth of trade for a given product to a given destination uh, within a given quarter. Uh, and we decompose this growth into uh, one intensive part, that is the, the, the change in the value of trade uh, from a given exporter to a given importer. So this is the intensive margin. Uh, and, and we have two uh, parts in the extensive margin. You have the change in the establishment of new seller-buyer relationships and the death of existing uh, seller-buyer relationships. Uh, and then what we look at is, is the sensitivity of growth to uncertainty uh, and, and we see whether the sensitivity of, of growth and the different component of growth to uncertainty differs uh, along the intensive margin. So here you see we run regression, you have growth, you have the, the, the three uh, different components. Uh, again, I won't uh, talk about the table, I'm going to show you a graph. Uh, so this is a graph that summarized uh, the, the result. So first, if you look at the squares, uh, this is the total impact of uncertainty uh, on, uh, on trade growth. Uh, for different level of stickiness. So here, uh, when you see minus three percent, for instance, it, it means that uh, uh, the, the level of, uh, of uh, growth is three, three percentage points lower uh, for, uh, in period of uncertainty than uh, in period where you don't have an uncertainty. Sure. So here you see that the impact of uncertainty uh, it's slightly increasing with the level of stickiness, but it's not it's not huge, but still, uh, and, and this is significant. I, I, we do not report the confidence interval here, but it's significant. So you do observe that, uh, you know, uh, uncertainty reduces uh, more uh, the growth of more sticky product than, uh, than the least sticky products. But what is uh, also important from this graph, is you see that most of the action com come from those red dots. Red dots are, are the, the entry margin. So it means that the main reason why uh, the growth is decreasing is because you have less uh, 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 new relationships uh, in uh, in uh, in the data, and this is uh, uh, this is the, the the effect of the the entry margin is stronger uh, for the most sticky products. So uncertainty reduces entry in particular for for the most sticky products. Uh, and here you have uh, the blue dots. The blue dots are the exit margin. Okay, so the impact of um, uh, of uh, the, the end of trade relationships on, on growth. You see that this is an important margin for the least sticky product. Uh, but then the importance of exit uh, is less and less important. And here again, you find what what we were what I was talking about before, and namely that for the most sticky products, they are strongly affected by uncertainty. Uh, and why are they affected by they are affected along two dimensions first uh, they they really stop uh, initiating new trade relationships uh, and second uh, stuff that they do is that uh, when they have a relationship they stop uh, they, 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 they stop less their relationships when they face an uncertainty shock okay uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, so I, I think it's time to conclude so to summarize the paper, uh, what we do in the paper is to provide a new method to reveal uh, relationship stickiness using firm-to-firm uh, -firm transaction data. Uh, so uh, just for, for researchers, uh, the, 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 the estimates and the standard errors of, of our uh, relationship stickiness measure will be soon available on, on our website. And uh, actually, we already shared it with, uh, with uh, some people in particular at, at, the, at the World Bank. Uh, and uh, so this is the first contribution of the paper. Uh, the second contribution of the paper is to show that the degree of product stickiness influences the sensitivity of trade flows to economic uncertainty. And in particular, we show that for the most sticky product, uh, the entry is more responsive to uncertainty shock. Uh, the exit is less responsive to uncertainty shock. Uh, and intensive margin shrinks a bit more for, uh, for the most sticky product, but, but this is not the most important margin. The most important margin, again, is uh, more responsive in terms of entry, less responsive in terms of exit. And we hope that, you know, this new measure and, and, and the paper in general uh, opens avenue for future research. So uh, we think that uh, it's important to have, uh, you know, clean and, and, and measures of relationship seekiness to think about the propagation of shocks in global value chains or to think about how, uh, and, you know, trade adjusts to uh, exchange rate shocks. Uh, this is from a trade perspective. Uh, and from a macro perspective, uh, we also think that, you know, uh, thinking about the nature of trade relationships and, and, and this notion of relationship stickiness might be important to think about, you know, the adjustment of prices, of investments, hiring decisions uh, to uncertainty shocks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, I hope I'm uh, 
you know, I'm in time. And thanks, uh, thanks, uh, um, uh, Ryan, for accepting to uh, to discuss the paper. Great, thank you very much, Julia. All right, I think I had to unmute myself first. I, there, I couldn't find the unmute button after I had started sharing. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, that's great. All right, good. So uh, yeah, so, so thanks a lot to the organizers for, for asking me to discuss this paper. Uh, it was uh, a pleasure to read it. Um, uh, I, uh, let me just say my standard disclaimer that it's not, uh, that the things I'm gonna talk about are not the view of, of the Fed or, or anyone in the Fed system. Um, so I, I come at the paper, um, in kind of, a sorry, some people's heads are blocking my presentation. How can I do that? Okay. Maybe I can't. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I, I come at this kind of, uh, the, the paper from this direction, which is that there's kind of an existential, um, question that I, I think about when, when talking about firm to firm trading relationships, which is how do they actually matter for aggregate outcome, right? You, you have your fully specified trade or macro model. You're very careful to keep track of, of input output linkages and these things, right? Why should people care about uh, this like extra dimension of the data? Um, what is it that firm to firm relationships can tell us about, about uh, macro outcomes that, that sort of you can't get from, from just, uh, you know, production linkages and, 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 and trade data. So there's a couple of, of things that, uh, that, that come to mind from the literature. So one is that we know most trade is occurring in older relationships. So if you want to understand how, uh, trade flows, um, respond to a shock, then you want to, you know, it matters how much, uh, how important older relationships are in a particular, um, you know, uh, bilateral relationship. Um, we also know that older trade relationships have more exchange rate pass through. So, uh, essentially if you're, uh, if you're, if you're curious about, if you want to measure pass through, it, it, it matters a lot to think about the life cycle, where in the life cycle of a relationship, uh, the important relation, you know, the important trade flows are happening that, that can affect the amount of exchange rate pass through that we observe in the data. Uh, and we also know that, um, so shocks can be transmitted through relationships. So for example, in, uh, uh, in this paper of, uh, Bomplan and, uh, Pandalai Nair, uh, affiliates that are hit by some shock, uh, trans transmit, uh, an important, you know, transmit shocks through the headquarters, through the headquarters firm, and then through to the headquarters country. So these are a couple of reasons why um, relationships matter for thinking about, about, um, about macro questions. And so this paper gives us kind of another reason to, to think that relationships, that we should pay attention to relationships, which is that uncertainty shocks um, affect products that tend to have more sticky relationships, right? And, and thinking about that then allows us to think about how uncertainty shocks are actually hitting the economy, right? And and what they find is that, of course, these uncertainty shocks are they lead to less trade in the products that are are much more sticky, uh, as well as fewer new relationships. And this is an insight that we we wouldn't know how to 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 think about stickiness if we didn't have firm to firm trade data, right? And so it, it helps us to understand. Uh, it's another way of uh, of thinking about shock transmission, uh, but it, here it's done for kind of all relationships in the data rather than than uh, just multinational firm relationships, right? And so here you can see this is a chart that, that Julian didn't show, but essentially you have uh, relationship stickiness of, uh, can vary quite a lot between big sectors, but also can vary quite a lot within an individual sector, right? So you have a, a wide variety of, of, of products for, for, for their measure of relationship stickiness. 
So uh, uh, it was a very nice paper. Uh, I I think uh, that um, you know it, it it's doing some some really nice stuff. Uh, of course, uh, the ability to identify importer exporter relationships uh, with product level detail as well over such a long panel is great. It, it, it's really um, it's not that common to have that kind of data uh, and to know that it's the the universe of of uh, French exports, right? It is really a is really a cool thing to do. Um, they their finding of relationships as as being typically many to one within products is definitely interesting. Um, now it, it's not, uh, you know, they didn't in the paper there wasn't any discussion of how how much trade is concentrated and the you know is, is trade mostly concentrated in many to one or many to many. We know from from work of Bernard, Moxness, and Ovid Mo, that actually most trade uh, is happening in many-to-many -many relationships, even if um, uh, those are not the majority of relationships, right? But still, it's interesting to think, is yeah, is many-to-one really the, 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 the way to think about trade relationships? Uh, they managed to, to get product-level uncertainty, right? So, so they take this country-level measure of uncertainty, uh, but they they marry it to a product level measure, so in a sense, in a sense, you're really getting product level uncertainty, uh, which is is it gives you a lot of of uh, degrees of freedom. It gives you a lot of power to explain what's happening uh, uh, to you know how, how uncertainty shocks are actually hitting the economy, uh, and and they find that that average essentially average relationship duration in a product. It, matters a lot for for um, how the shocks come through. So I, I think these are all really nice contributions. I think it's a great paper. Uh, I'm going to offer two comments uh, and then uh, just a, a couple of questions I had about the results. Um, so my first comment is about the relationship duration measure. Julian didn't actually talk too much about it, um, but uh, the, there is an in, the, the kind of the heart of their relationship stickiness measure is tying it to this empirical concept of relationship duration. And what that what what is the duration of a relationship for them? It's the number of months between the first interaction of a buyer and an exporter and the first interaction that buyer has with a different exporter. So that's that's the duration of a relationship, right? That that everything uh, spins out from. Now it it, it's good that most buyers actually do only have one exporter in a month in a product, and that there's not much switching back and forth. So that that's that's definitely a good thing. This is this many to one uh, feature of the data that that uh, that Julianne was talking about, right? Uh, but I mean, I think that this measure that there are some concerns with using a measure like this. So uh, of course, it prevents more than one. Uh, spell per buyer at a time, and and, of, and we and we know that the that the buyers who are having lots of spells, buyers who have many suppliers, are likely the most important for um, you know for for trade flows, right? That uh, they're, they're the biggest firms. Uh, there's also uh, you know different frequency of transactions that can lead to distortion, so that you could have uh, 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 a relationship that lasts ten months, and it could be someone. Buying one, one, one time in every month for ten months, or it could be one transaction every ten months, right? They they talk about this in the paper, and they show that that uh, that that they're correlate. It's correlated with the measure they're interested in, but it in the end the measure doesn't actually take account of these different frequencies. Uh, it also rules out kind of cross product synergies in sourcing strategies, uh, right? And so, like if I'm a motorcycle uh, producer, right? It, it uh, my decision of where I'm going to get my wheels from is is would be related to the decision of where I get my rims from, right? And so this kind of uh, is ruled out by the this setting the setup of relationship duration. And finally, they throw out all the observations of uh, of just single transactions, right? So these seem like these would be, of course, the least sticky relationships of all. So um, you know, I, I think it would be. It, it, you, you lose that uh, in their in their in their data setup as well. So essentially, I just I, I think that there there could be some more stress tests of their duration duration measure, given how important it is for for uh, their results. So I think a couple of ideas: you can zoom out to quarterly or yearly to eliminate these frames uh, frequency concerns, right? So all the stuff is in number of months, but you could zoom out a bit on the time. 
Uh, so Sebastian Heise has this really nice way of calculating relationship termination by seeing what's typical for a product uh, rather than, than just, you know, this, this will allow you to keep track of multiple uh, relationships at the same time for, for one buyer, right? Uh, if, if, you, if you just know that it's, uh, this, this means that a relationship has actually ended, right? You're, you're sort of forcing a relationship to end if you, if you start interacting with someone new. There's a lot. There were a lot of pictures of distributions in the in the in the data, but uh, the thing that I really wanted to see was the distribution of this variable, the duration one, and does it look like what we think it should look like given earlier research, uh, which is that trade is mostly concentrated in in older relationships, but that most relationships are young, right? Uh, I, I think you know, and there are some other robustness things we can try with this, right? Uh, you want to control for exit uh, and things like this. So essentially, I think that that. That I just want to see some more stress tests of the measure, given how important it is to the um, to the estimation. So uh, coming to that, then, so it, my second comment is about the model, uh, and essentially it translates relationship duration and kind of the 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 decile, right? How how, big, how much trade is happening in that relationship into this measure of relationship stickiness. And so what I want to emphasize to to the authors is that I, I just I, I want some some more about what the model gives us that sort of directly tracking duration and, and controlling for size misses. So, uh, you know, why, why can't we just use the empirical measure? Uh, and, and just a couple of thoughts on that. So first, the, a lot of the underlying factors that are driving relationship duration in the model, uh, so that, that really I mentioned, the lambda, right, the, the, uh, the gamma, the k, Right, uh, these are not actually uh, estimated at all. So there's not, we don't have a sense of which one is more important or whatever, or what is actually driving uh, the stickiness uh, or what's driving longer durations. Yes, Brian, Brian, sorry work. to cut in, cut in quickly. You have about yes. le less than one minute to go. Just okay. we're running a bit late okay. to, already. Thank you. Yep, sure. So essentially, I, I want to know more about uh, what the um, what what we get from the model that that that. Uh, um, is is not available just by using the data. So then I had a couple of questions uh, on the results, which is uh, that they find that uncertainty leads to fewer new relationships and and uh, and less trade. And so I want to just make sure that I want to I want to disentangle sort of the uncertainty shock from from real shocks, right? So the main period of analysis includes the global financial crisis. We know that a lot fewer new relationships were formed during that time. Right, and so I think that uh, I would like some more information about when the uncertainty episodes are hitting, making sure that they're they're separate from 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 actual, you know, from from realized shocks. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I have. I'm happy to send the slides to you, Julian. I'll, I'll, so I'll just wrap up and say that I really enjoyed working through the paper. Um, I want to see some. I, I would like to see some more showing that the, that their measure of duration is. is uh, is solid, um, and, and I think that they could justify their mod why a model is needed a bit more. But it is, of course, uh, I think it comes to this to this important question, which is wh why should we care about relationships? Well, it's because shocks hitting sticky relationships actually is, governs how uncertainty shocks affect the economy. So that's all I have. So thanks very much again for 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 allowing me to discuss this paper. Thanks, Ryan. That was a, a great discussion. Um, I see that we're running a bit late, and we have one more uh, keynote speaker, which we're you know we're really happy to have Kalina giving a talk. And given various time zones, I only see one question from the floor, um, which I can actually it's very technical, so I can send it to Julien as well as I had talked to Isabel last yesterday with some other questions I had. Um, so I'm sure we'll we'll continue the discussion off offline. Um, later on. Um, in the meantime, thank you. Um, thank you all for two great papers and two great discussions. I'll, I'll turn the, uh, the control over to Pavelis. Thank you very much. And thanks, uh, Ryan, for the discussion. Lovely. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, everyone. That was amazing. We'll not move far. We'll remain in the broad area of uh, international trade. And before we move to the last keynote speaker, as has been mentioned by Julian, let us take a very short uh, break and then we'll gather back with uh, Kalina Manova, who will be talking about the international trade uh, productivity and misallocation. So see you in a bit.
Welcome back to the very last session. And last but not least, we're having a pleasure of uh, learning more about trade, as I mentioned before, productivity and mass misallocation from a professor who is based at University College London. So I'm talking about Kalina Manova, and it's really great, great pleasure to host you, unfortunately, this time virtually, but I do uh, sincerely hope we will be able to welcome you here uh, in not too distant future. Let me introduce you uh, and then I will give the floor to you. So uh, Professor Kalina Manova uh, serves on the editorial board of one of the most pre prestigious journals in uh, economics profession, Review of Economic Studies. She also serves on the Council of European Economic Association. Uh, Kalina is research fellow at C CPR associated at LSE Center for Economic Performance, research affiliate at the International Growth Center, Sasifo Institute, and also external consultant at Bank of England. Professor Manova specializes in international trade and investment, and thus we are about to learn something in exact that area. Uh, but her interest and uh, uh, breadth is substantially larger. So Professor Manova's uh, research explores effectively three large and you know, extremely exciting and important and topical themes in international economics. So for one, the effects of, of financial frictions, pardon me, on international trade, multinational activity and gains from globalization. For the second, the role of firm heterogeneity in productivity, quality and management. And third, the determinants and consequences of global value chains for firm performance. So what can be more relevant and uh, more exciting? Thus, indeed, uh, last but certainly not least, Professor Kalina Madova, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to join the conference virtually. It's actually a wonderful opportunity for more of us potentially to participate in this conference. And I congratulate the organizers once again for making this very smooth transition from a live event to a virtual one. Um, I know that I'm the last one for the day, so I'm probably in between you and lunch or dinner, depending on your time zone. So let me jump right into it and share my screen. All right. Please let me know if this is not working, but hopefully you should be able to see my slides now. We see that perfectly. Um, excellent. So um, thanks for the introduction. I will be talking about the role of international trade for aggregate productivity in the presence of misallocation. This is joint work with uh, John Chung, a former st a student of mine at Stanford, Charlotte Sardot, who used to be at Banque de France and is now with the IMF, and Antoine Berthaud, who still is at Banque de France. So unsurprisingly, given uh, our affiliations, we're very much driven by policy relevant questions. The starting point for this project is the rapid expansion in international trade in recent decades. And this has intensified policy debates in various countries about the optimal design of trade policy and the role of structural reforms in the context of globalization. These debates, however, are quite different in advanced and developing countries. In rich nations, um, there are serious concerns about competition from low-wage economies and the rise of inequality. In developing countries, there are more first order concerns about the level effects of globalization and the lack of some of the promised gains of globalizations in recent years. This is all in the face of weak macro fundamentals. So we think it is first order to understand how globalization affects aggregate productivity and welfare. Um, and in order to have an informed view, we believe it's important to take into account three features. The first one is the importance of firm heterogeneity. What I have in mind here is firm heterogeneity in productivity. We know from the trade literature that relocations across firms at different productivity levels is absolutely critical to the overall adjustment of trade shocks. In the macro literature, there's been a lot of interest in the role of uh, resource frictions, uh, the allocation of resources being inefficient across heterogeneous firms. And this misallocation can be driven by failures at the broad level, weak institutions, or distortions in specific factor markets for capital or labor, or frictions in product markets. This um, misallocation uh, role, however, has often been ignored in the trade literature. Finally, by and large, most of our trade models are usually about symmetric bilateral trade reforms, 
whereas in practice, most rate liberalization episodes are unilateral in nature. So we believe it's quite important to make a distinction between export and import liberalizations to account for that asymmetry. So that's what we're going to try to do in this paper, uh, both theoretically and empirically. Let me give you an overview of the theoretical approach we take. We're going to introduce misallocation in a relatively standard trade model that features from heterogeneity in productivity. And we will compare the impact of bilateral um, export and import liberalizations in the case of misallocation and the case of frictionless allocative efficiency. Without misallocation, we're going to confirm what we know from the prior literature. There are definite welfare and productivity gains from bilateral liberalization as well as from one-sided export reforms. What we do know from the literature, but is actually rarely addressed, is the fact that import liberalization generates ambiguous effects. When labor markets are flexible and wages can adjust, then you definitely have gains from trade. In the presence of fixed wages, however, there may be welfare losses. Once we introduce misallocation, we're in the world of the second best. There are basically distortions in the economy, both before trade reforms and after, and the economy is transitioning from one distorted state to another. As a result of that, we're in the world of the second best, anything goes. What that implies is that misallocation can either amplify or dampen the gains from trade compared to the case of no misallocation. Moreover, it can overturn those gains or losses, so it can actually push them in the opposite direction. So it really is an open empirical question, and the actual impact will depend on the nature of misallocation. We therefore want to take this to the data, but in doing so, we have to be very careful about how we map theoretical concepts of welfare and productivity to their empirical counterparts. So we first confirm that observed measures of form productivity in the data are in fact monotonic in our theoretical concepts of form productivity. We then think about the link between welfare and aggregate productivity. Welfare depends on the consumer price index, your real purchasing power. But remember, you're consuming both domestically produced goods and imported variety. What that tells you is that welfare is in some sense related to an aggregate productivity across all firms whose goods you're consuming. That is actually very different from how we typically measure aggregate productivity and the nature of aggregate productivity that policymakers care about. Because usually we measure aggregate productivity only across domestic firms in an economy. And when policymakers care about economic growth, they care about the productivity of their own domestic firms. Those two objects, welfare and aggregate domestic productivity, will differ. In the presence of misallocation, they can also move in opposite directions. So what allows us to take this to the data and get some traction is to rely on an accounting identity. This is the only package decomposition of aggregate productivity. It's nothing more than the weighted average productivity across firms. And as an accounting identity, we can break that down into the sum of a simple average productivity unweighted and the covariance of firm productivity and firm size their employment share. Now, the, this covariance, it may be tempting to think of that covariance as a proxy for misallocation. However, the actual level of covariance is very much dependent on the specifics of the productivity distribution, the market structure, and so on. So the covariance itself doesn't necessarily tell us anything about misallocation. A higher or a lower covariance need not mean an improvement or, or reduction in allocative efficiency. However, what we learn from numerical simulations of the model is that we can look at the impact of trade reforms on these three productivity objects and learn something from their behavior. So we can learn something from the response of average productivity and the covariance of productivity and size to trade shocks. Going to the data, we make use of some fantastic data that the European Central Bank helped put together under their Competitiveness Research Network initiative. So this is the first data of its kind in that it provides panel data across countries and sectors that has information on aggregate productivity, but also captures various moments on the underlying firm distributions. In the past, typically economists get to choose. You either focus on firm level data for one country, and therefore you can very carefully study the impact of a trade reform and the reallocations across firms, but 
you would not have any variation across countries, in particular in the degree of institutional strength. The alternative was, of course, to just use cross-country panel data, but you have no information on the underlying form dimension. This component data from the ECB allows us to overcome that challenge and learn more this way. Lithuania is one of the countries in our sample, for example. We're also going to make use of the World Input Output Database. That is a standard, by now, standard source of trade flows. What makes it extremely useful for our purposes is that it doesn't only show gross trade uh, from one country to another, it decomposes those trade flows into value added. So, for example, if France is importing textiles from China, we're able to distinguish how much Chinese value added is embedded in these imports from China versus, say, Indian cotton that China imported. In addition, we know the final use of these imports. For example, are these textiles being used in the fashion industry in France? Or are they used, I don't know, in the car manufacturing industry and the such? It will become clear why these two features of the data, the fact that it is value added rather than gross trade, and it allows us to distinguish between sector of use, are very useful in building strong instruments. We want to identify the impact of export demand and import competition on aggregate productivity. We have to overcome endogeneity concerns, so building strong instruments is going to be key. What do we find? We find that international trade significantly increases aggregate productivity. This is true both for higher export demand and higher import competition. However, the two operate through different channels. The export demand channel moves up both average productivity, about three quarters of the total effect. It also tends to increase the covariance of firm productivity and size. So more productive firms, bigger employment share. Import competition, all of its aggregate productivity gains operate through the extensive margin. So average productivity across firms is going up because less productive firms are exiting. If anything, the productivity size covariance is going down. What do we learn from that? Remember, the productivity size covariance itself doesn't tell us anything about the presence of misallocation. However, we're going to provide three additional pieces of evidence which suggests that these patterns are consistent with trade raising aggregate productivity by triggering relocations across firms in the presence of misallocation. So how are we going to build that argument? The first point is that these, the pattern of these results on the three aggregate productivity measures is only consistent with simulations of the model that actually feature misallocation. Essentially, without misallocation, you can never get average productivity and the productivity size covariance to move in opposite directions. Second piece of evidence is also model inspired. The model tells us that without misallocation, there is a sufficient statistic for aggregate productivity and welfare. And that is the minimum productivity observed across all firms that are currently active in the economy. Without misallocation, that's no longer the case. In practice, that's what we see in the data. Trade does improve firms selection, it does tend to raise this minimum productivity across surviving firms, but that object is not a sufficient statistic for the movement in aggregate productivity. The final piece of evidence I quite like. It is actually a reduced form model-free piece of evidence. The model tells us that the strength of institutional and market uh, forces matters for the gains from trade, but the direction of this effect is theoretically ambiguous, so more efficient institutions can amplify or dampen the gains from trade. In the data, what we can therefore ask is, well, observed measures of institutional strength, do they tend to moderate the extent to which economies benefit from further export or import liberalization? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's prima facie evidence that the strength of institutions matters. It moderates the gains from trade. In particular, what we find is that more efficient rule of law, less corruption, more efficient factor and product markets amplify the gains from import competition. In contrast, more efficient institutions actually tend to dampen the gains from export expansion. So we also see this asymmetry in the way institutional strength moderates the gains from trade when there's export liberalization and import liberalization. We can only speculate why that might be, but I think from policy perspective, an interesting distinction here is that 
Export liberalizations are essentially a positive growth opportunity from the perspective of domestic firms. They can enter more markets. By contrast, import competition is sort of a negative shock to domestic firms. It is a positive shock to domestic consumers, but a negative shock to domestic firms. And essentially, in such an environment with a negative shock, efficient institutions allow the economy to cleanse itself from some of the least productive firms and shift activity towards more productive firms. Hence, higher marginal gains from trade. In the case of export expansion, you would have to argue that what's happening is that countries that start out with strong institutions are already pretty close to the first best. So on the margin, they will experience smaller productivity gains from further export liberalization. So I've given you an overview. Um, I will skip the literature in the interest of time and go straight into the model. But here, my purpose really is to show you the setup and jump straight to predictions and emphasize the intuition for the mechanisms of interest. I want to save enough time for the empirical results. So here is the setup. This is going to be a standard model in the trade literature um, that has CS demand monopolistic competition with heterogeneous firms. Um, it proves important to consider cases with and without fixed wages, which essentially implies whether or not you have an outside sector with a homogeneous good. These are technicalities. But production and trade technology is pretty standard and it features economies of scale. In order to enter into production, firms pay some entry costs, so there is free entry in this economy. And once they have entered, they pay fixed production costs per period and a constant marginal cost. If they want to trade, then there's some fixed trade costs associated, as well as variable trade costs. So those variable trade costs tau ij from country i to destination j, think of that as the tariff. And when we perform counterfactual analysis of trade liberalization, Essentially, we're going to be moving that tail. Without misallocation, this is the Mallet's model. Firms are going to draw productivity level fee from a known distribution, and that pins down their marginal cost. With misallocation, firms receive two draws, a productivity draw and a distortion draw eta from a joint distribution. This is very much how this is modeled in the macro literature. So now the marginal cost of the firm depends on the distorted productivity. In other words, the product of the productivity draw and the distortion draw. How do we think about this distortion draw intuitively? You can think of eta as any distortion that creates a wedge between the social marginal cost of an input bundle and the private marginal cost of the firm. So let me give you a few examples. If there is corruption and resources are allocated imperfectly across firms, there may be zero correlation between firm productivity in you know, the amount of resources firms get. It could be that there is a positive correlation, but less than one. So in many capital markets, there is asymmetric information. Um, creditors don't observe firms' productivity perfectly, so they generally tend to give more finance to more productive firms, but the correlation is not going to be one. There may also be environments where there are negative correlations between firm productivity and distortions. For example, in many economies, labor market regulations are much tougher on bigger firms. Hiring and firing costs are actually higher on more productive firms. Um, in practice, the results I'll show you are actually going to be qualitatively similar if instead of having distortions on the input side, you have distortions on the output side. So revenue taxes or subsidies that vary across firms. I mentioned this here because empirically, when we go to the data, we can look at different proxies for institutional frictions. So we can look at rule of law and corruption as measures of overall institutional strength. We can look at credit the rights protection to capture capital market distortions, hiring and firing costs for labor market frictions. And finally, we can look at measures of product market regulations, barriers to entry, state control, and so on for the revenue distortion. In practice, what are the parameters that govern the degree of misallocation? Well, it's definitely going to be the correlation between the productivity and the distortion draw, but also the dispersion in that distortion draw. If that dispersion is zero, there will be no misallocation. And to be very clear, what we do in this paper is hold that institutional context fixed and study how trade shocks will affect the economy. In practice, of course, from a policy perspective, a very interesting question is, what if you implement a structural reform? So effectively, you choose to change those two parameters, the standard deviation of the distortion draw or the correlation.
Okay, so that would be, I think, very interesting to consider in, in future work. Um, there will be distortion in this economy because all firm decisions, whether to produce, whether to export, will depend on their distorted productivity on the combination of the two draws. In the first best world, they should depend only on their productivity. So let me go straight to some equilibrium conditions to give you a flavor of how the model works. The economies of scale, there's some fixed costs in the background. That means that all firms above a certain productivity cutoff will be able to produce and export. And we pin down those cutoffs by imposing marginal profits for those equal to zero for those firms. Now, with distortions, this cutoff will essentially be for the distorted productivity. Reentry matters, so that is the second bullet point here. You pay a sunk cost to enter, and with free entry, this sunk cost will equal the expected value of the future profit stream. And that combines profits from domestic sales and from exporting. So it clearly depends on whether or not you're above the productivity cutoff for domestic production, whether or not you're above the productivity cutoff for exporting. I explain this because how we think about export and import liberalization essentially goes through its impact on these productivity cutoffs. For example, if you open up, if you reduce the export tariffs, more firms can begin exporting. Even less productive firms can export. So the productivity cutoff for exporting is going down. Therefore, conditional on anti the survival probability, the export profits expected are higher. If we want free entry to continue to hold, the survival probability for domestic production must go down. So therefore, the productivity cutoff for domestic production must go up. In other words, the two cutoffs for domestic production and for exporting always move in opposite directions. This is important for how we sign different effects. The other thing to mention is that there are some lump sum taxes in the background. Those distortions are actually um, generating taxes and subsidies in the background, which are going to come out of consumers' income. So at the very bottom, that is going to modify the income expenditure balance. Without going into the details, I want to show you what the implications are for welfare and aggregate productivity. We show that welfare is a function of two objects, the real wage and the disposable income share. In other words, misallocation will affect welfare through both channels, the real wage and this income share. If these distortions are higher, the income share will be lower. If there are more distortions, the price index, which affects the real wage, will be different. Why? Because a different subset of firms will be producing and they will have different market shares than in the first best. We can likewise express aggregate productivity in terms of the real wage and a weighted average distortion. What is key for us is that productivity and aggregate, aggregate productivity and welfare are only going to move together without misallocation, because in that case, they just depend on the real wage. In that case too, there is essentially a summary statistic. There is a sufficient statistic, namely the productivity cutoff for domestic production. With misallocation, both of these results fall apart. Aggregate productivity and welfare no longer move together, and this minimum productivity cutoff is no longer a sufficient statistic. So I'm ready to tell you how we're going to take this to the data and what our theoretical predictions are. Um, in the data, the way we measure firm productivity is real value added per worker. And we can show that that is in fact proportional to productivity or distorted productivity in the case of misallocation in the model. We can express aggregate productivity as a weighted average across firms. And point two here shows you how you can, as an accounting identity, decompose that into average productivity and the covariance of firm productivity and firm size, its employment share. Um, we don't have an observable summary statistic for misallocation, and we have shown that welfare is not necessarily proportionate to aggregate productivity unless you have no misallocation. So therefore, you know, you might wonder why do we look at this decomposition of aggregate productivity? And the answer is that the behavior of the two productivity components, the average productivity and the variance is going to tell us something about misallocation. I'm going to show you that in a moment. Okay, so without misallocation, we can show that um, import and export liberalizations, as well as bilateral reforms, are going to generate aggregate welfare and productivity gains. This is true when you have flexible wages. Let me walk you through the intuition for this result. If you lower trade costs from the export side, essentially you're increasing export demand, 
lower productivity cutoff for exporting. If free entry to continue to hold, you're going to have a higher domestic productivity cutoff and more activity will shift towards more productiveness. In the case of import liberalization, when you lower the import costs, you're going to increase import competition. That means less demand for any individual domestic firm. And this is also going to push out some of the least productive firms. So once again, the domestic productivity cutoff is going to go up, shifting both aggregate productivity and aggregate welfare. When you have fixed wages, it turns out that bilateral reforms, as well as one-sided export reforms, work the same way. However, one-sided import reforms actually generate welfare losses. This is known as the Metzler paradox. And what's happening here is that import liberalization triggers two effects, a direct and an indirect effect. And the indirect effect goes in the opposite direction. It tends to dominate when you have fixed wages. Once you introduce misallocation, you're in the world of the second best. So now the impact of either bilateral or unilateral trade liberalization is ambiguous because the economy is gonna transition from one distorted state to another. Essentially, relocation is based on distorted productivity. So even if you take two economies with the same marginal productivity distribution, one with misallocation, one without, you shock them with the same trade shock, they will end up with different exposed marginal productivity distributions. Because in the economy without misallocation, everything adjusted in a first best way. In the economy with misallocation, all these firm decisions were based on distorted productivity rather than true productivity. Effectively, the presence of misallocation will amplify the gains from trade if trade helps correct some of that misallocation. If more productive firms are able to expand and there is some cleansing on the extensive margin, less productive firms are forced out. Prior to that, maybe they survived because they received good distortion draws. Conversely, the gains from trade are going to be dampened with misallocation if more productive firms cannot fully respond to growth opportunities while less productive firms are not forced to exit. And importantly, the impact of trade reforms will not be monotonic in the parameters that govern misallocation. It will depend on the full productivity distribution and the nature of the market structure. So it is essentially an empirical question. I'm going to show you results from some numerical simulations before going to the data. Um, a lot of numbers on the screen. So let me digest that for you. This is the case of flexible wages where we can consider the impact of bilateral liberalization, export reforms or import reforms. Here we're looking at a 20% reduction in trade cost in that little tariff tau. The first row shows you what happens without misallocation. And what you see is that across the board, any trade reform generates aggregate welfare and productivity gains. The bottom three rows show you three different scenarios of misallocation. What differs across them really is the correlation between the productivity and the distortion drop. But the takeaway is that this is a case where misallocation tends to lower the aggregate welfare and productivity gains. However, always, 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 you see the two productivity components moving in the same direction. So across the board, average productivity and the covariance term are always moving in the same direction. Now we move to a different case where we have fixed wages. Now, if you look at the top row, this is the Metzler paradox. A bilateral trade reform, as well as export liberalization, will generate welfare and productivity gains. However, a one-sided import reform will actually generate welfare losses. Once we introduce misallocation, anything goes. So if you focus, for example, on columns one and two, uh, for the case of bilateral liberalization, Depending on the nature of misallocation, the correlation between the productivity draw and the distortion draw, misallocation can amplify the gains from trade in terms of aggregate productivity. It can lower them or it can overturn them, make them negative if they used to be positive. The bottom row I have highlighted in red because that is the one that actually matches our empirical findings. So if you look at the columns below export liberalization and import liberalization, you know, you see that both of them generate aggregate productivity gains. However, expert reforms raise both average productivity and the covariance term. By contrast, import reforms tend to increase average productivity, but lower the covariance term. So I'm going to be referring to these patterns in the bottom row as plus, 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 minus for the three productivity terms. And those are the patterns that I will now show you actually take hold in the data. 
So moving to the date. Oh, one thing to mention, everything I showed you here, counterfactual was, was reduction in the trade cost in the tariff theory. We show in the paper that in the case of export reforms, that is actually isomorphic to a rise in foreign demand, say because of a demand shock and population growth or income growth. And conversely, the change in an import um, tariff is isomorphic to a supply shock in the other country, say, you know, a productivity shock. That matters because of how we're actually going to measure export demand and import supply shocks in the data. Going to the data, we're going to exploit this fantastic ECB CompNet data, which provides standardized uh, data on aggregate productivity across countries and sectors, as well as multiple moments of the underlying firm distribution. And this allows us to calculate not just aggregate productivity, but also to implement the only package decomposition. We're going to make use of the world input output um, trade data. Um, our naive measure of export demand is basically going to say, how much do I export to all countries in all downstream sectors? So if I'm Germany and I'm selling um, cars, you know, how many cars do I export to any other market? Our naive measure of import competition will ask, um, I am France. I am looking at the textile industry. I'm importing textiles from the rest of the world. I'm going to subtract textiles that are used as an input in textile production because that is not input competition. That is sort of imported input provision. So I will take that out, but the rest I'm going to call my baseline measure of import competition. Going to the data, we start with a very naive or less correlation and then move to instrumental variables to establish causal effects. So the baseline equation is going to identify a long run correlation between aggregate productivity and trade exposure. The unit of observation here is a country sector year tip triplet. So we have 14 years, 14 countries, 20 sectors. Um, as an outcome variable, we're interested in aggregate productivity or it's two subcomponents based on the only package decomposition. On the right hand side, the two main objects of interest are the proxies, the naive measures of export demand and import competition. And we're going to add country year fixed effects. Later, I will also show you results with sector year fixed effects. Those are important because we're going to absorb cross country differences in income, uh, GDP, so market size, institutional strength, various macro shocks as well. Here are the baseline results. Again, these are simple correlations. What we find in column one is that a 20% rise in exports is associated with about two to two and a half percent higher aggregate productivity. Um, the magnitudes are quite similar for import penetration. So a 20% higher degree of import competition is also associated with two to two and a half percent higher aggregate productivity. We then implement the only package decompositions in columns two and three. And what we see is that in the case of export expansion, those gains arise through both higher average from productivity and a higher covariance term. So the average productivity tells us something about the exit of less productive firms from the left side of the distribution. The covariance term tells us something about the allocation of um, market shares across firms on the intensive margin. In the case of import penetration, the patterns look very different. Now we see that higher import activity is associated with higher average productivity, actually lower covariance term. So these are these plus, 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 minus patterns that I refer to. And remember, we don't yet know whether they mean misallocation because the covariance term itself is not a metric for misallocation. However, through the lens of the model, the numerical simulations we have done for an extensive set of parameters with that lens, we know that this plus, 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 minus pattern is only consistent with the case of misallocation. Without misallocation, we can never generate movements in the two productivity components in opposite directions. Okay, these are OLS correlations, so we clearly are concerned about endogeneity. Um, omitted variable bias may be an issue. I think reverse causality is a more important one given the fixed effects we've included, and it's worth remembering that reverse causality can generate, can bias coefficients either up or down. For example, more productive countries may be able to export more because they're more competitive on world markets. So in that case, the coefficient on our export measure will be biased upwards. But conversely, the coefficient on import competition might actually be an underestimate. Why? 
while less productive countries may be easier targets for foreign exporters, so they may attract more of that input competition. In an ideal world, we would have an instrument for export demand, which essentially captures exogenous foreign demand for the goods of one country in a given sector, as opposed to that country's ability to endogenously supply those goods to foreign markets. And conversely, an ideal instrument for import competition will identify exogenous foreign supply conditions rather than endogenous demand conditions in the importing economy. So to construct those instruments, we're going to use a modified version of Bartik shocks. Um, they exploit the initial composition of countries' trade activity. So we're going to look at the portfolio of destinations on the export side and the range of countries of origin on the import side. We're going to hold that fixed at the base year and then project onto them contemporaneous uh, shocks to supply and demand conditions in different trade partners. Now, this logic has been applied in other papers in the past. We think we improve on that by using the data more carefully and using more data. So first, on the expert demand side, what we're going to construct is the weighted average absorption by ICE export destinations using ICE initial export shares as weight. So let me digest that for you. Imagine that I'm looking at the German car industry and I want to know how much demand is out there for German cars. Well, some of those cars are going to France. In the past, people have proxied French car demand by looking at French imports of cars from the rest of the world, not from Germany. That's not exactly right because France produces some cars itself, but also exports some cars. So we think a better proxy for French demand for cars is absorption rather than imports. And that's what we're going to do. So this Y plus M plus minus X is absorption of cars in France. And we're going to weigh that by the share of France in total German car imports, uh, exports. As for our IV for import competition, now we're looking for a measure of foreign supply conditions. We're going to look at the weighted average export value added for final consumption across my import origin countries using the initial import shares of those different countries in my imports as weights. So what is that? So go back to the case of French textiles. Um, France imports some textiles from China. Okay, if we're trying to identify the Chinese supply shock, we got to take into account that not the whole value of those textiles comes from China. Some of it was added in China, but some of it actually maybe came from India because China imported cotton from India. YOT allows us to do that adjustment because it reports the export value added, the Chinese value added embedded in Chinese exports of textiles. So that's the measure we're going to take. We also want to kill any kind of input output linkages across sectors in the economy. And therefore, we're going to focus on the exports from China that are going for final demand. So basically textiles that go to final consumers as opposed to an input in the production of other sectors downstream. We're also going to make use of import tariffs as an instrument for import supply. This is the first stage. Um, and essentially the correlations between our instruments for foreign demand and supply conditions move observed variables of export and import activity in the predicted direction. So let me go straight to the causal effect. So here I'm going to switch my language and start talking about impact in a causal sense. Um, what you see here are two specifications. The first three columns include only country year pair fixed effects. We then add sector year fixed effects as well in the last three columns. We confirm the main patterns from the OLS specifications that I showed you earlier. In particular, a 20% rise in foreign export demand now generates 7 to 8% gains in aggregate productivity. A commensurate 20% increase in import penetration is associated with 1 to 10% gains in aggregate productivity, depending on the specification. What is also clear from this IV causal analysis is that the two productivity components move together in the case of export demand, but they go in opposite directions in the case of import competition, very much the way we saw before with the OLS correlations. So once again, this plus, 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 minus pattern is very apparent. I will not bore you with 
the whole host of sensitivity analysis we've performed, we've done various extensions. Um, let me instead use my remaining time to tell you more about how we interpret these results. What are the mechanisms that we think can rationalize them? We're going to conclude that trait shapes aggregate productivity by reallocating activity across heterogeneous firms, but crucially, this reallocation takes place in the presence of misallocation. And the way we're going to justify this conclusion is based on three testable and falsifiable predictions that stem from the model. The first one I've always I've already been alluding to, in particular this plus 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 minus pattern that we documented. This effect is only consistent with numerical simulations of the model that feature misallocation. You can otherwise never get the two productivity components to go in opposite directions. The second result I will show you next, and it goes back to this sufficient statistic. Is there a sufficient statistic for the effect of trade on aggregate productivity? Yes, with no misallocation, that should be the minimum productivity observed across firms. With the misallocation, there is no such summary statistic. And finally, do institutions modify the impact of trade using observed measures of institutional strength across countries? So this is the evidence on the sufficient statistic point. In the data, because we have multiple moments of the underlying firm distributions, we actually have proxies for the first, fifth, not proxies, we have measures of the first, fifth, tenth percentile of the distribution of firm productivity. Here I'm showing you results for the first percentile in column one, but they look very similar with these other metrics. So what you see is that shocks to export demand and import competition do move this minimum productivity in the expected direction. If you have a rise in export demand or sudden penetration of import firms, you do see the least productive firms exiting such that the minimum productivity goes up. In the remaining columns in this table, we can control explicitly for this minimum productivity. In the absence of misallocation, this should completely explain away the impact of trade on aggregate productivity. Here I'm showing you linear specification. You can also do that by allowing for higher order terms in this minimum productivity if you think that the relationship need not be linear. Anything you do, though, is not going to explain away the overall impact of trade on aggregate productivity. So that suggests that something else is going on, which might well be misallocation. So the last exercise I will do is try to get at that more directly, but also more agnostically. Without putting any model structure on the data, let's just ask, we have those measures of institutional strength across countries that capture distortions in the general environment or in specific factor and product markets. Do we see that countries at different levels of institutional strength respond differently to trade shocks? So what are those measures? We want to be agnostic. We can look at rule of law as an index of overall institutional capacity or corruption it has to do with abuse of public power. We can look at distortions in specific markets. So for labor markets, there are indicators that are averages across different proxies for hiring and firing costs. We can look at financial markets, various measures of financial contractability, credit to rights protection, stockholders, accountability, uh, sorry, um, accounting statements and so on. Or we can go to the revenue side and ask, what are distortions in the product market? Are there barriers to trade and investment? How much state control is there? Are there barriers to entrepreneurship? Across the board, we find very systematic evidence using those measures. So what we do is expand our baseline specification to include not only the level effects of expert demand and import competition, but also their interactions with these country measures of institutional strength. And each column here shows you a different specification using one of those five metrics of institutional strength. Across the board, you get this very systematic message that efficient institutions, factors, and product markets amplify the gains from import competition. The, co the coefficient of import competition with the institutions is always positive and significant. Conversely, they dampen the gains from export expansion. The interactions of export demand with the institutional strength is always negative and significant. We draw two lessons, or more like one lesson and one intriguing open question from these patterns. The first lesson is that the strength of institutions definitely moderates the impact of trade on aggregate productivity. That is consistent with what the model tells us for the case of misallocation. Prima facie, this is evidence that institutional strength matters. The second point, I think, is actually an open question for policymakers. 
we find this asymmetry. Strong institutions amplify the gains from import penetration, dampen the gains from export expansion. We can only speculate why that might be. But what I would venture to guess is that it has something to do with the fact that export expansion is a positive growth opportunity, sort of a positive shock to domestic firms, whereas import penetration is a negative shock. We know from the macro literature that various institutional, sorry, various market frictions um, behave differently at different points in the business cycle. So in other words, in situations of expansion and growth versus contraction. And I am guessing that something similar is going on here in the case of trade. I would love to wrap up at this point and leave some time for questions. So let me summarize. Theoretically, we know the trade reforms Trade liberalization is beneficial for aggregate productivity and welfare without misallocation. Unless, of course, you have fixed wages, which are one form of distortion in labor markets. Once you allow for misallocation on the input or the output side, trade liberalization will have ambiguous welfare and productivity effects. Anything goes. In practice, we do see that export and import expansions increase aggregate productivity, but they do operate through different channels. And what that reveals is that reallocation across heterogeneous firms is extremely important to understand, but it also indicates that misallocation matters. So when we think about the policy implications, we want to ask questions about the optimal design of trade policy, not only on its own, but also potentially in tandem with structural reforms. That is not something that we speak to directly in this project. Here we only tell you holding the degree of structural frictions constant how would trade reform shock the system? But obviously, from a policy perspective, you have some levers to move those structural frictions. And one can also ask, you know, what is the optimal sequencing of structural reforms and trade reforms? So let me leave it here. Thanks again for the opportunity, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Amazing. Thanks a lot, Kalina. That was excellent, super interesting, and super ambitious, too. Uh, you know, merging... Uh, trade stuff with labor markets and with structural reforms and even some institutional um, landscape effectively. So super policy relevant as you started with. Uh, let me first ask one question that I uh, sort of was uh, buzzing me a little bit. Um, so nowadays we're talking more about uh, deglobalization rather than, you know, uh, trade liber liberalization and, and all those things. And sort of um, interesting takeaway from the model, like the Metzler effect, is sort of saying, look, if you have like a more rigid labor market, um, if we sort of reverse the shock, maybe we then can conclude that this could be some sort of um, uh, one of the ways how we don't lose as much had we actually had more flexible markets. So where I'm going with all of this do we imagine those forces being truly symmetrical or not? And if not, how would then the effects change? Because this is, you know, quite, well, um, how to say it, uh, provocative probably, or, or, or uh, um, uh, you know, uh, possibly dangerous, uh, I could say, policy implications. So it would be really interesting to learn uh, more on that. And let me share some questions from the audience. So one of those is, do we have any feeling or estimate about the size of misallocation across economies? Could we relate them to observables and thus sort of have a better um, feeling from the real world? And the second one always oh, also a slightly provocative, provocative question. It says, would some of the recent trade wars happening in the world could be treated as, in quotation marks, reasonable by the findings of a model? So, so far we have those, but uh, I also invite uh, others to, to, to raise the question. So, and I'm sure more will come. Kalina. Thank you. Fantastic. I think this is a great way to kick off the discussion. And I think you have put your finger on the pulse here. Um, let me take your question first. How do we think about the effect of positive and negative shocks? And this is also related to, you know, our trade wars reasonable in a sense. Um, we can learn a lot from what we have done but there are several forces that are outside our modeling framework. So importantly, we're looking at an environment with no global value chains. This is a world where I produce everything from scratch myself. It is a shortcoming because we know that in practice, 
is global production networks are becoming more and more important. Recent trends have maybe gone in the opposite direction, but we're very heavily integrated. And we have seen these disruptions during COVID now, as well as, um, you know, due to freezing of various trade agreements on a global scale. I think taking those into account would, if anything, increase the gains from trade. And given the fact that um, with supply chains, there's sort of amplification of disruptions along the supply chain, it's possible that distortions in one economy would actually interact in important ways with disruptions in other economies down the supply chain. So I think that is a challenging question um, that we have yet to understand. I have an ambitious research agenda kind of right now, which is on global value chains. We have not yet um, dared to introduce misallocation there, but I think those are some important questions to bear in mind. Um, so GVC is one of them. The second point I want to highlight is how we think about the short term versus the long term, or people might call these dynamic gains from trade. Um, so the idea that if you have access to imported inputs, you might want to innovate more or upgrade your quality and productivity, all of that is outside our model. What we do know from the theoretical literature is that once you incorporate dynamic gains, um, the gains from trade are higher. Um, and so presumably, if you flip the sign and you have uh, trade deglobalization, right, you're going to see losses because of less dynamic gains. And the final point is actually jives very nicely with the papers we saw earlier, uncertain. So I think a major blow to the global economy has been not just the rise of trade barriers. So far, we have seen none of that in the case of Brexit and some of that in the case of US-China, but there's been a lot of threat points and a massive jump in uncertainty about future trade agreements. And that's true definitely of Brexit, but of course also US-China. And I think, you know, as we saw from the earlier presentations, in the presence of uncertainty, bad stuff happens because, you know, the right firms are not going to expand. They're going to expand by less. Um, some firms might not want to exit because of the option value of staying put. So I think taking those into account, I think, if anything, is going to once again push us more towards globalization is beneficial. Um, now, how do we think about the size of misallocations? That was a very important question from the floor. Um, it is hard to measure that in the data. In our context, the reason for that is because we have two parameters governing misallocation. Uh, one is the correlation between the distortion and the productivity draw. The other one is the dispersion. So effectively, we would need more moments of the distribution in order to estimate that in the data. And at some point, we actually thought about doing a Brexit counterfactual, which at a minimum would need three economies with firm level data. We would need the UK. We would need either one European country or the EU as a block, and then some other country outside that so that we can simulate the Brexit scenario. Unfortunately, we, we realized we would not be able to um, calibrate, we would not be able to basically back out those misallocation measures from the data we had at hand. I know that in the macro literature, they have been working on this. Um, and I think that will be very useful to do in the future. Having said that, I do have some faith in these institutional measures. Um, in some sense, there's sort of a catch-all of various distortions in the background. Um, and so I cannot tell you whether the measure of corruption is correlated positively or negatively with those two parameters in the model, but sort of as a single measure, it does contain some information. Uh, so let me stop here and give you a chance to ask more questions if there are any. Right, so let me actually uh, build on what you said about the dynamic gains from trade, because that is also, for me, seems, uh, you know, particularly interesting, both academically, but also from the policy perspective. So I would then imagine in the dynamic world, um, you know, having distortions which are purely exogenous would be probably slightly harder to justify because those firms yeah are active uh, choosers or like they are actively actually actually choosing inputs and thus affecting the entire market and those things right so um, any uh, because that that is probably relating to the question before like you know how large those misallocations are and I guess it's not really purely exogenous it's probably quite endogenous and even the shocks uh, when the firm receives like this misallocation and productivity they probably are also quite related and I would imagine there is also some action by the firm that could be done to affect both, right? I mean, we are imagining that productivity can be improved, but it would probably build a similar argument that if there is a distortion, 
it might be that the different institutional setup would enable or, or, or less enable firms to affect that, but there would be some sort of action, especially when there is a forward-looking uh, dimension in there. Um, so if you could maybe a little bit like also go into that direction, and uh, because you touched upon some dynamic aspects and also the GVC component that might be missing. And I guess if, yeah. I don't know, I, I, I bet you have thought about that, but I guess trade literature would also, I don't know, benefit substantially if dynamics played sort of more um, crucial role there than uh, maybe it does play now, or maybe not. So actually it would be really interesting to learn. Absolutely. So. Um there was a lot in what you just said. I think you mentioned several very important mechanisms. We're just going to pick up on a few that I, I've thought a bit about. So one is we're sort of thinking of holding the institutional dimension of misallocation fixed. But the actual degree of misallocation is going to depend on the market environment. So even if those structural parameters don't change, different firms are going to respond differently to the same shock. And so the observed um, value of misallocation can be can be different. Uh, but leaving that aside, it's actually interesting to think about whether firms can induce structural reforms. And there's certainly evidence that, you know, multinational companies are quite large. And when they enter markets with weak institutions, they tend to lobby for some improvements in institutional strength. Or maybe the way they contract with local suppliers essentially relies on their own home institutions that ensure better contract enforcement. So I think there are some dimensions along which firms can sort of endogenously respond and help correct some of that institutional misallocation. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is, um, I think it was implicit in your question, there are different kind of distortions that might vary along the business cycle. I like to think of this example in financial markets where you can have forward or back look, backward looking financial contracts. So what I mean by that is a backward looking financial contract is I come to you, I show you my collateral, and you give me a loan based on that. You have, you don't care what I want to do with the money. You just care about the collateral I can offer. In case something goes wrong, you're just going to take that. Why is that an issue? Well, if there was any misallocation in the past, say because of corruption or whatever, then this is only going to get propagated going forward because whoever was able to accumulate more collateral in the past by having access to more resources and being more profitable, those will continue to access more resources, even if they're less productive. Conversely, a forward-looking financial contract can help correct some of the misallocation in the past. So imagine an alternative scenario where as a lender, you don't care who I am, you don't care about my collateral, that doesn't matter. All you care about is my future expected profit stream, my, the net present value of my um, export opportunities, of my new investment opportunities. That means that if for whatever reason in the past, because of misallocation or whatnot, I'm a super productive firm, but somehow I was cash constrained and had little opportunity to attract collateral, that doesn't matter. If there is now a trade reform which allows me to expand and be very profitable, you will be willing to support me. And so as a result of that, in response to a positive opportunity, you are going to correct some of the pre-existing misallocation. And so that's sort of an interesting dimension of the nature of frictions in a specific market. But I think this actually happens in other situations as well. You also mentioned global value chains. And this was sort of, I think, in the context of Firms can endogenously choose to upgrade productivity. In the context of global value chains, one way to think about that is how you choose to source inputs. And are you sourcing inputs of higher quality? Do you choose to buy, I don't know, a better machine because it makes you more productive? Um, I think reductions in trade costs can trigger that adjustment. What we know from the trade literature is that sometimes the firms that respond the most to a trade reform are in the middle of the distribution. Effectively, think of it as there being a fixed cost to import a machine. If you're very big and very, if you're very productive, if you operate on a large enough scale, you're going to buy that machine no matter what. If you're very small, then a marginal change in trade costs is not going to change your behavior because it's not big enough to make it worth your while. It's really the guys in the middle for whom all of a sudden, you know, an import liberalization is going to make it profitable, attractive source those additional inputs, buy that machine, and upgrade their productivity. So you can have these sort of non-linear responses along the productivity distribution. And in that sense, these endogenous decisions by firms can once again help correct some of that misallocation potential. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting dimensions to take this going forward. As usual, it's a combination of not only what data is available, 
Uh, but what policy reforms there are that we can exploit to study? Excellent. I mean, there are so many questions that we can probably talk about. Let me just finish with uh, one which is very down to earth. So, you know, many economists are, uh, are talking about like all of these nice gains from trade. And nevertheless, what we observe in the real world is not that much support for that. Even more, you know, when we talk about um, distortions, they seem to be persistent. And again, a question would be, so why is that if actually that sort of, you know, work against us, us uh, welfare terms wise. Do you have any take on that? Um, I don't think I have anything creative to say. Um, I'm going to mention a couple of things that I'm sure everybody else would, would offer in response to this question. One of them is inequality, right? So everything we've discussed here is about aggregate welfare, aggregate productivity. And this is in a world where we are completely oblivious to inequality in the background. We have inequality across firms in terms of their productivity and profits, but those are not voters, those are firms. Voters are people, they're consumers. In these simple models, we have representative consumers, so inequality is out the door. In trade models with skill heterogeneity, you also get a wage distribution, and then you will have differential effects of trade across the skill distribution. So in those models with inequality, we can certainly characterize how import and export reforms Will affect different agents different in the economy this is going to explain why you know there's more or less popular support for trade liberalization um, from a policy perspective that's not exactly satisfactory because in a sense if you're you know if you want to, if you want to maximize not just aggregate welfare but also minimize inequality to some extent then you need to weigh that um, of course you know an economist will tell you first increase the size of the pie then divide it however you want but we know very well that reallocation doesn't work perfectly Right? So adjustment strategies are not perfect in tackling these inequality implications. And I think that is really at the heart of these populist um, uh, you know, initiatives. Um, the second point I'm going to mention is sort of more relevant, I would say, in the last five years. And that has to do with information slash misinformation. Um, do experts get their say or is there a lot of pontificating in the press um, and distortion of information? You know, that point is neither here nor there is, is an economist. It's just an admission. Um, and finally, you know, given the work I have presented now, yeah, it is true that misallocation and distortions, unfortunately, even the basic premise that there will be unambiguous gains from trade is questionable. So I think that only comes to um, show how important structural reforms are, um, as well as how adjustment packages matter uh, in the context of inequality. Excellent. So there is a lot to do and, um, uh, you know, many amazing ideas. Um, thanks a lot. I mean, I, I think we could be going further, but time is flying and actually is getting really late in here. So I'm losing my sharpness too. Let me just use this chance of uh, thanking you, Kalina. That was super exciting. Despite how deglobalization or globalization moves, I do hope we will uh, get closer to each other in a sense of being able to travel and thus as i mentioned before we'll be able to welcome you here in lithuania so thanks a lot uh let me close this session it was really absolutely ex perfect exciting and uh interesting so before totally closing it let me just use the wisdom from uh, our friends um, who live in india they tend to say that um you know Everything will be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, then that's not the end. So we'll be moving to uh, sessions tomorrow. And for a change, you will be welcomed by my colleague Aurelia. And you will be discussing together with her and many other amazing speakers, things on macroeconomics, uncertainty, Brexit-induced uh, adjustments and changes. Thus, tune in and uh, switch in, same time, same place. See you tomorrow.